Chapter twenty three of Rural Rides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter twenty three. Ride from Highworth to Quicklade and thence to Malmfrey. Highworth, Wiltshire, Monday, fourth September, eighteen twenty six. When I got to Devizes on Saturday evening, and came to look out of the inn window into the street, I perceived that I had seen that place before, and always having thought that I should like to see Devizes, of which I had heard so much talk as a famous corn market, I was very much surprised to find that it was not new to me. Presently a stage-coach came up to the door with Bath and London upon its panels, and then I recollected that I had been at this place on my way to Bristol last year. Devizes is, as nearly as possible, in the centre of the county and the canal that passes close by it is the great channel through which the produce of the country is carried away to be devoured by the idlers the thieves and the prostitutes who are all tax-eaters in the wens of bath and london potterne which i passed through in my way from warminster to devizes was once a place much larger than devizes and it is now a mere ragged village with a church large very ancient and of most costly structure the whole of the people here might as in most other cases be placed in the belfry or the church porches all the way along the mansion-houses are nearly all gone there is now and then a great place belonging to a boroughmonger or some one connected with boroughmongers but all the little gentlemen are gone and hence it is that parsons are now made justices of the peace there are few other persons left who are at all capable of filling the office in a way to suit the system the monopolizing brewers and rag rooks are in some places the magistrates and thus is the whole thing changed and england is no more what it was very near to the sides of my road from Warminster to Devizes, there were formerly, within a hundred years, twenty-two mansion-houses of sufficient note to be marked as such in the county map then made. There are now only seven of them remaining. There were five parish churches nearly close to my road, and in one parish out of the five the parsonage house is, in the parliamentary return, said to be too small for the parson to live in, though the church would contain two or three thousand people, and though the living is a rectory and a rich one too thus has the church property or rather that public property which is called church property been dilapidated the parsons have swallowed the tithes and the rent of the glebes and have successively suffered the parsonage houses to fall into decay but these parsonage houses were indeed not intended for large families they were intended for a priest a main part of whose business it was to distribute the tithes amongst the poor and the strangers the parson in this case at causley says too small for an incumbent with a family ah there is the mischief it was never intended to give men tithes as a premium for breeding malthus does not seem to see any harm in this sort of increase of population it is the working population those who raise the food and the clothing that he and scarlet want to put a stop to the breeding of i saw on my way through the down countries hundreds of acres of ploughed land in shelves what i mean is the side of a steep hill made into the shape of a stairs only the rising parts more sloping than those of a stairs and deeper in proportion the side of the hill in its original form was too steep to be ploughed or even to be worked with a spade the earth as soon as moved would have rolled down the hill and besides the rains would have soon washed down all the surface earth and have left nothing for plants of any sort to grow in therefore the sides of hills where the land was sufficiently good and where it was wanted for the growing of corn were thus made into a sort of steps or shelves and the horizontal parts representing the parts of the stairs that we put our feet upon were ploughed and sowed as they generally are indeed to this day now no man not even the hireling charmers will have the impudence to say that these shelves amounting to thousands and thousands of acres in wiltshire alone were not made by the hand of man it would be as impudent to contend that the churches were formed by the flood as to contend that these shelves were formed by that cause yet thus the scotch scribes must contend or they must give up all their assertions about the ancient beggary and want of population in england for as in the case of the churches what were these shelves made for and could they be made at all without a great abundance of hands these shelves are everywhere to be seen throughout the down countries of sussex hampshire wiltshire dorsetshire devonshire and cornwall and besides this large tracts of land amounting to millions of acres perhaps which are now downs heaths or woodlands still if you examine closely bear the marks of the plough the fact is i dare say that the country has never varied much in the gross amount of its population but formerly the people were pretty evenly spread over the country instead of being as the greater part of them now are collected together in great masses where for the greater part the idlers live 
on the labour of the industrious. In quitting Devizes yesterday morning, I saw, just on the outside of the town, a monstrous building, which I took for a barrack, but upon asking what it was, I found it was one of those other marks of the jubilee reign, namely a most magnificent jail. It seemed to me sufficient to hold one half of the able-bodied men in the county, and it would do it too, and do it well. Such a system must come to an end, and the end must be dreadful. As I came on the road for the first three or four miles, I saw great numbers of labourers either digging potatoes for their Sunday's dinner, or coming home with them, or going out to dig them. The landowners or occupiers let small pieces of land to the labourers, and these they cultivate with a spade for their own use. They pay in all cases a high rent, and in most cases an enormous one. The practice prevails all the way from Warminster to Devizes, and from Devizes to nearly this place, Highworth. The rent is in some places a shilling a rod, which is, mind, a hundred and sixty shillings, or eight pounds an acre. Still, the poor creatures like to have the land. They work in it at their spare hours, and on Sunday mornings early and the overseers, sharp as they may be, cannot ascertain precisely how much they get out of their plat of ground. But good God, what a life to live! What a life to see people live, to see this sight in our own country, and to have the base vanity to boast of that country, and to talk of our constitution, and our liberties, and to affect to pity the Spaniards, whose working people live like gentlemen compared with our miserable creatures. Again I say, give me the inquisition and well-heeled cheeks and ribs, rather than civil and religious liberty and skin and bone. But the fact is that, where honest and laborious men can be compelled to starve quietly, whether all at once or by inches, with old wheat-ricks and fat cattle under their eye, it is a mockery to talk of their liberty of any sort, for the sum total of the estate is this, they have liberty to choose between death by starvation, quick or slow, and death by the halter. Between Warminster and Westbury, I saw thirty or more men digging a great field of, I dare say, twelve acres, I thought, surely that humane, half-mad fellow Owen is not got at work here, that Owen who, the philosophers tell us, went to the continent to find out how to prevent the increase of the labourers' children. No, it was not Owen. It was the overseer of the parish, who had set these men to dig up this field previously to its being sown with wheat. In short, it was a digging instead of a ploughing. The men, I found upon inquiry, got nine pence a day for their work. Plain digging in the market gardens near London is, I believe, threepence or fourpence a rod. If these poor men, who were chiefly weavers or spinners from Westbury, or had come home to their parish from Bradford or Trowbridge, if they dig six rods each in a day and fairly did it, they must work well. This would be one and a half pence a rod, or twenty shillings an acre, and that is as cheap as ploughing and four times as good. But how much better to give the men higher wages and let them do more work? If married, how are their miserable families to live on four shillings sixpence a week? And if single, they must and will have more either by poaching or by taking without leave. At any rate, this is better than the road-work, I mean better for those who pay the rates, for here is something which they get for the money that they give to the poor, whereas in the case of the road-work, the money given in relief is generally wholly so much lost to the ratepayer. What a curious spectacle this is! The manufactory is throwing the people back again upon the land. It is not above eighteen months ago that the Scotch philosophers, and especially Dr. Black, were calling upon the farm labourers to become manufacturers. I remonstrated with the doctor at the time, but he still insisted that such a transfer of hands was the only remedy for the distress in the farming districts. However, and I thank God for it, the philosophers have enough to do at home now, for the poor are crying for food in dear, cleanly, warm, fruitful Scotland herself, in spite of all the Hamiltons and all the Wallaces, and all the Maxwells and all the Hope Johnstons, and all the Dundases and all the Edinburgh reviewers, and all the Brooms and Birkbecks. In spite of all these, the poor of Scotland are now helping themselves, or about to do it, for want of the means of purchasing food. From Devizes I came to the vile rotten borough of Carn, leaving the park and house of Lord Lansdowne to my left. This man's name is Petty, and doubtless his ancestors came in with the conqueror, for Petty is unquestionably a corruption of the French word Petit. And in this case there appears to have been not the least degeneracy, a thing rather rare in these days. There is a man whose name was Grimstone, that is to a certainty Grindstone, who is now called Lord Verulam, and who, according to his pedigree in the peerage, is descended from a standard bearer of the conqueror. Now the devil a bit is there the word Grindstone or Grimstone in the Norman language. Well, let them have all that their French descent can give them, since they will insist upon it, that they are not of this country. So help me God I would, if I could, give them Normandy to live in, and if the people would let them, to possess." This petty family began, or at least made its first grand push, 
in poor unfortunate Ireland. The history of that push would amuse the people of Wiltshire. A talking of Normans and high blood puts me in mind of Beckford and his abbey. The public knows that the tower of this thing fell down some time ago. It was built of Scotch fir and cased with stone. In it there was a place which the owner had named the Gallery of Edward the Third, the frieze of which, says the account, contains the achievements of seventy-eight knights of the garter, from whom the owner is linearly descended. Was there ever vanity and impudence equal to these? The negro driver brag of his high blood. I dare say that the old powder man, Farker, had his good pretension, and I really should like to know whether he took out Beckford's name and put in his own, as the lineal descendant of the seventy-eight knights of the garter. I could not come through that villainous hole, Khan, without cursing corruption at every step, and when I was coming by an ill-looking broken-winded place called the Town Hall, I suppose, I poured out a double dose of execration upon it, out of the frying-pan into the fire, for in about ten miles more I came to another rotten hole, called Rotten Bassett. This also is a mean, vile place, though the country all round it is very fine. On this side of Watton Bassett I went out of my way to see the church at Great Lydiard, which in the parliamentary return is called Lydiard Tregoose. In my old map it is called Tregoose, and to a certainty the word was Tregross, that is to say Tregross, or very big. Here is a good old mansion-house, and large walled-in garden, and a park belonging, they told me, to Lord Bolingbroke. I went quite down to the house close to which stands the large and fine church. It appears to have been a noble place. The land is some of the finest in the whole country. The trees show that the land is excellent, but all except the church is in a state of irrepair and apparent neglect, if not abandonment. The parish is large, the living is a rich one, it is a rectory, but though the incumbent has the great and small tithes, he in his return tells the Parliament that the parsonage house is worn out and incapable of repair and observe that Parliament lets him continue to sack the produce of the tithes and the glebe while they know the parsonage-house to be crumbling down, and while he has the impudence to tell them that he does not reside in it, though the law says that he shall. And while this is suffered to be, a poor man may be transported for being in pursuit of a hare. What coals, how hot, how red is this flagitious system preparing for the backs of its supporters! In coming from Watton Bassett to Highworth, I left Swindon a few miles away to my left, and came by the village of Blunston. All along here I saw great quantities of hops in the hedges, and very fine hops, and I saw at a village called Stratton, I think it was, the finest campanula that I ever saw in my life. The main stalk was more than four feet high, and there were four stalks, none of which were less than three feet high. All through the country, poor as well as rich, are very neat in their gardens, and very careful to raise a great variety of flowers. At Blunston I saw a clump, or rather a sort of orchard, of as fine walnut-trees as I ever beheld, and loaded with walnuts. Indeed, I have seen great crops of walnuts all the way from London. From Blunston to this place is but a short distance, and I got here about two or three o'clock. This is a cheese country, some corn, but generally speaking, it is a country of dairies. The sheep here are of the large kind, a sort of Leicester sheep, and the cattle chiefly for milking. The ground is a stiff loam at top, and a yellowish stone under. The houses are almost all built of stone, it is a tolerably rich, but by no means a gay and pretty country. Highworth has a situation corresponding with its name. On every side you go uphill to it, and from it you see to a great distance all round, and into many counties. Highworth, Wednesday, 6 September. The great object of my visit to the northern border of Wiltshire will be mentioned when I get to Malmesbury, whither I intend to go to-morrow, or next day, and thence through Gloucestershire, in my way to Herefordshire. But an additional inducement was to have a good long political gossip with some excellent friends, who detest the borough ruffians as cordially as I do, and who, I hope, wish us anxiously to see their fall effected, and no matter by what means. There was, however, arising incidentally a third object, which, had I known of its existence, would of itself have brought me from the south-west to the north-east corner of this county. One of the parishes adjoining to Highworth is that of Coles Hill, which is in Berkshire, and which is the property of Lord Radnor or Lord Folkestone, and is the seat of the latter. I was at Coles Hill twenty-two or three years ago, and twice at later periods. In 1824 Lord Folkestone bought some locust trees of me, and he has several times told me that they were growing very finely, but I did not know that they had been planted at Coles Hill, and indeed I always thought that they had been planted somewhere in the south of Wiltshire. I now found, however, that they were growing at Coles Hill, and yesterday I went to see them, and was for many reasons more delighted with the sight than with any that I have beheld for a long while. These trees stand in clumps of two hundred trees in each, and the trees being four feet apart each way. 
These clumps make part of a plantation of thirty or forty acres, perhaps fifty acres. The rest of the ground, that is to say the ground where the clumps of locusts do not stand, was, at the same time that the locust clumps were, planted with chestnuts, elms, ashes, oaks, beeches, and other trees. These trees were stouter and taller than the locust trees were, when the plantation was made. Yet, if you were now to place yourself at a mile's distance from the plantation, you would not think that there was any plantation at all except the clumps. The fact is that the other trees have, as they generally do, made as yet but very little progress, are not, I should think, upon an average more than four and a half feet or five feet high, while the clumps of locusts are from twelve to twenty feet high, and I think that I may safely say that the average height is sixteen feet. They are the most beautiful clumps of trees that I ever saw in my life. They were indeed planted by a clever and most trusty servant who, to say all that can be said in his praise, is that he is worthy of such a master as he has. The trees are indeed in good land, and have been taken good care of, but the other trees are in the same land, and while they have been taken the same care of since they were planted, they had not, I am sure, worse treatment before planting than these locust trees had. At the time when I sold them to my Lord Folkestone, they were in a field at Worth near Crawley in Sussex. The history of their transport is this. A Wiltshire wagon came to Worth for the trees on the 14th of March, 1824. The wagon had been stopped on the way by the snow, and though the snow was gone off before the trees were put upon the wagon, it was very cold, and there were sharp frosts and harsh winds. I had the trees taken up and tied up in hundreds by withes, like so many faggots. They were then put in and upon the wagon, we doing our best to keep the roots inwards in the loading, so as to prevent them from being exposed but as little as possible to the wind, sun, and frost. We put some fern on the top, and where we could, on the sides, and we tied on the load with ropes, just as we should have done with a load of faggots. In this way they were several days upon the road, and I do not know how long it was before they got safe into the ground again. All this shows how hardy these trees are and it ought to admonish gentlemen to make pretty strict inquiries when they have gardeners or bailiffs or stewards under whose hands locust trees die or do not thrive. N.B. Dry as the late summer was, I never had my locust trees so fine as they are this year. I have some, they write me, five feet high, from seed sown just before I went to Preston the first time, that is to say on the 13th of May. I shall advertise my trees in the next register. I never had them so fine, though the great drought has made the number comparatively small. Lord Folkestone bought of me 13,600 trees. They are at this moment worth the money they cost him, and, in addition, the cost of planting, and, in addition to that, they are worth the fee simple of the ground, very good ground, on which they stand. And this I am able to demonstrate to any man in his senses. What a difference in the valley of Wiltshire if all its elms were locusts! As fuel, a foot of locust wood is worth four or five of any English wood. It will burn better green than almost any other wood will dry. If men want woods, beautiful woods, and in a hurry, let them go and see the clumps at Coles Hill. Think of a wood sixteen feet high, and I may say twenty feet high, in twenty-nine months from the day of planting, and the plants on an average not more than two feet high when planted. Think of that, and any one may see it at Coles Hill. See what efforts gentlemen make to get a wood. How they look at the poor, slow-growing things for years, when they might, if they would, have it at once, really almost at a wish, and with due attention, in almost any soil and the most valuable of woods into the bargain. Mr. Palmer the bailiff showed me, near the house at Coles Hill, a locust tree which was planted about thirty-five years ago, or perhaps forty. He had measured it before. It is eight foot and an inch round at a foot from the ground. It goes off afterwards into two principal limbs, which two soon become six limbs, and each of these limbs is three feet round, so that here are six everlasting gate-posts to begin with. This tree is worth twenty pounds at the least farthing. I saw also at Coles Hill the most complete farmyard that I ever saw, and that I believe there is in all England, many and complete as English farmyards are. This was the contrivance of Mr. Palmer, Lord Folkestone's bailiff and steward. The master gives all the credit of plantation and farm to the servant, but the servant ascribes a good deal of it to the master. Between them, at any rate, here are some most admirable objects in rural affairs, and here too there is no misery amongst those who do the work, those without whom there could have been no locust plantations and no farmyard. Here all are comfortable. Gaunt hunger here stares no man in the face. That same disposition which sent Lord Folkestone to visit John Knight in the dungeons at Reading keeps pinching hunger away from Coles Hill. It is a very pretty spot all taken together. It is chiefly grazing land, and though the making of cheese and bacon is, I dare say, the most profitable part of the farming here, Lord Folkestone fats oxen, and has a stall for it, which ought to be shown to foreigners instead of the spinning jennies. A fat ox is a finer thing than a cheese, however good. There is a dairy here, too, and beautifully kept. 
when this stall is full of oxen and they all fat how it would make a french farmer stare it would make even a yankee think that old england was a respectable mother after all if i had to show this village off to a yankee i would blindfold him all the way too and after i got him out of the village lest he should see the scarecrows of paupers on the road for a week or ten days before i came to highworth i had owing to the uncertainty as to where i should be had no newspaper sent me from london so that really i began to feel that i was in the dark ages arrived here however the light came bursting in upon me flash after flash from the wen from dublin and from modern athens i had too for several days had nobody to enjoy the light with i had no sharers in the intellectual treat and this sort of enjoyment unlike that of some other sorts is augmented by being divided oh how happy we were and how proud we were to find from the instructor that we had a king that we were the subjects of a sovereign who had graciously sent twenty-five pounds to sir richard burney's poor-box there to swell the amount of the munificence of fine delinquents ay and this too while as the instructor told us this same sovereign had just bestowed unasked for oh the dear good man an annuity of five hundred pounds a year on mrs fox who observe and whose daughters had already a banging pension paid out of the taxes raised in part and in the greatest part upon a people who are half starved and half naked and our admiration at the poor box affair was not at all lessened by the reflection that more money than sufficient to pay all the poor rates of wiltshire and berkshire will this very year have been expended on new palaces on pullings down and alterations of palaces before existing and on ornaments and decorations in and about hyde park where bridges building which i am told must cost a hundred thousand pounds though all the water that has to pass under it would go through a sugar hogshead and does a little while before it comes to this bridge go through an arch which i believe to be smaller than a sugar hogshead besides there was a bridge here before and a very good one too now will jerry curtis who complains so bitterly about the poor rates and who talks of the poor working people as if their poverty were the worst of crimes will jerry say anything about this bridge or about the enormous expenses at hyde park corner and in st james's park jerry knows or he ought to know that this bridge alone will cost more money than half the poor rates of the county of sussex jerry knows or he ought to know that this bridge must be paid for out of the taxes he must know or else he must be what i dare not suppose him that it is the taxes that make the paupers and yet i am afraid that jerry will not open his lips on the subject of this bridge what they are going at at hyde park corner nobody that i talk with seems to know the great captain of the age as that nasty palaverer brougham called him lives close to this spot where also the english ladies in naked achilles stands having on the base of it the word wellington in great staring letters while all the other letters are very very small so that base tax-eaters and fund gamblers from the country when they go to crouch before this image think it is the image of the great captain himself the reader will recollect that after the battle of waterloo when we beat napoleon with nearly a million of foreign bayonets in our pay pay that came out of that borrowed money for which we have now to wince and howl the reader will recollect that at that glorious time when the insolent wretches of tax-eaters were ready to trample us under foot that at that time when the yankees were defeated on the serpentine river and before they had thrashed blue and buff so unmercifully on the ocean and on the lakes that at that time when the creatures called english ladies were flocking from all parts of the country to present rings to old blucher that at that time of exaltation with the corrupt and of mourning with the virtuous the collective in the heyday in the delirium of its joy resolved to expend three millions of money on triumphal arches or columns or monuments of some sort or other to commemorate the glories of the war soon after this however low prices came and they drove triumphal arches out of the heads of the ministers until prosperity unparalleled prosperity came this set them to work upon palaces and streets and i am told that the triumphal arch project is now going on at hyde park corner good god if this should be true how apt will everything be just about the time that the arch or arches will be completed just about the time that the scaffolding will be knocked away down will come the whole of the horrid borough-mongering system for the upholding of which the vile tax-eating crew called for the war all these palaces and other expensive projects were hatched two years ago they were hatched in the days of prosperity the plans and contracts were made i dare say two or three years ago however they will be completed much about in the nick of time they will help to exhibit the system in its true light the best possible public instructor tells us that canning is going to paris for what i wonder his brother huskisson was there last year and he did nothing it is supposed that the revered and ruptured ogden orator is going to try the force of his oratory in order to induce france and her allies to let portugal alone he would do better to arm some ships of war oh no never will that be done again 
or at least there never will again be war for three months as long as this borough and paper system shall last. This system has run itself out. It has lasted a good while, and has done tremendous mischief to the people of England, but it is over, it is done for. It will live for a while, but it will go about drooping its wings and half shutting its eyes, like a cock that has got the pip. It will never crow again, and for that I most humbly and fervently thank God. It has crowed over us long enough. It has pecked us and spurred us and slapped us about quite long enough. The nasty, insolent creatures that it has sheltered under its wings have triumphed long enough. They are now going to the workhouse, and thither let them go. I know nothing of the politics of the Bourbons, but though I can easily conceive that they would not like to see an end of the paper system and a consequent reform in England, though I can see very good reasons for believing this, I do not believe that Canning will induce them to sacrifice their own obvious and immediate interests for the sake of preserving our funding system. He will not get them out of Cadiz, and he will not induce them to desist from interfering in the affairs of Portugal, if they find it their interest to interfere. They know that we cannot go to war. They know this as well as we do, and every sane person in England seems to know it well. No war for us without reform. We are come to this at last. No war with this debt, and this debt defies every power but that of reform. Foreign nations were, as to our real state, a good deal enlightened by late panic. They had hardly any notion of our state before that. That opened their eyes, and led them to conclusions that they never before dreamed of. It made them see that that which they had always taken for a mountain of solid gold was only a great heap of rubbishy rotten paper, and they now, of course, estimate us accordingly. But it signifies not what they think, or what they do, unless they will subscribe and pay off this debt for the people at Whitehall. The foreign governments, not excepting the American, all hate the English reformers, those of Europe, because our example would be so dangerous to despots, and that of America, because we should not suffer it to build fleets, and to add to its territories at pleasure, so that we have not only our own boroughmongers and tax-eaters against us, but also all foreign governments. Not a straw, however, do we care for them all, so long as we have for us the ever-living, ever-watchful, ever-efficient and all-subduing debt. Let our foes subscribe, I say, and pay off that debt, for until they do that we snap our fingers at them. Highworth, Friday, 8th September. The best public instructor of yesterday, arrived to-day, informs us that a number of official gentlemen connected with finance have waited upon Lord Liverpool. Connected with finance? And a number of them, too. Bless their numerous and united noddles. Good God! What a state of things it is altogether! There never was the like of it seen in this world before. Certainly never, and the end must be what the far greater part of the people anticipate. It was this very Lord Liverpool that ascribed the sufferings of the country to a surplus of food, and that too at the very time when he was advising the king to put forth a begging proclamation to raise money to prevent, or rather put a stop to, starvation in Ireland, and when at the same time public money was granted for the causing of English people to emigrate to Africa. Ah, good God! Who is to record or recount the endless blessings of a jubilee government? The instructor gives us a sad account of the state of the working classes in Scotland. I am not glad that these poor people suffer, I am very sorry for it, and if I could relieve them out of my own means, without doing good to, and removing danger from the insolent borough-mongers and tax-eaters of Scotland, I would share my last shilling with the poor fellows. But I must be glad that something has happened to silence the impudent Scotch quacks, who have been, for six years past, crying up the doctrine of Malthus, and railing against the English poor laws. Let us now see what they will do with their poor. Let us see whether they will have the impudence to call upon us to maintain their poor. Well, amidst all this suffering, there is one good thing— the Scotch political economy is blown to the devil, and the Edinburgh Review and Adam Smith along with it. Malmesbury, Wiltshire, Monday, 11th September. I was detained at Highworth partly by the rain, and partly by company that I liked very much. I left it at six o'clock yesterday morning, and got to this town about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, after a ride, including my deviations, of thirty-four miles, and as pleasant a ride as man ever had. I got to a farmhouse in the neighbourhood of Cricklade to breakfast, at which house I was very near to the source of the river Isis, which is, they say, the first branch of the Thames. They call it the Old Thames, and I rode through it here, it not being above four or five yards wide, and not deeper than the knees of my horse. The land here and all round Cricklade is very fine. Here are some of the very finest pastures in all England, and some of the finest dairies of cows, from forty to sixty in a dairy, grazing in them. Was not this always so? Was it created by the union with Scotland, or was it begotten by Pitt and his crew? Aye, it was always so. And there were formerly two churches here, where there is now only one, and five, six, or ten times as many people. 
I saw in one single farmyard here more food than enough for four times the inhabitants of the parish, and this yard did not contain a tenth, perhaps, of the produce of the parish. But while the poor creatures that raise the wheat and the barley and cheese, and the mutton and the beef are living upon potatoes, an accursed canal comes kindly through the parish to convey away the wheat and all the good food to the tax-eaters and their attendants in the wen. What, then, is this an improvement? Is a nation richer for the carrying away of the food from those who raise it, and giving it to bayonet men and others, who are assembled in great masses? I could broomstick the fellow who would look me in the face and call this an improvement. What? Was it not better for the consumers of the food to live near to the places where it was grown? We are very nearly come to the system of Hindustan, where the farmer is allowed by the ow mill or tax contractor only so much of the produce of his farm to eat in the year. The thing is not done in so undisguised a manner here. Here are assessor, collector, excise man, supervisor, informer, constable, justice, sheriff, jailer, judge, jury, jack ketch, barrack man. He has a great deal of ceremony about it. All is done according to law. It is the freest country in the world. But somehow or other the produce is at last carried away, and it is eaten for the main part by those who do not work. I observed some pages back that when I got to Malmesbury, I should have to explain my main object in coming to the north of Wiltshire. In the year 1818 the Parliament, by an act, ordered the bishops to cause the beneficed clergy to give in an account of their livings, which account was to contain the following particulars relating to each parish. 1. Whether a rectory, vicarage, or what. 2. In what rural deanery. 3. Population. 4. Number of churches and chapels. 5. Number of persons they, the churches and chapels, can contain. In looking into this account, as it was finally made up and printed by the parliamentary officers, I saw that it was impossible for it to be true. I have always asserted, and indeed I have clearly proved, that one of the two last population returns is false, barefacedly false, and I was sure that the account of which I am now speaking was equally false. The falsehood consisted, I saw principally, in the account of the capacity of the church to contain people, that is, under the head number five, as above stated. I saw that in almost every instance this account must of necessity be false, though coming from under the pen of a beneficed clergyman. I saw that there was a constant desire to make it appear that the church was now become too small, and thus to help along the opinion of a great recent increase of population, an opinion so sedulously inculcated by all the tax-eaters of every sort, and by the most brutal and best public instructor. In some cases the falsehood of this account was impudent almost beyond conception, and yet it required going to the spot to get unquestionable proof of the falsehood. In many of the parishes, in hundreds of them, the population is next to nothing, far fewer persons than the church porch would contain. Even in these cases the parsons have seldom said that the church would contain more than the population. In such cases they have generally said that the church can contain the population, so it can, but it can contain ten times the number. And thus it was that, in words of truth, a lie in meaning was told to the Parliament, and not one word of notice was ever taken of it. Little Langford, or Langford, for instance, between Salisbury and Warminster, is returned as having a population under twenty, and a church that can contain the population. This church, which I went and looked at, can contain, very conveniently, two hundred people. But there was one instance in which the parson had been singularly impudent, for he had stated the population at eight persons, and had stated that the church could contain eight persons. This was the account of the parish of Sharncut, in this county of Wiltshire. It lies on the very northernmost edge of the county, and its boundary on one side divides Wiltshire from Gloucestershire. To this shan't cut, therefore, I was resolved to go, and to try the fact with my own eyes. When, therefore, I got through Cricklade, I was compelled to quit the Malmesbury Road, and go away to my right. I had to go through a village called Ashton Keynes, with which place I was very much stricken. It is now a straggling village, but to a certainty it has been a large market town. There is a market cross still standing in an open place in it and there are such numerous lanes crossing each other, and cutting the land up into such little bits, that it must at one time have been a large town. It is a very curious place, and I should have stopped in it for some time, but I was now within a few miles of the famous Sharncut, the church of which, according to the parson's account, could contain eight persons. At the end of about three miles more of road, rather difficult to find, but very pleasant, I got to Sharncut, which I found to consist of a church, two farmhouses, and a parsonage-house, one part of the buildings of which had become a labourer's house. The church has no tower but a sort of crowning piece, very ancient, on the transept. The church is sixty feet long, and on an average, twenty-eight feet wide, so that the area of it contains one thousand six hundred and eighty square feet, or one hundred and eighty-six square yards. I found in the church eleven pews that would contain, that were made to contain, eighty-two people, 
and these do not occupy a third part of the area of the church, and thus more than two hundred persons at the least might be accommodated with perfect convenience in this church, which the parson says can contain eight. Nay, the church porch on its two benches would hold twenty people, taking little and big promiscuously. I have been thus particular in this instance, because I would leave no doubt as to the barefacedness of the lie. A strict inquiry would show that the far greater part of the account is a most impudent lie, or rather string of lies, for as to the subterfuge that this account was true, because the church can contain eight, it is an addition to the crime of lying. What the Parliament meant was what is the greatest number of persons that the church can contain at worship, and therefore to put the figure of eight against the church of Sharncut was to tell the Parliament a wilful lie. This parish is a rectory, it has great and small tithes, it has a glebe and a good solid house, though the parson says it is unfit for him to live in. In short, he is not here. A curate that serves perhaps three or four other churches comes here at five o'clock in the afternoon. The motive for making out the returns in this way is clear enough. The parsons see that they are getting what they get in a declining and mouldering country. The size of the church tells them, everything tells them, that the country is a mean and miserable thing, compared with what it was in former times. They feel the facts, but they wish to disguise them, because they know that they have been one great cause of the country being in its present impoverished and dilapidated state. They know that the people look at them with an accusing eye, and they wish to put as fair a face as they can upon the state of things. If you talk to them, they will never acknowledge that there is any misery in the country, because they well know how large a share they have had in the cause of it. They were always haughty and insolent, but the anti-Jacobin times made them ten thousand times more so than ever. The cry of atheism, as of the French, gave these fellows of ours a fine time of it. They became identified with loyalty, and what was more, with property. And at one time to say or hint a word against a parson, do what he would, was to be an enemy of God and of all property. Those were the glorious times for them. They urged on the war, they were the loudest of all the trumpeters. They saw their tithes in danger. If they did not get the Bourbons restored, there was no chance of re-establishing tithes in France, and then the example might be fatal. But they forgot that, to restore the Bourbons, a debt must be contracted, and that, when the nation could not pay the interest of that debt, it would, as it now does, begin to look hard at the tithes. In short, they overreach themselves, and those of them who have common sense now see it. Each hopes that the thing will last out his time, but they have, unless they be half idiots, a constant dread upon their minds. This makes them a great deal less brazen than they used to be, and I dare say that if the parliamentary return had to be made out again, the parson of Sharncut would not state that the church can contain eight persons. From Sharncut I came through a very long and straggling village called Summerford, another called Oxy, and another called Crudwell. Between Summerford and Oxy I saw, on the side of the road, more goldfinches than I had ever seen together, I think fifty times as many as I had ever seen at one time in my life. The favourite food of the goldfinch is the seed of the thistle. The seed is just now dead ripe. The thistles are all cut and carried away from the fields by the harvest, but they grow alongside the roads, and in this place in great quantities, so that the goldfinches were got here in flocks, and as they continued to fly along before me for nearly half a mile, and still sticking to the road and the banks, I do believe I had at last a flock of ten thousand flying before me. Birds of every kind, including partridges and pheasants, and all sorts of poultry, are most abundant this year. The fine long summer has been singularly favourable to them, and you see the effect of it in the great broods of chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys, in and about every farmyard. The churches of the last-mentioned villages are all large, particularly the latter, which is capable of containing very conveniently three or four thousand people. It is a very large church, it has a triple roof, and is nearly a hundred feet long, and Master Parsons says in his return that it can contain two hundred people. At Oxy the people were in church as I came by. I heard the singer singing, and as the churchyard was close by the roadside, I got off my horse and went in, giving my horse to a boy to hold. The fellow says that his church can contain two hundred people. I counted pews for about four hundred and fifty. The singing gallery would hold forty or fifty. Two-thirds of the area of the church have no pews in them. On benches these two-thirds would hold two thousand persons, taking one with another. But this is nothing rare. The same sort of statement has been made, the same kind of falsehoods, relative to the whole of the parishes, throughout the country, with here and there an exception. Everywhere you see the indubitable marks of decay, in mansions, in parsonage houses, and in people. Nothing can so strongly depict the great decay of the villages as the state of the parsonage houses, which are so many parcels of public property, and to prevent the dilapidation of which there are laws so strict. Since I left Devizes I have passed close by, or very near to, thirty-two parish churches, 
and in fifteen out of these thirty-two parishes the parsonage houses are stated in the parliamentary return either as being unfit for a parson to live in or as being wholly tumbled down and gone what then are there scotch vagabonds are there charmuses and colcoons to swear mon that pitt and jubilee george begat all us englishmen and that there were only a few stragglers of us in the world before and that our dark and ignorant fathers who built winchester and salisbury cathedrals had neither hands nor money when i got in here yesterday i went at first to an inn but i very soon changed my quarters for the house of a friend who and whose family though i had never seen them before and had never heard of them until i was at highworth gave me a hearty reception and precisely in the style that i like this town though it has nothing particularly engaging in itself stands upon one of the prettiest spots that can be imagined besides the river avon which i went down in the south-east part of the country here is another river avon which runs down to bath and two branches or sources of which meet here there is a pretty ridge of ground the base of which is a mile or a mile and a half wide on each side of this ridge a branch of the river runs down through a flat of very fine meadows the town and the beautiful remains of the famous old abbey stand on the rounded spot which terminates this ridge and just below nearly close to the town the two branches of the river meet and then they begin to be called the avon the land round about is excellent and of a great variety of forms the trees are lofty and fine so that what with the water the meadows the fine cattle and sheep and as i hear the absence of hard pinching poverty this is a very pleasant place there remains more of the abbey than i believe of any of our monastic buildings except that of westminster and those that have become cathedrals the church service is performed in the part of the abbey that is left standing the parish church has fallen down and is gone but the tower remains which is made use of for the bells but the abbey is used as a church though the church tower is at a considerable distance from it it was once a most magnificent building and there is now a doorway which is the most beautiful thing i ever saw and which was nevertheless built in saxon times in the dark ages and was built by men who were not begotten by pitt nor by jubilee george what fools as well as ungrateful creatures we have been and are there is a broken arch standing off from the sound part of the building at which one cannot look up without feeling shame at the thought of ever having abused the men who made it no one need tell any man of sense he feels our inferiority to our fathers upon merely beholding the remains of their efforts to ornament their country and elevate the minds of the people we talk of our skill and learning indeed how do we know how skilful how learned they were if in all that they have left us we see that they surpassed us why are we to conclude that they did not surpass us in all other things worthy of admiration this famous abbey was founded in about the year six hundred by madel a scotch monk who upon the suppression of a nunnery here at that time selected the spot for this great establishment for the great magnificence however to which it was soon after brought it was indebted to oldhelm a monk educated within its first walls by the founder himself and to st oldhelm who by his great virtues became very famous the church was dedicated in the time of king edgar this monastery continued flourishing during those dark ages until it was sacked by the great enlightener at which time it was found to be endowed to the amount of sixteen thousand and seventy seven pounds eleven shillings eightpence of the money of the present day amongst other many other great men produced by this abbey of malmesbury was our famous scholar and historian william de malmesbury there is a market cross in this town the sight of which is worth a journey of hundreds of miles time with his scythe and enlightened protestant piety with its pickaxes and crowbars these united have done much to efface the beauties of this monument of ancient skill and taste and proof of ancient wealth but in spite of all their destructive efforts this cross still remains the most beautiful thing though possibly and even probably nearly or quite a thousand years old there is a market cross lately erected at devizes and intended to imitate the ancient ones compare that with this and then you have pretty fairly a view of the difference between us and our forefathers of the dark ages to-morrow i start for bollitree near ross herefordshire my road being across the county and through the city of gloucester End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of rural rides this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee rural rides by william cobbett chapter twenty four ride from malmesbury in wiltshire through gloucestershire herefordshire and worcestershire stroud gloucestershire tuesday forenoon twelfth september eighteen twenty six i set off from malmesbury this morning at six o'clock 
in as sweet and bright a morning as ever came out of the heavens, and leaving behind me as pleasant a house, and as kind hosts, as I ever met with in the whole course of my life, either in England or America, and that is saying a great deal indeed. This circumstance was the more pleasant, as I had never before either seen or heard of these kind, unaffected, sensible, sans façon, and most agreeable friends. From Marnsbury I first came, at the end of five miles, to Tutbury, which is in Gloucestershire, there being here a sort of dell or ravine, which in this place is the boundary line of the two counties, and over which you go on a bridge, one half of which belongs to each county. And now, before I take my leave of Wiltshire, I must observe that in the whole course of my life, days of courtship excepted, of course, I never passed seventeen pleasanter days than those which I have just spent in Wiltshire. It is, especially in the southern half, just the sort of country that I like. The weather has been pleasant, I have been in good houses and amongst good and beautiful gardens, and in every case I have not only been most kindly entertained, but my entertainers have been of just the stamp that I like. I saw again this morning large flocks of goldfinches feeding on the thistle seed on the roadside. The French call this bird by a name derived from the thistle, so notorious has it always been that they live upon this seed. Thistle is in French chardon, and the French call this beautiful little bird chardonnare. I never could have supposed that such flocks of these birds would ever be seen in England, but it is a great year for all the feathered race, whether wild or tame, naturally so indeed, for every one knows that it is the wet and not the cold that is injurious to the breeding of birds of all sorts, whether land birds or water birds. They say that there are this year double the usual quantity of ducks and geese, and really they do seem to swarm in the farmyards wherever I go. It is a great mistake to suppose that ducks and geese need water except to drink. There is perhaps no spot in the world, in proportion to its size and population, where so many of these birds are reared and fatted as in Long Island, and it is not in one case out of ten that they have any ponds to go to, or that they ever see any water, other than water that is drawn up out of a well. A little way before I got to Tutbury, I saw a woman digging some potatoes in a strip of ground, making part of a field, nearly an oblong square, and which field appeared to be laid out in strips. She told me that the field was part of a farm, to the homestead of which she pointed, that it was by the farmer let out in strips to labouring people, that each strip contained a rood or quarter of a statute acre, that each married labourer rented one strip, and that the annual rent was a pound for the strip. Now the taxes being all paid by the farmer, the fences being kept in repair by him, and, as appeared to me, the land being exceedingly good, all these things considered, the rent does not appear to be too high. This fashion is certainly a growing one, it is a little step towards a coming back to the ancient small life and leaseholds and common fields. This field of strips was in fact a sort of common field, and the agriculturists, as the conceited asses of landlords call themselves at their clubs and meetings, might, and they would if their skulls could admit any thoughts except such as relate to high prices and low wages, they might and they would begin to suspect that the dark age people were not so very foolish when they had so many common fields, and when almost every man that had a family had also a bit of land, either large or small. It is a very curious thing that the enclosing of commons, that the shutting out of the labourers from all share in the land, that the prohibiting of them to look at a wild animal, almost at a lark or a frog. It is curious that this hard-hearted system should have gone on until, at last, it has produced effects so injurious and so dangerous to the grinders themselves that they have of their own accord, and for their own safety, begun to make a step towards the ancient system and have, in the manner I have observed, made the labour sharers in some degree, in the uses at any rate of the soil. The far greater part of these strips of land have potatoes growing in them, but in some cases they have borne wheat, and in others barley, this year, and these have now turnips, very young most of them, but in some places very fine, and in every instance nicely hoed out. The land that will bear four hundred bushels of potatoes to the acre will bear forty bushels of wheat, and the ten bushels of wheat to the quarter of an acre would be a crop far more valuable than a hundred bushels of potatoes, as I have proved many times in the register. Just before I got into Tutbury, I was met by a good many people in twos, threes, or fives, some running and some walking fast, one of the first of whom asked me if I had met an old man some distance back. I asked what sort of a man, a poor man. I don't recollect, indeed, but what are you all pursuing him for? He has been stealing. What has he been stealing? Cabbages? Where? Out of Mr. Glover, the hatter's garden. What, do you call that stealing, and would you punish a man, a poor man, 
and therefore in all likelihood a hungry man too, and moreover an old man, do you set up a hue and cry after, and would you punish such a man for taking a few cabbages, when that holy Bible which I dare say you profess to believe in, and perhaps assist to circulate, teaches you that the hungry man may, without committing any offence at all, go into his neighbour's vineyard, and eat his fill of grapes, one bunch of which is worth a sack full of cabbages. Yes, but he is a very bad character. Why, my friend, very poor and almost starved people are apt to be bad characters, but the Bible in both testaments commands us to be merciful to the poor, to feed the hungry, to have compassion on the aged, and it makes no exception as to the character of the parties. Another group or two of the pursuers had come up by this time, and I, bearing in mind the fate of Don Quixote, when he interfered in somewhat similar cases, gave my horse the hint, and soon got away. But though doubtless I made no converts, I, upon looking back, perceived that I had slackened the pursuit. The pursuers went more slowly, I could see that they got to talking. It was now the step of deliberation, rather than that of decision. And though I did not like to call upon Mr. Glover, I hope he was merciful. It is impossible for me to witness scenes like this, to hear a man called a thief for such a cause, to see him thus eagerly and vindictively pursued, for having taken some cabbages in a garden. It is impossible for me to behold such a scene, without calling to mind the practice in the United States of America, where, if a man were even to talk of prosecuting another, especially if that other were poor or old, for taking from the land, or from the trees, any part of a growing crop, for his own personal and immediate use, if any man were even to talk of prosecuting another for such an act, such talker would be held in universal abhorrence. People would hate him, and in short, if rich as Ricardo were bearing, he might live by himself, for no man would look upon him as a neighbour. Tutbury is a very pretty town, and has a beautiful ancient church. The country is high along here for a mile or two towards evening, which begins a long and deep and narrow valley, that comes all the way down to Stroud. When I got to the end of the high country, and the lower country opened to my view, I was at about three miles from Tutbury, on the road to evening, leaving the Minchinghampton road to my right. Here I was upon the edge of the high land, looking right down upon the village of Avening, and seeing just close to it a large and fine mansion-house, a beautiful park, and making part of the park one of the finest, most magnificent woods, of two hundred acres, I dare say, lying facing me, going from a valley up a gently rising hill. While I was sitting on my horse admiring this spot, a man came along with some tools in his hand, as if going somewhere to work as plumber. "'Whose beautiful place is that?' said I. One Squire Ricardo, I think they call him, but you might have knocked me down with a feather, as the old women say. But, continued the plumber, the old gentleman's dead, and— God damn the old gentleman and the young gentleman too, said I. And giving my horse a blow, instead of a word, on I went down the hill. Before I got to the bottom, my reflections on the present state of the market, and on the probable results of watching the turn of it, had made me better humoured, and as one of the first objects that struck my eye in the village was the sign of the cross— and of the red or bloody cross, too. I asked the landlord some questions, which began a series of joking and bantering that I had with the people, from one end of the village to the other. I set them all a-laughing, and though they could not know my name, they will remember me for a long while. This estate of Gatcombe belonged, I am told, to a Mr. Shepherd, and to his father's before him. I asked where this shepherd was now. A tradesman-looking man told me that he did not know where he was, but that he had heard that he was living somewhere near to Bath. Thus they go. Thus they are squeezed out of existence. The little ones are gone, and the big ones have nothing left for it but to resort to the bands of holy matrimony with the turn of the market-watchers and their breed. This the big ones are now doing apace. And there is this comfort at any rate, namely, that the connection cannot make them baser than they are, a boroughmonger being, of all God's creatures, the very basest. From evening I came on through Nailsworth, Woodchester, and Rodborough to this place. These villages lie on the sides of a narrow and deep valley, with a narrow stream of water running down the middle of it, and this stream turns the wheels of a great many mills and sets of machinery for the making of woollen cloth. The factories begin at evening and are scattered all the way down the valley. There are steam engines as well as water powers. The work and the trade is so flat that in, I should think, much more than a hundred acres of ground which I have seen to-day covered with rails or racks for the drying of cloth, I do not think that I have seen one single acre where the racks had cloth upon them. The workmen do not get half wages, Great numbers are thrown on the parish, but overseers and magistrates in this part of England do not presume that they are to leave anybody to starve to death. There is law here. This is in England, and not in the North, where those who ought to see that the poor do not suffer talk of their dying with hunger as Irish squires do, 
ay and applaud them for their patient resignation the gloucestershire people have no notion of dying with hunger and it is with great pleasure that i remark that i have seen no woe-worn creature this day the subsoil here is a yellowish ugly stone the houses are all built with this and it being ugly the stone is made white by a wash of some sort or other the land on both sides of the valley and all down the bottom of it has plenty of trees on it it is chiefly pasture land so that the green and the white colours and the form and great variety of the ground and the water and all together make this a very pretty ride here are a series of spots every one of which a lover of landscapes would like to have painted even the buildings of the factories are not ugly the people seem to have been constantly well off a pig in almost every cottage sty and that is the infallible mark of a happy people at present indeed this valley suffers and though cloth will always be wanted there will yet be much suffering even here while at ewley and other places they say that the suffering is great indeed huntley between gloucester and ross from stroud i came up to pitchcombe leaving painswick on my right from the lofty hill at pitchcombe i looked down into that great flat and almost circular vale of which the city of gloucester is in the centre to the left i saw the severn become a sort of arm of the sea and before me i saw the hills that divide this county from herefordshire and worcestershire the hill is a mile down when down you are amongst dairy farms and orchards all the way to gloucester and this year the orchards particularly those of pears are greatly productive i intended to sleep at gloucester as i had when there already come twenty-five miles and as the fourteen which remained for me to go in order to reach bollitry in herefordshire would make about nine more than either i or my horse had a taste for but when i came to gloucester i found that i should run a risk of having no bed if i did not bow very low and pay very high for what should there be here but one of those scandalous and beastly fruits of the system called a music meeting those who founded the cathedrals never dreamed i dare say that they would have been put to such uses as this they are upon these occasions made use of as opera houses and i am told that the money which is collected goes in some shape or another to the clergy of the church or their widows or children or something these assemblages of player folks half rogues and half fools began with the small paper money and with it they will go they are amongst the profligate pranks which idleness plays when fed by the sweat of a starving people from this scene of prostitution and of pocket-picking i moved off with all convenient speed but not before the ostler made me pay ninepence for merely letting my horse stand about ten minutes and not before he had begun to abuse me for declining though in a very polite manner to make him a present in addition to the ninepence how he ended i do not know for i soon set the noise of the shoes of my horse to answer him i got to this village about eight miles from gloucester by five o'clock it is now half-past seven and i am going to bed with an intention of getting to bollitry six miles only early enough in the morning to catch my sons in bed if they play the sluggard bollitry wednesday thirteenth september this morning was most beautiful there has been rain here now and the grass begins but only begins to grow when i got within two hundred yards of mr palmer's i had the happiness to meet my son richard who said that he had been up an hour as i came along i saw one of the prettiest sights in the flower way that i ever saw in my life it was a little orchard the grass in it had just taken a start and was beautifully fresh and very thickly growing amongst the grass was the purple flowered colchicum in full bloom they say that the leaves of this plant which come out in the spring and die away in the summer are poisonous to cattle if they eat much of them in the spring the flower if standing by itself would be no great beauty but contrasted thus with the fresh grass which was a little shorter than itself it was very beautiful bollitry saturday twenty third september upon my arrival here which as the reader has seen was ten days ago i had a parcel of letters to open amongst which were a large lot from correspondents who had been good enough to set me right with regard to that conceited and impudent plagiarist or literary thief sir james graham baronet of netherby one correspondent says that i have reversed the rule of the decalogue by visiting the sins of the son upon the father another tells me anecdotes about the magnus apollo i hereby do the father justice by saying that from what i have now heard of him i am induced to believe that he would have been ashamed to commit flagrant acts of plagiarism which the son has been guilty of the whole of this plagiarist pamphlet is bad enough every part of it is contemptible but the passage in which he says that there was no man of any authority who did not underrate the distress that would arise out of peel's bill this passage merits a broomstick at the hands of any englishman that chooses to lay it on and particularly from me as to crops in hereford and gloucestershire they have been very bad even the wheat here has been only a two-third part crop the barley and oats really next to nothing 
fed off by cattle and sheep in many places, partly for want of grass, and partly from their worthlessness. The cattle have been nearly starved in many places, and we hear the same from Worcestershire. In some places one of these beautiful calves, last spring calves, will be given for the wintering of another. Hay at Stroud was six pounds a ton, last year it was three pounds a ton, and yet meat and cheese are lower in price than they were last year. Mutton, I mean alive, was last year at this time seven and a half pence. It is now six pence. There has been in North Wilts and in Gloucestershire half the quantity of cheese made this year, and yet the price is lower than it was last year. Wool is half the last year's price. There has, within these three weeks or a month, been a prodigious increase in the quantity of cattle food. The grass looks like the grass late in May, and the late and stubble turnips, of which immense quantities have been sown, have grown very much and promised large crops generally. Yet lean sheep have, at the recent fairs, fallen in price. They have been lessening in price, while the facility of keeping them has been augmenting. Aye, but the paper money has not been augmenting, notwithstanding the branch bank at Gloucester. This bank is quite ready, they say, to take deposits, that is to say, to keep people spare money for them, but to lend them none, without such security as would get money, even from the claws of a miser. This trick is then what the French call a coupe manque, or a missing of the mark. In spite of everything, as to the season, calculated to cause lean sheep to rise in price, they fell, I hear, at Wilton Fair, near Salisbury, on the twelfth instant, from two shillings to three shillings a head. And yesterday, 22nd September, at Newent Fair, there was a fall since the last fair in this neighbourhood. Mr. Palmer sold at this fair sheep for twenty-three shillings a head, rather better than some which he sold at the same fair last year, for thirty-four shillings a head, so that here's a falling off of a third. Think of the dreadful ruin, then, which must fall upon the renting farmers, whether they rent the land or rent the money which enables them to call the land their own. The recent order in council has ruined many. I was, a few days after that order reached us in Wiltshire, in a rickyard, looking at the ricks, amongst which were two of beans. I asked the farmer how much the order would take out of his pocket, and he said it had already taken out more than a hundred pounds. This is a pretty state of things for a man to live in. The winds are less uncertain than this calling of a farmer has now become, though it is a calling the affairs of which have always been deemed as little liable to accident as anything human. The best public instructor tells us that the ministers are about to give the militia clothing to the poor manufacturers. Coats, waistcoats, trousers, shoes, and stockings. Oh, what a kind as well as wise envy of surrounding nations this is! Dear good souls! But what are the women to do? No smocks, pretty gentlemen! No royal commission to be appointed to distribute smocks to the suffering females of the disturbed districts? How fine our manufacturing population will look all dressed in red! Then indeed will the farming fellows have to repent that they did not follow the advice of Dr. Black and fly to the happy manufacturing districts, where employment, as the doctor affirmed, was so abundant and so permanent, and where wages were so high. Out of evil comes good, and this state of things has blown the Scotch political economy to the devil, at any rate. In spite of all their plausibility and persevering brass, the Scotch writers are now generally looked upon as so many tricky humbugs. Mr. Sedgwick's affair is enough, one would think, to open men's eyes to the character of this greedy band of invaders. For invaders they are, and of the very worst sort. They come only to live on the labour of others, never to work themselves, and while they do this they are everlastingly publishing essays, the object of which is to keep the Irish out of England. Dr. Black has, within these four years, published more than a hundred articles, in which he has represented the invasion of the Irish as being ruinous to England. What monstrous impudence! The Irish come to help do the work, the Scotch to help eat the taxes, or to tramp a bootmon with a pack and licence, or in other words to cheat upon a small scale, as their superiors do upon a large one. This tricky and greedy set have, however, at last overreached themselves, after having so long overreached all the rest of mankind, that have had the misfortune to come in contact with them. They are now smarting under the scourge, the torments of which they have long made others feel. They have been the principal inventors and executors of all that has been damnable to England. They are now bothered, and I thank God for it. It may, and it must, finally deliver us from their baleful influence. To return to the kind and pretty gentlemen of Whitehall, and their militia clothing, if they refuse to supply the women with smocks, perhaps they would have no objection to hand them over some petticoats, or at any rate to give their husbands a musket apiece, and a little powder and ball, just to amuse themselves with, instead of the employment of digging holes one day, and filling them up the next, as suggested by the great statesman now no more, who was one of that 
noble, honourable, and venerable body, the Privy Council, to which Sturgis Born belongs, and who cut his own throat at North Cray in Kent, just about three years after he had brought in the bill, which compelled me to make the register contain two sheets and a quarter, and to compel printers to give, before they began to print, bail to pay any fines that might be inflicted on them for anything that they might print. Let me see, where was I? Oh, the muskets and powder and ball ought certainly to go with the red clothes. But how strange it is, that the real relief never seems to occur, even for one single moment, to the minds of these pretty gentlemen, namely, taking off the taxes. What a thing it is to behold poor people receiving taxes or alms, to prevent them from starving, and to behold one half at least of what they receive taken from them in taxes! What a sight to behold soldiers, horse and foot, employed to prevent a distressed people from committing acts of violence, when the cost of the horse and foot would probably, if applied in the way of relief to the sufferers, prevent the existence of the distress! A cavalry horse has, I think, ten pounds of oats a day and twenty pounds of hay. These at present prices cost sixteen shillings a week. Then there's stable-room, barracks, straw, saddle, and all the trappings. Then there's the wear of the horse, then the pay of them, so that one single horseman with his horse do not cost so little as thirty-six shillings a week, and that is more than the parish allowance to five labourers or manufacturers' families at five to a family, so that one horseman and his horse cost what would feed twenty-five of the distressed creatures. If there be ten thousand of these horsemen, they cost as much as would keep, at the parish rate, two hundred and fifty thousand of the distressed persons. Aye, it is even so, Parson Hay, stare at it as long as you like. But suppose it to be only half as much, then it would maintain a hundred and twenty-five thousand persons. However, to get rid of all dispute, and to state one staring and undeniable fact, let me first observe, that it is notorious, that the poor rates are looked upon as enormous, that they are deemed an insupportable burden, that Scarlet and Nolan have asserted that they threaten to swallow up the land, that it is equally notorious that a large part of the poor rates ought to be called wages. All this is undeniable, and now comes the damning fact, namely, that the whole amount of these poor rates falls far short of the cost of the standing army in time of peace. So that take away this army, which is to keep the distressed people from committing acts of violence, and you have at once ample means of removing all the distress, and all the danger, of acts of violence. When will this be done? Do not say never, reader. If you do, you are not only a slave, but you ought to be one. I cannot dismiss this militia clothing affair, without remarking, that I do not agree with those who blame the ministers, for having let in the foreign corn out of fear. Why not do it from that motive? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and what is meant by fear of the Lord, but the fear of doing wrong, or of persevering in doing wrong, and whence is this fear to arise, from thinking of the consequences, to be sure. And therefore, if the ministers did let in the foreign corn, for fear of popular commotion, they acted rightly, and their motive was as good and reasonable as the act was wise and just. It would have been lucky for them if the same sort of motive had prevailed, when the corn bill was passed, but that gamecock statesman, who at last sent a spur into his own throat, was then in high feather, and he, while soldiers were drawn up round the honourable, honourable, honourable house, said that he did not, for his part, care much about the bill, but since the mob had clamoured against it, he was resolved to support it. Alas, that such a cock statesman should have come to such an end! All the towns and cities in England petitioned against that odious bill, their petitions were rejected, and that rejection is amongst the causes of the present embarrassments. Therefore I am not for blaming the ministers for acting from fear. They did the same in the case of the poor Queen. Fear taught them wisely, then, also. What? Would you never have people act from fear? What but fear of the law restrains many men from committing crimes? What but fear of exposure prevents thousands upon thousands of offences, moral as well as legal? Nonsense about acting from fear. I always hear with great suspicion your eulogies of vigorous government. I do not like your vigorous governments, your game-cock governments. We saw enough of these, and felt enough of them, too, under Pitt, Dundas, Percival, Gibbs, Ellenborough, Sidmouth, and Castlereagh. I prefer governments like those of Edward I of England, and St. Louis of France, cocks as towards their enemies and rivals, and chickens as towards their own people, precisely the reverse of our modern country gentlemen, as they call themselves, very lions as towards their poor, robbed, famishing labourers, but more than lambs as towards tax-eaters, and especially as towards a fierce and whiskered dead weight, in the presence of any of whom they dare not say that their souls are their own. This base race of men, called country gentlemen, must be speedily changed by almost a miracle, or they, big as well as little, must be swept away. And if it should be desirable for posterity to have a just idea of them, let posterity take this one fact, 
that the tithes are now in part received by men who are rectors and vicars and who at the same time receive half pay as naval or military officers and that not one english country gentleman has had the courage even to complain of this though many gallant half-pay officers have been dismissed and beggared upon the ground that the half-pay is not a reward for past services but a retaining fee for future services so that put the two together they amount to this that the half-pay is given to church parsons that they may be when war comes ready to serve as officers in the army or navy let the world match that if it can and yet there are scoundrels to say that we do not want a radical reform why there must be such a reform in order to prevent us from becoming a mass of wretches too corrupt and profligate and base even to carry on the common transactions of life ryle near upton on seven worcestershire monday twenty fifth september i set off from mr palmer's yesterday after breakfast having his son about thirteen years old as my travelling companion we came across the country a distance of about twenty two miles and having crossed the seven at upton arrived here at mr john price's about two o'clock on our road we passed by the estate and park of another ricardo this is osman the other is david this one has ousted two families of normans the honeywood yeateses and the scudamores they suppose him to have ten thousand pounds a year in rent here famous watching the turn of the market the bearings are at work down in this country too they are everywhere indeed depositing their eggs about like cunning old guinea hens in sly places besides the great open showy nests that they have the instructor tells us that the ricardos have received sixty four thousand pounds commission on the greek loans or rather loans to the greeks oh brave greeks to have such patriots to aid you with their financial skill such patriots as mr galloway to make engines of war for you while his son is making them for the turks and such patriots as burdett and hobhouse to talk of your political relations happy greeks happy mexicans too it seems for the best instructor tells us that the bearings whose progenitors came from dutchland about the same time as and perhaps in company with the ricardos happy mexicans too for the instructor as good as swears that the bearings will see that the dividends on your loans are paid in future now therefore the riches the loads the shiploads of silver and gold are now to pour in upon us never was there a nation so foolish as this but and this ought to be well understood it is not mere foolishness not mere harmless folly it is foolishness the offspring of greediness and of a gambling which is little short of a roguish disposition and this disposition prevails to an enormous extent in the country as i am told more than in the monstrous wen itself most delightfully however have the greedy mercenary selfish unfeeling wretches been bit by the loans and shares the king of spain gave the wretches a sharp bite for which i always most cordially thank his majesty i dare say that his sponging off of the roguish bonds has reduced to beggary or cause to cut their throats many thousands of the greedy fund-loving stock-jobbing devils who if they regard it likely to raise their securities one per cent would applaud the murder of half the human race these vermin all without a single exception approved of and rejoiced at sidmouth's power of imprisonment bill and they applauded his letter of thanks to the manchester yeomanry cavalry no matter what it is that puts an end to a system which engenders and breeds up vermin like these mr hanford of this county and mr canning of gloucestershire having dined at mr price's yesterday i went to-day with mr price to see mr hanford at his house and estate at breeden hill which is i believe one of the highest in england the ridge or rather the edge of it divides in this part worcestershire from gloucestershire at the very highest part of it there are the remains of an encampment or rather i should think citadel in many instances in wiltshire these marks of fortifications are called castles still and doubtless there were once castles on these spots from Breeden Hill you see into nine or ten counties, and those curious bubblings up, the Malvern Hills, are right before you, and only at about ten miles' distance, in a straight line. As this hill looks over the counties of Worcester, Gloucester, Hereford, and part of Warwick, and the rich part of Stafford, and as it looks over the vales of Esham, Worcester, and Gloucester, having the Avon and the Severn winding down them, you certainly see from this Breeden Hill one of the very richest spots of England, and I am fully convinced a richer spot than is to be seen in any other country in the world i mean scotland excepted of course for fear sawney should cut my throat or which is much the same thing squeeze me by the hand from which last i pray thee to deliver me o lord the avon this is the third avon that i have crossed in this ride falls into the seven just below tewkesbury through which town we went in our way to mr hanford's these rivers particularly the seven go through and sometimes overflow the finest meadows of which it is possible to form an idea 
some of them contain more than a hundred acres each, and the number of cattle and sheep feeding in them is prodigious. Nine-tenths of the land in these extensive vales appears to me to be pasture, and it is pasture of the richest kind. The sheep are chiefly of the Leicester breed, and the cattle of the Hereford, white face and dark red body, certainly the finest and most beautiful of all horned cattle. The grass, after the fine rains that we have had, is in its finest possible dress. But here, as in the parts of Gloucestershire and Herefordshire that I have seen, there are no turnips, except those which have been recently sown. And though amidst all these thousands upon thousands of acres of the finest meadows and grass land in the world, hay is, I hear, seven pounds a ton at Worcester. However, unless we should have very early and even hard frosts, the grass will be so abundant that the cattle and sheep will do better than people are apt to think. But be this as it may, this summer has taught us that our climate is the best for produce after all, and that we cannot have Italian sun and English meat and cheese. We complain of the drip, but it is the drip that makes the beef and the mutton. Mr. Hanford's house is on the side of Breeden Hill, about a third part up it, and it is a very delightful place. The house is of ancient date, and it appears to have been always inhabited by and the property of Roman Catholics, for there is in one corner of the very top of the building, up in the very roof of it, a Catholic chapel, as ancient as the roof itself. It is about twenty-five feet long and ten wide. It has archwork to imitate the roof of a church. At the back of the altar there is a little room, which you enter through a door going out of the chapel, and adjoining this little room there is a closet, in which is a trap-door made to let the priest down into one of those hiding-places, which were contrived for the purpose of evading the grasp of those greedy Scotch minions, to whom that pious and tolerant Protestant James I delivered over those English gentlemen, who remained faithful to the religion of their fathers, and, to set his country free from which greedy and cruel grasp, that honest Englishman Guy Fawkes wished, as he bravely told the King and his Scotch council, to blow the Scotch beggars back to their mountains again. Even this King has, in his works, for James was an author, had the justice to call him the English Scavola. And we Englishmen, fools set on by knaves, have the folly or the baseness to burn him in effigy on the 5th November, the anniversary of his intended exploit. In the hall of this house there is a portrait of Sir Thomas Winter, who was one of the accomplices of Fawkes, and who was killed in the fight with the sheriff and his party. There is also the portrait of his lady, who must have spent half her lifetime in the working of some very curious sacerdotal vestments, which are preserved here with great care, and are as fresh and as beautiful as they were the day they were finished. A parson said to me once by letter, "'Your religion, Mr. Cobbett, seems to me to be altogether political.' "'Very much so indeed,' answered I, "'and well it may, since I have been furnished with a creed which makes part of an act of Parliament. "'And the fact is, I am no doctor of divinity, and like a religion, any religion, "'that tends to make men innocent and benevolent and happy, "'by taking the best possible means of furnishing them with plenty to eat and drink and wear. "'I am a Protestant of the Church of England, and as such blush to see "'that more than half the parsonage houses are wholly gone, or I become mere hovels. What I have written on the Protestant Reformation has proceeded entirely from a sense of justice towards our calumniated Catholic forefathers, to whom we owe all those of our institutions that are worthy of our admiration and gratitude. I have not written as a Catholic, but as an Englishman, yet a sincere Catholic must feel some little gratitude towards me, and if there was an ungrateful reptile in the neighbourhood of Preston to give, as a toast, success to Stanley and Wood, the conduct of those Catholics that I have seen here has, as far as I am concerned, amply compensated for his baseness. This neighbourhood has witnessed some pretty thumping transfers from the Normans. Holland, one of Baring's partners, or clerks, has recently bought an estate of Lord Summers, called Dumbleton, for, it is said, about eighty thousand pounds. Another estate of the same lord, called Strensham, has been bought by a Birmingham banker of the name of Taylor, for, it is said, seventy thousand pounds. Eastnor Castle, just over the Malvern Hills, is still building, and Lord Eastnor lives at that pretty little warm and snug place, the Priory of Reigate in Surrey, and close by the not less snug little borough of the same name. Memorandum. When we were petitioning for reform in 1817, my Lord Summers wrote and published a pamphlet under his own name, condemning our conduct and our principles, and insisting that we, if let alone, should produce a revolution and endanger all property. The bearings are adding field to field and tract to tract in Herefordshire, and as to the Ricardos, they seem to be animated with the same laudable spirit. This Osman Ricardo has a park at one of his estates, called Broomsborough, and that park has a new porter's lodge, upon which there is a span new cross as large as life. Aye, big enough and long enough to crucify a man upon. I had never seen such an one before, and I know not what sort of thought it was that seized me at the moment, but though my horse is but a clumsy goer, 
I verily believe I got away from it at the rate of ten or twelve miles an hour. My companion, who is always upon the lookout for cross-ditches or pieces of timber on the roadside, to fill up the time of which my jog-trot gives him so wearisome a surplus, seemed delighted at this my new pace, and I dare say he has wandered ever since, what should have given me wings just for that once, and that once only. Worcester, Tuesday, 26 September Mr. Price rode with us to this city, which is one of the cleanest, neatest, and handsomest towns I ever saw. Indeed, I do not recollect to have seen any one equal to it. The cathedral is indeed a poor thing, compared with any of the others, except that of Hereford, and I have seen them all but those of Carlisle, Durham, York, Lincoln, Chester, and Peterborough. But the town is, I think, the very best I ever saw, and which is indeed the greatest of all recommendations. The people are, upon the whole, the most suitably dressed and most decent-looking people. The town is precisely in character with the beautiful and rich country, in the midst of which it lies. Everything you see gives you the idea of real, solid wealth. Ay, and thus it was, too, before, long before Pitt, and even long before good Queen Bess and her military law and her Protestant racks, were ever heard or dreamed of. At Worcester, as everywhere else, I find a group of cordial and sensible friends, and the house of one of whom, Mr. George Brooke, I have just spent a most pleasant evening, in company with several gentlemen, whom he had had the goodness to invite to meet me. I here learned a fact which I must put upon record, before it escaped my memory. Some few years ago, about seven perhaps, at the public sale by auction of the goods of a then recently deceased attorney, of the name of Hyde, in this city, there were, amongst the goods to be sold, the portraits of Pitt, Burdett, and Payne, all framed and glazed. Pitt, with hard driving and very lofty praises, fetched fifteen shillings, Burdett fetched twenty-seven shillings, Payne was, in great haste, knocked down at five pounds, and my informant was convinced that the lucky purchaser might have had fifteen pounds for it. I hear Colonel Davis spoken of here with great approbation. He will soon have an opportunity of showing us whether he deserve it. The hop-picking and bagging is over here. The crop, as in the other hop countries, has been very great, and the quality as good as ever was known. The average price appears to be about seventy-five shillings a hundredweight. The reader, if he do not belong to a hop country, should be told that hop-planters, and even all their neighbours, are, as hopward, mad, though the most sane and reasonable people, as to all other matters. They are ten times more jealous upon this score than men ever are of their wives, ay, and than they are of their mistresses, which is going a great deal further. I, who am a Farnham man, was well aware of this foible, and therefore when a gentleman told me that he would not brew with Farnham hops, if he could have them as a gift, I took special care not to ask him how it came to pass, that the Farnham hops always sold at about double the price of the Worcester. But if he had said the same thing to any other Farnham man that I ever saw, I should have preferred being absent from the spot. The hops are bitter, but nothing is their bitterness compared to the language that my townsman would have put forth. This city, or this neighbourhood at least, being the birthplace of what I have called the Little Shilling Project, and Messrs. Atwood and Spooner being the originators of the project, and the project having been adopted by Mr. Weston, and having been by him now again recently urged upon the ministers, in a letter to Lord Liverpool, and it being possible that some worthy persons may be misled, and even ruined, by the confident assertions and the pertinacity of the projectors. This being the case, and I having half an hour to spare, will here endeavour to show, in as few words as I can, that this project, if put into execution, would produce injustice the most crying that the world ever heard of, and would, in the present state of things, infallibly lead to a violent revolution. The project is to lower the standard, as they call it, that is to say, to make a sovereign pass for more than twenty shillings. In what degree they would reduce the standard, they do not say. But a vile pamphlet-writer, whose name is Cropwell, and who is a beneficed parson, and who has most foully abused me, because I laugh at the project, says that he would reduce it one half. That is to say, that he would make a sovereign pass for two pounds. Well, then, let us, for plainness' sake, suppose that the present sovereign is, all at once, to pass for two pounds. What will the consequences be? Why, here is a parson who receives his tithes in kind, and whose tithes are, we will suppose, a thousand bushels of wheat in a year, on an average, and he owes a thousand pounds to somebody. He will pay his debt with five hundred sovereigns, and he will still receive his thousand bushels of wheat a year. I let a farm for a hundred pounds a year by the year, and I have a mortgage of two thousand pounds upon it, the interest just taking away the rent. Pass the project, and then I, of course, raise my rent to two hundred pounds a year, and I still pay the mortgagee a hundred pounds a year. What can be plainer than this? But the banker's is a fine case. I deposit with a banker a thousand whole sovereigns to-day. Pass the project to-morrow, and the banker pays me my deposit with a thousand half-sovereigns. 
if indeed you could double the quantity of corn and meat and all goods by the same act of parliament then all would be right but that quantity will remain what it was before you pass the project and of course the money being doubled in nominal amount the price of the goods would be doubled there needs not another word upon the subject and whatever may be the national inference respecting the intellects of messrs atwood and spooner i must say that i do most sincerely believe that there is not one of my readers who will not feel astonishment that any men having the reputation of men of sound mind should not clearly see that such a project must almost instantly produce a revolution of the most dreadful character stanford park wednesday twenty seventh september morning in a letter which i received from sir thomas winnington one of the members for this county last year he was good enough to request that i would call upon him if i ever came into worcestershire which i told him i would do and accordingly here we are in his house situated certainly in one of the finest spots in all england we left worcester yesterday about ten o'clock crossed the seven which runs close by the town and came on to this place which lies in a north-western direction from worcester at fourteen miles distance from that city and at about six from the borders of shropshire about four miles back we passed by the park and through the estate of lord foley to whom is due the praise of being a most indefatigable and successful planter of trees he seems to have taken uncommon pains in the execution of this work and he has the merit of disinterestedness the trees being chiefly oaks which he is sure he can never see grow to timber we crossed the team river just before we got here sir thomas was out shooting but he soon came home and gave us a very polite reception i had time yesterday to see the place to look at trees and the like and i wish to get away early this morning but being prevailed on to stay to breakfast here i am at six o'clock in the morning in one of the best and best stocked private libraries that i ever saw and what is more the owner from what passed yesterday when he brought me hither convinced me that he was acquainted with the insides of the books i asked and shall ask no questions about who got these books together but the collection is such as i am sure i never saw before in a private house the house and stables and courts are such as they ought to be for the great estate that surrounds them and the park is everything that is beautiful on one side of the house looking over a fine piece of water you see a distant valley opening between lofty hills on another side the ground descends a little at first then goes gently rising for a while and then rapidly to the distance of a mile perhaps where it is crowned with trees in irregular patches or groups single and most magnificent trees being scattered all over the whole of the park on another side there rise up beautiful little hills some in the form of barrows on the downs only forty or hundred times as large one or two with no trees on them and others topped with trees but on one of these little hills and some yards higher than the lofty trees which are on this little hill you see rising up the tower of the parish church which hill is i think taken altogether amongst the most delightful objects that i ever beheld well then says the devil of laziness and could you not be contented to live here all the rest of your life and never again pester yourself with the cursed politics why i think i have laboured enough let others work now and such a pretty place for coursing and for hare hunting and woodcock shooting i dare say and then those pretty wild ducks in the water and the flowers and the grass and the trees and all the birds in spring and the fresh air and never never again to be stifled with the smoke that from the infernal wen ascendeth for evermore and that every easterly wind brings to choke me at kensington the last word of this soliloquy carried me back slap to my own study very much unlike that which i am in and bade me think of the gridiron bade me think of the complete triumph that i have yet to enjoy promise me the pleasure of seeing a million of trees of my own and sown by my own hands this very year ah but the hares and the pheasants and the wild ducks yes but the delight of seeing prosperity robinson hang his head for shame the delight of beholding the tormenting embarrassments of those who have so long retained crowds of base miscreants to revile me the delight of ousting spitten upon stanley and bound over wood yes but then the flowers and the birds and the sweet air what then shall canning never again hear of the revered and ruptured ogden shall he go into his grave without being again reminded of driving at the whole herd in order to get at the ignoble animal shall he never again be told of six acts and of his wish to extinguish that accursed torch of discord for ever oh god forbid farewell hares and dogs and birds what shall sidmouth then never again hear of his power of imprisonment bill of his circular of his letter of thanks to the manchester yeomanry i really jumped up when this thought came athwart my mind and without thinking of the breakfast said to george who was sitting by me go george and tell them to saddle the horses for it seemed to me that i had been meditating some crime upon george asking me whether i would not stop to breakfast i bade him not order the horses out yet and here we are waiting for breakfast 
Ryle, Wednesday night, 27th September. After breakfast we took our leave of Sir Thomas Winnington and of Stanford, very much pleased with our visit. We wished to reach Ryle as early as possible in the day, and we did not therefore stop at Worcester. We got here about three o'clock, and we intend to set off in another direction early in the morning. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Rural Rides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter Twenty Five. Ride from Ryle in Worcestershire to Berkeley in Hampshire. Alas, the country! How shall tongue or pen bewail her now, uncountry gentlemen? the last to bid the cry of warfare cease, the first to make a malady of peace? For what were all these country patriots born, to hunt and vote and raise the price of corn? But corn, like every mortal thing, must fall, kings, conquerors, and markets most of all. Lord Byron Ryle, Friday morning, 29th September, 1826 I have observed in this country, and especially near Worcester, that the working people seem to be better off than in many other parts, one cause of which is, I dare say, that glove manufacturing, which cannot be carried on by fire or by wind or by water, and which is therefore carried on by the hands of human beings. It gives work to women and children as well as to men, and that work is, by a great part of the women and children, done in their cottages and amidst the fields and hop-gardens, where the husbands and sons must live, in order to raise the food and the drink and the wool. This is a great thing for the land. If this glove-making were to cease, many of these women and children, now not upon the parish, must instantly be upon the parish. The glove-trade is, like all others, slack from this last change in the value of money. But there is no horrible misery here, as at Manchester, Leeds, Glasgow, Paisley, and other hell-holes of eighty-four degrees of heat. There misery walks abroad in skin, bone, and nakedness. There are no subscriptions wanted for Worcester, no militia clothing, the working people suffer, trades people suffer, and who is to escape except the monopolizers, the Jews, and the tax eaters, when the government chooses to raise the value of money and lower the price of goods? The whole of the industrious part of the country must suffer in such a case. But where manufacturing is mixed with agriculture, where the wife and daughters are at the needle or the wheel, while the men and the boys are at plough, and where the manufacturing, of which one or two towns are the centres, is spread over the whole country round about, and particularly where it is, in very great part, performed by females at their own homes, and where the earnings come in aid of the man's wages, in such case the misery cannot be so great, and accordingly, while there is an absolute destruction of life going on in the hell-holes, there is no visible misery at or near Worcester, and I cannot take my leave of this county without observing, that I do not recollect to have seen one miserable object in it. The working people all seem to have good large gardens, and pigs in their styes, and this last, say the philosophers what they will about her intellectual enjoyments, is the only security for happiness in a labourer's family. Then this glove manufacturing is not like that of cottons, a mere gambling concern, making baronets to-day and bankrupts to-morrow, and making those who do the work slaves. Here are no masses of people called together by a bell, and kept to it by a driver. Here are no patriots who, while they keep Englishmen to it by fines, and almost by the scourge, in a heat of eighty-four degrees, are petitioning the Parliament to give freedom to the South Americans, who, as these patriots have been informed, use a great quantity of cottons. The dilapidation of parsonage-houses, and the depopulation of villages, appears not to have been so great just round about Worcester, as in some other parts but they have made great progress even here. No man appears to fat an ox, or hardly a sheep, except to the view of sending it to London, or to some other infernal resort of monopolizers and tax-eaters. Here, as in Wiltshire and Gloucestershire, and Herefordshire, you find plenty of large churches without scarcely any people. I dare say that even in this county, more than one half of the parishes have either no parsonage-houses at all, or have not one that a parson thinks fit for him to live in. And I venture to assert, that one or the other of these is the case in four parishes out of every five in Herefordshire. 
Is not this a monstrous shame? Is this a church? Is this law? The parsons get the tithes and the rent of the glebe lands, and the parsonage houses are left to tumble down, and nettles and brambles to hide the spot where they stood. But the fact is, the Jew system has swept all the little gentry, the small farmers, and the domestic manufacturers away. The land is now used to raise food and drink for the monopolizers and the tax-eaters, and their purveyors and lackeys and harlots, and they get together in wens. Of all the mean, all the cowardly reptiles that ever crawled on the face of the earth, the English landowners are the most mean and the most cowardly. For, while they support the churches in their several parishes, while they see the population drawn away from their parishes to the wens, while they are taxed to keep the people in the wens, and while they see their own parsons pocket the tithes and the glebe rents and suffer the parsonage houses to fall down, while they see all this, they, without uttering a word in the way of complaint, suffer themselves and their neighbours to be taxed, to build new churches for the monopolizers and tax-eaters in those winds. Never was there in this world a set of reptiles so base as this. Stupid as many of them are, they must clearly see the flagrant injustice of making the depopulated parishes pay for the aggrandizement of those who have caused the depopulation, ay, actually pay taxes to add to the winds, and, of course, to cause a further depopulation of the taxed villages. Stupid beasts, as many of them are, they must see the flagrant injustice of this, and mean and cowardly as many of them are, some of them would remonstrate against it. But, alas, the far greater part of them are themselves getting or expecting loaves and fishes, either in their own persons or in those of their family. They smooch, or want to smooch, some of the taxes, and therefore they must not complain. And thus the thing goes on. These landowners see, too, the churches falling down, and the parsonage houses either tumbled down or dilapidated. But then mind, they have amongst them the giving away of the benefices. Of course, all they want is the income, and the less the parsonage house costs, the larger the spending income. But in the meanwhile, here is a destruction of public property, and also, from a diversion of the income of the livings, a great injury, great injustice, to the middle and the working classes. Is this, then, is this church a thing to remain untouched? Shall the widow and the orphan, whose money has been borrowed by the landowners, including the parsons, to purchase victories with, shall they be stripped of their interest, of their very bread? And shall the parsons, who have let half the parsonage houses fall down, or become unfit to live in, still keep all the tithes and the glebe lands, and the immense landed estates called church lands? Oh, no! Sir James Graham of Netherby, though you are a descendant of the earls of Monteith, of John of the Bright Sword, and of the seventh earl of Galloway, K.T., taking care, for God's sake, not to omit the K.T., though you may be the Magnus Apollo, and in short be you what you may, you shall never execute your project of sponging the fund-holders, and of leaving Monsieur the Parsons untouched. In many parishes, where the livings are good too, there is neither parsonage-house nor church. This is the case at Draycott Foliot, in Wiltshire. The living is a rectory, the parson has, of course, both great and small tithes. These tithes and the glebe land are worth, I am told, more than three hundred pounds a year, and yet there is neither church nor parsonage-house. Both have been suffered to fall down and disappear. And when a new parson comes to take possession of the living, there is, I am told, a temporary tent or booth erected, upon the spot where the church ought to be, for the performance of the ceremony of induction. What, then? Ought not this church to be repealed? An act of Parliament made this church, an act of Parliament can unmake it. And is there any but a monster who would suffer this parson to retain this income, while that of the widow and the orphan was taken away? Oh, no! Sir James Graham of Netherby, who, with the gridiron before you, say that there was no man of any authority who foresaw the effects of Peel's bill. Oh, no, thou stupid, thou empty-headed, thou insolent, aristocratic pamphleteer, the widow and the orphan shall not be robbed of their bread, while this parson of Draycott Foliot keeps the income of his living. On my return from Worcester to this place yesterday, I noticed at a village called Seven Stoke a very curiously constructed grape-house, that is to say a hot-house for the raising of grapes. Upon inquiry I found that it belonged to a parson of the name of St. John, whose parsonage-house is very near to it, and who, being sure of having the benefice when the then rector should die, bought a piece of land and erected his grapery on it, just facing, and only about fifty yards from, the windows out of which the old parson had to look until the day of his death, with a view, doubtless, of piously furnishing his aged brother with a memento mori, remember death, 
quite as significant as a death's head and crossbones, and yet done in a manner expressive of that fellow-feeling, that delicacy, that abstinence from self-gratification, which are well known to be characteristics almost peculiar to the cloth. To those, if there be such, who may be disposed to suspect that the grapery arose, upon the spot where it stands, merely from the desire to have the vines in bearing state, against the time that the old parson should die, or, as I heard the botley parson once call it, kick the bucket, to such persons I would just put this one question. Did they ever, either from scripture or tradition, learn that any of the apostles or their disciples erected graperies from motives such as this? They may indeed say that they never heard of the apostles erecting any graperies at all, much less of their having erected them from such a motive. Nor, to say the truth, did I ever hear of any such erections on the part of those apostles, and those whom they commissioned to preach the word of God? And Sir William Scott, now a lord of some sort, never convinced me, by his parson-praising speech of 1802, that to give the church clergy a due degree of influence over the minds of the people, to make the people revere them, it was necessary that the parsons and their wives should shine at balls and in pump-rooms. On the contrary, these and the like have taken away almost the whole of their spiritual influence— they never had much, but lately, and especially since 1793, they have had hardly any at all, and wherever I go I find them much better known as justices of the peace than as clergymen. What they would come to, if this system could go on for only a few years longer, I know not, but go on, as it is now going, it cannot much longer. There must be a settlement of some sort, and that settlement never can leave that mass, that immense mass of public property called church property, to be used as it now is. I have seen in this country, and in Herefordshire, several pieces of mangle wurzel, and I hear that it has nowhere failed as the turnips have. Even the lucerne has in some places failed, to a certain extent. But Mr. Walter Palmer, a pencoin in Herefordshire, has cut a piece of lucerne four times this last summer, and when I saw it on the 17th September, twelve days ago, it was got a foot high towards another cut. But with one exception too trifling to mention, Mr. Walter Palmer's lucerne is on the Tullian plan, that is, it is in rows at four feet distance from each other, so that you plough between as often as you please, and thus, together with the little hand weeding between the plants, keep the ground at all times, clear of weeds and grass. Mr. Palmer says that his acre, he has no more, has kept two horses all the summer, and he seems to complain that it has done no more. Indeed, a stout horse will eat much more than a fatting ox." this grass will fat any ox or sheep. And would not Mr. Palmer like to have ten acres of land that would fat a score of oxen? They would do this if they were managed well. But is it nothing to keep a team of four horses for five months in the year on the produce of two acres of land? If a man say that, he must, of course, be eagerly looking forward to another world, for nothing will satisfy him in this. A good crop of early cabbages may be had between the rows of Lucerne. Cabbages have generally wholly failed— those that I see are almost all too backward to make much of heads, though it is surprising how fast they will grow and come to perfection as soon as there is twelve hours of night. I am here, however, speaking of the large sorts of cabbage, for the smaller sorts will loave in summer. Mr. Walter Palmer has now a piece of these, of which I think they are from seventeen to twenty tons to the acre, and this too observe after a season which on the same farm has not suffered a turnip of any sort to come. If he had had twenty acres of these, he might have almost laughed at the failure of his turnips, and at the short crop of hay, and this is a crop of which a man may always be sure, if he take proper pains. These cabbages, early yorks or some such sort, should, if you want them in June or July, be sown early in the previous August, if you want them in winter, sown in April, and treated as pointed out in my cottage economy. These small sorts stand the winter better than the large. They are more nutritious, and they occupy the ground little more than half the time. Dwarf savoys are the finest and richest and most nutritious of cabbages. Sown early in April and planted out early in July, they will, at eighteen inches apart each way, yield a crop of thirty to forty tons by Christmas. But all this supposes land very good, or very well manured, and plants of a good sort, and well raised and planted, and the ground well tilled after planting, and a crop of thirty tons, is worth all these, and all the care, and all the pains that a man can possibly take. I am here amongst the finest of cattle, and the finest sheep of the Leicester kind that I ever saw. My host, Mr. Price, is famed as a breeder of cattle and sheep. 
the cattle are of the hereford kind and the sheep surpassing any animals of the kind that i ever saw the animals seem to be made for the soil and the soil for them in taking leave of this county i repeat with great satisfaction what i before said about the apparent comparatively happy state of the labouring people and i have been very much pleased with the tone and manner in which they are spoken to and spoken of by their superiors i heard of no hard treatment of them here such as i have but too often heard of in some counties and too often witnessed in others and i quit worcestershire and particularly the house in which i am with all those feelings which are naturally produced by the kindest of receptions from frank and sensible people fairford gloucestershire saturday morning thirtieth september though we came about forty-five miles yesterday we are up by daylight and just about to set off to sleep at hayden near swindon in wiltshire hayden saturday night thirtieth september from ryle in worcestershire we came yesterday friday morning first to tewkesbury in gloucestershire this is a good substantial town which for many years sent to parliament that sensible and honest and constant hater of pitt and his infernal politics james martin and which now sends to the same place his son mr john martin who when the memorable kentish petition was presented in june eighteen twenty two proposed that it should not be received or that if it were received the house should not separate until it had resolved that the interest of the debt should never be reduced castlereagh abused the petition but was for receiving it in order to fix on it a mark of the house's reprobation i said in the next register that this fellow was mad and in six or seven weeks from that day he cut his own throat and was declared to have been mad at the time when this petition was presented the mess that the house will be in will be bad enough as it is but what would have been its mess if it had in its strong fit of good faith been furious enough to adopt mr martin's resolution the warwickshire avon falls into the severn here and on the sides of both for many miles back they are the finest meadows that ever were seen in looking over them and beholding the endless flocks and herds one wonders what can become of all the meat by riding on about eight or nine miles further however this wonder is a little diminished for here we come to one of the devouring wens namely cheltenham which is what they call a watering place that is to say a place to which east india plunderers west india floggers english tax gorgers together with gluttons drunkards and debauchees of all descriptions female as well as male resort at the suggestion of silently laughing quacks in the hope of getting rid of the bodily consequences of their manifold sins and iniquities when i enter a place like this i always feel disposed to squeeze up my nose with my fingers it is nonsense to be sure but i can see that every two-legged creature that i see coming near me is about to cover me with the poisonous proceeds of its impurities to places like this come all that is knavish and all that is foolish and all that is base gamesters pickpockets and harlots young wife hunters in search of rich and ugly and old women and young husband hunters in search of rich and wrinkled or half rotten men the former resolutely bent be the means what they may to give the latter heirs to their lands and tenements these things are notorious and sir william scott in his speech of eighteen o two in favour of the non-residence of the clergy expressly said that they and their families ought to appear at watering-places and that this was amongst the means of making them respected by their flocks memorandum he was a member for oxford when he said this before we got into cheltenham i learned from a coal-carter which way we had to go in order to see the new buildings which are now nearly at a stand we rode up the main street of the town for some distance and then turned off to the left which soon brought us to the desolation of abomination i have seldom seen anything with more heartfelt satisfaction oh said i to myself the accursed thing has certainly got a blow then in every part of its corrupt and corrupting carcass the whole town and it was now ten o'clock looked delightfully dull i did not see more than four or five carriages and perhaps twenty people on horseback and these seemed by their hook noses and round eyes and by the long and sooty necks of the women to be for the greater part jews and jewesses the place really appears to be sinking very fast and i have been told and believe the fact that houses in cheltenham will now sell for only just about one-third as much as the same would have sold for only in last october it is curious to see the names which the vermin owners have put upon the houses here there is a new row of most gaudy and fantastical dwelling-places called columbia place given it doubtless by some dealer in bonds there is what a boy told us was the new spa there is waterloo house oh how i rejoice at the ruin of the base creatures 
there's liverpool cottage canning cottage peel cottage and the good of it is that the ridiculous beasts have put this word cottage upon scores of houses and some very mean and shabby houses standing along and making part of an unbroken street what a figure this place will cut in another year or two i should not wonder to see it nearly wholly deserted it is situated in a nasty flat stupid spot without anything pleasant near it a putting down of the one pound notes will soon take away its spa people those of the notes that have already been cut off have it seems lessened the quantity of ailments very considerably another brush will cure all the complaints they have had some rains in the summer not far from this place for we saw in the streets very fine turnips for sale as vegetables and broccoli with heads six or eight inches over but as to the meat it was nothing to be compared with that of warminster in wiltshire that is to say the veal and lamb i have paid particular attention to this matter at worcester and tewkesbury as well as at cheltenham and i have seen no veal and no lamb to be compared with those of warminster i have been thinking but cannot imagine how it is that the wen devils either at bath or london do not get this meat away from warminster i hope that my observations on it will not set them to work for if it do the people of warminster will never have a bit of good meat again after cheltenham we had to reach this pretty little town of fairford the regular turnpike road to which lay through sirencester but i had from a fine map at sir thomas winnington's traced out a line for us along through a chain of villages leaving sirencester away to our right and never coming nearer than seven or eight miles to it we came through doddswell withington chedworth winston and the two corns at doddswell we came up a long and steep hill which brought us out of the great vale of gloucester and up upon the cotswold hills which name is tautological i believe for i think that world mean high lands of great extent such is the cotswold at any rate for it is a tract of country stretching across in a south-easterly direction from doddswell to near fairford and in a north-easterly direction from pitchcomb hill in gloucestershire which remember i descended on the twelfth september to near whitney in oxfordshire here we were then when we got fairly up upon the wold with the vale of gloucester at our back oxford and its vale to our left the vale of wiltshire to our right and the vale of berkshire in our front and from one particular point i could see a part of each of them this wold is in itself an ugly country the soil is what is called a stone brash below with a reddish earth mixed with little bits of this brash at top and for the greater part of the wold even this soil is very shallow and as fields are divided by walls made of this brash and as there are for a mile or two together no trees to be seen and as the surface is not smooth and green like the downs this is a sort of country having less to please the eye than any other that i have ever seen always save and except the heaths like those of bagshot and hindhead yet even this world has many fertile dells in it and sends out from its highest parts several streams each of which has its pretty valley and its meadows and here has come down to us from a distance of many centuries a particular race of sheep called the cotswold breed which are of course the best suited to the country they are short and stocky and appear to me to be about half way in point of size between the rylands and the south downs when crossed with the leicester as they are pretty generally in the north of wiltshire they make very beautiful and even large sheep quite large enough and people say very profitable a route when it lies through villages is one thing on a map and quite another thing on the ground our line of villages from cheltenham to fairford was very nearly straight upon the map but upon the ground it took us round about a great many miles besides now and then a little going back to get into the right road and which was a great inconvenience not a public house was there on our road until we got within eight miles of fairford resolved that not one single farthing of my money should be spent in the win of cheltenham we came through that place expecting to find a public house in the first or second of the villages but not one was there over the whole of the world and though i had by pocketing some slices of meat and bread at ryle provided against this contingency as far as related to ourselves i could make no such provision for our horses and they went a great deal too far without baiting plenty of farmhouses and if they had been in america we need have looked for no other very likely i hope it at any rate almost any farmer on the cotswold would have given us what we wanted if we had asked for it but the fashion the good old fashion was by the hellish system of funding and taxing and monopolising driven across the atlantic and is england never to see it return is the hellish system to last for ever dr black in remarking upon my ride down the vale of the salisbury avon says that there has doubtless been a falling off in the population of the villages 
lying amongst the chalk hills, aye, and lying everywhere else, too, or how comes it that four-fifths of the parishes of Herefordshire, abounding in rich land, in meadows, orchards, and pastures, have either no parsonage houses at all, or have none that a parson thinks fit for him to live in? I vouch for the fact. I will, whether in Parliament or not, prove the fact to the Parliament, and if the fact be such, the conclusion is inevitable. But how melancholy is the sight of these decayed and still decaying villages in the dells of the Cotswold, where the building materials being stone, the ruins do not totally disappear for ages. The village of Withington, mentioned above, has a church like a small cathedral, and the whole of the population is now only six hundred and three persons, men, women, and children. So that, according to the Scotch fellows, this immense and fine church, which is as sound as it was seven or eight hundred years ago, was built by and for a population containing, at most, only about a hundred and twenty grown-up and able-bodied men. But here, in this once populous village, or, I think, town, you see all the indubitable marks of most melancholy decay. There are several lanes crossing each other, which must have been streets formerly. There is a large open space where the principal streets meet. There are, against this open place, two large old roomy houses, with gateways into back parts of them, and with large stone upping-blocks against the walls of them in the street. These were manifestly considerable inns, and in this open place markets or fairs, or both, used to be held. I asked two men who were threshing in a barn how long it was since their public-house was put down or dropped. They told me about sixteen years. One of these men, who was about fifty years of age, could remember three public-houses, one of which was what was called an inn. The place stands by the side of a little brook, which here rises, or rather issues, from a high hill, and which, when it has winded down for some miles, and through several villages, begins to be called the River Colm, and continues on under this name through Fairford and along, I suppose, till it falls into the Thames. Withington is very prettily situated. It was, and not very long ago, a gay and happy place, but it now presents a picture of dilapidation and shabbiness scarcely to be equalled. Here are the yet visible remains of two gentlemen's houses. Great farmers have supplied their place as to inhabiting, and I dare say that some tax-eater or some blaspheming Jew, or some still more base and wicked loan-mongering robber, is now the owner of the land. Aye, and all these people are his slaves as completely, and more to their wrong, than the blacks are the slaves of the planters in Jamaica, the farmers here acting, in fact, in a capacity corresponding with that of the negro drivers there. A part and perhaps a considerable part of the decay and misery of this place, is owing to the use of machinery, and to the monopolising and the manufacture of blankets, of which fabric the town of Whitney above mentioned was the centre, and from which town the wool used to be sent round to, and the yarn or warp come back from, all these Cotswold villages, and quite into a part of Wiltshire. This work is all now gone, and so the women and the girls are surplus population, mon and are, of course, to be dealt with by the emigration committee of the collective wisdom. There were, only a few years ago, above thirty blanket manufacturers at Whitney. Twenty-five of these have been swallowed up by the five that now have all the manufacture in their hands. And all this has been done by that system of gambling and of fictitious money, which has conveyed property from the hands of the many into the hands of the few. But wise Burdett likes this. He wants the land to be cultivated by few hands, and he wants machinery and all those things which draw money into large masses that make a nation consist of a few of very rich and of millions of very poor. Burdett must look sharp, or this system will play him a trick before it come to an end. The crops on the Cotswold have been pretty good, and I was very much surprised to see a scattering of early turnips, and in some places decent crops. Upon this world I saw more early turnips in a mile or two than I saw in all Herefordshire and Worcestershire, and in all the rich and low part of Gloucestershire. The high lands always during the year, and especially during the summer, receive much more of rain than the low lands. The clouds hang about the hills, and the dews, when they rise, go most frequently and cap the hills. Wheat sowing is yet going on, on the world, but the greater part of it is sown, and not only sown, but up, and in some places high enough to hide a hare. What a difference! In some parts of England no man thinks of sowing wheat till November, and it is often done in March. If the latter were done on this world, there would not be a bushel on an acre. The ploughing and other work on the world is done, in great part, by oxen, and here are some of the finest ox-teams that I ever saw. All the villages down to Fairford are pretty much in the same dismal condition as that of Withington. Fairford, which is quite on the border of Gloucestershire, is a very pretty little market-town, 
and has one of the prettiest churches in the kingdom. It was, they say, built in the reign of Henry the Seventh, and one is naturally surprised to see that its windows of beautiful stained glass had the luck to escape not only the fangs of the ferocious good Queen Bess, not only the unsparing, plundering minions of James I, but even the devastating ruffians of Cromwell. We got in here about four o'clock, and at the house of Mr. Isles, where we slept, passed, amongst several friends, a very pleasant evening. This morning Mr. Isles was so good as to ride with us as far as the house of another friend at Kempsford, which is the last Gloucestershire parish in our route. At this friend's, Mr. Arkell, we saw a fine dairy of about sixty or eighty cows, and a cheese loft with perhaps more than two thousand cheeses in it, at least there were many hundreds. This village contains what are said to be the remnants and ruins of a mansion of John of Gaunt. The church is very ancient and very capacious. What tales these churches do tell upon us! What fools! What lazy dogs! What presumptuous asses! What lying braggarts! They make us appear. No people here, mon, till the Scots come to civilize us. Impudent lying beggars! Their stinking kelts ought to be taken up, and the brazen and insolent vagabonds whipped back to their heaths and their rocks. Let them go and thrive by their cash credits, and let their paper-money poet, Walter Scott, immortalize their deeds. That conceited, dunder-headed fellow, George Chalmers, estimated the whole of the population of England and Wales at a few persons more than two millions, when England was just at the highest point of her power and glory, and when all these churches had long been built and were resounding with the voices of priests who resided in their parishes and who relieved all the poor out of their tithes. But this same charm assigned his solemn conviction that Vortigern and the other Ireland manuscripts, which were written by a lad of sixteen, were written by Shakespeare. In coming to Kempsford we got wet and nearly to the skin, but our friends gave us coats to put on, while ours were dried, and while we ate our breakfast. In our way to this house, where we now are, Mr. Tucky's at Hayden, we called at Mr. James Crowdy's at Highworth, where I was from the 4th to the 9th of September inclusive, but it looked rainy and therefore we did not alight. We got wet again before we reached this place, but our journey being short, we soon got our clothes dry again. Berkeley, Hampshire, Monday, 2nd October. Yesterday was a really unfortunate day. The morning promised fair, but its promises were like those of Burdett. There was a little snivelling, wet, treacherous frost. We had to come through Swindon, and Mr. Tucky had the kindness to come with us, until we got three or four miles on this side, the Hungerford side, of that very neat and plain and solid and respectable market town. Swindon is in Wiltshire, and is in the real fat of the land, all being wheat, beans, cheese, or fat meat. In our way to Swindon, Mr. Tucky's farm exhibited to me what I never saw before. Four score oxen, all grazing upon one farm, and all nearly fat. They were some Devonshire and some Herefordshire. They were fatting on the grass only, and I should suppose that they are worth, or shortly will be, thirty pounds each but the great pleasure with which the contemplation of this fine sight was naturally calculated to inspire me was more than counterbalanced by the thought that these fine oxen, this primest of human food, was, I, every mouthful of it, destined to be devoured in the wind, and that too for the far greater part by the Jews, loan-jobbers, tax-eaters, and their base and prostituted followers, dependents, purveyors, parasites and pimps, literary as well as other wretches, who, if suffered to live at all, ought to partake of nothing but the offal, and ought to come but one cut before the dogs and cats. Mind you, there is, in my opinion, no land in England that surpasses this. There is, I suppose, as good in the three last counties that I have come through, but better than this is, I should think, impossible. There is a pasture-field of about a hundred acres close to Swindon, belonging to a Mr. Goddard, which, with its cattle and sheep, was a most beautiful sight. But everything is full of riches, and as fast as skill and care and industry can extract these riches from the land, the unseen grasp of taxation, loan-jobbing, and monopolising takes them away, leaving the labourers not half a bellyful, compelling the farmer to pinch them or to be ruined himself, and making even the landowner little better than a steward or bailiff for the tax-eaters, Jews, and jobbers. Just before we got to Swindon we crossed a canal at a place where there is a wharf and a coal-yard, and close by these a gentleman's house with coach-house, stables, walled-in garden, paddock orne, and the rest of those things which altogether make up a villa surpassing the second and approaching towards the first class. Seeing a man in the coal-yard, I asked him to what gentleman the house belonged. To the hidden the canal, said he, and when, upon further inquiry of him, I found that it was the villa of the chief manager, I could not help congratulating the proprietors of this aquatic concern, for though I did not ask the name of the canal, 
I could readily suppose that the profits must be prodigious, when the residence of the manager would imply no disparagement of dignity, if occupied by a secretary of state for the home, or even for the foreign department. I mean an English secretary of state, for as to an American one, his salary would be wholly inadequate to a residence in a mansion like this. From Swindon we came up into the down country, and these downs rise higher even than the Cotswold. We left Marlborough away to our right, and came along the turnpike road towards Hungerford, but with a view of leaving that town to our left further on, and going away through Ramsbury, towards the northernmost Hampshire hills, under which Berkeley, where we now are, lies. We passed some fine farms upon these downs, the houses and homesteads of which were near the road. My companion, though he had been to London, and even to France, had never seen downs before, and it was amusing to me to witness his surprise at seeing the immense flocks of sheep, which were now at ten o'clock, just going out from their several folds to the downs for the day, each having its shepherd, and each shepherd his dog. We passed the homestead of a farmer woodman, with sixteen banging wheat ricks in the rickyard, two of which were old ones, and rickyard, farmyard, wasteyard, horse paddock, and all round about seemed to be swarming with fowls, ducks, and turkeys, and on the whole of them not one feather but what was white. Turning our eyes from this sight, we saw, just going out from the folds of this same farm, three separate and numerous flocks of sheep, one of which, the lamb flock, we passed close by the side of. The shepherd told us that his flock consisted of thirteen score and five, but apparently he could not, if it had been to save his soul, tell us how many hundreds he had, and if you reflect a little you will find that his way of counting is much the easiest and best. This was a most beautiful flock of lambs, short-legged, and in every respect what they ought to be. George, though born and bred among sheep farms, had never before seen sheep with dark-coloured faces and legs, but his surprise at this sight was not nearly so great as the surprise of both of us at seeing numerous and very large pieces, sometimes fifty acres together, of very good early turnips, Swedish as well as white. All the three counties of Worcester, Hereford, and Gloucester, except on the Cotswold, do not, I am convinced, contain as great a weight of turnip bulbs, as we here saw in one single piece, for here there are, for miles and miles, no hedges and no fences of any sort. Doubtless they must have had rain here in the months of June and July. But as I once before observed, though I forget when, a chalk bottom does not suffer the surface to burn, however shallow the topsoil may be. It seems to me to absorb and to retain the water and to keep it ready to be drawn up by the heat of the sun. At any rate the fact is that the surface above it does not burn, for there never yet was a summer, not even this last, when the downs did not retain their greenness to a certain degree, while the rich pastures and even the meadows, except actually watered, were burnt so as to be as brown as the bare earth. This is the most pleasing circumstance attending the down countries, and there are no downs without a chalk bottom. Along here the country is rather too bare. Here, until you come to Oborn or Aldburn, there are no meadows in the valleys, and no trees even round the homesteads. This, therefore, is too naked to please me, but I love the down so much that if I had to choose, I would live even here, and especially I would farm here, rather than on the banks of the Wye in Herefordshire, in the Vale of Gloucester, of Worcester, or of Evesham, or even in what the Kentish men call their Garden of Eden. I have now seen, for I have years back seen the vales of Taunton, Glastonbury, Honiton, Dorchester, and Sherman, what are deemed the richest and most beautiful parts of England, and if called upon to name the spot which I deem the brightest and most beautiful, and of its extent best of all, I should say the villages of North Bovent and Bishopstrow, between Hatesbury and Warminster and Wiltshire, for there is, as appertaining to rural objects, everything that I delight in, smooth and verdant downs in hills and valleys of endless variety as to height and depth and shape, rich corn-land unencumbered by fences, meadows in due proportion, and those watered at pleasure, and lastly the homesteads and villages, sheltered in winter and shaded in summer by lofty and beautiful trees, to which may be added roads never dirty, and a stream never dry. When we came to Oborn we got amongst trees again. This is a town, and was manifestly once a large town. Its church is as big as three of that of Kensington. It has a market now, I believe, but I suppose it is, like many others, become merely nominal, the produce being nearly all carried to Hungerford, in order to be forwarded to the Jew-devils and the tax-eaters and monopolizers in the Wen, and in small Wens on the way. It is a decaying place, and I dare say that it would be nearly depopulated in twenty years' time, if this hellish jobbing system were to last so long. A little after we came through Oborn, we turned off to our right to go through Ramsbury to Shelburne, where Tull, the father of the drill husbandry, began and practised that husbandry at a farm called Prosperous. Our object was to reach this place, Berkeley, to sleep, 
and to stay for a day or two, and as I knew Mr. Blandy of Prosperous, I determined upon this route, which besides took us out of the turnpike road. We stopped at Ramsbury to bait our horses. It is a large and apparently miserable village, or town, as the people call it. It was in remote times a bishop's see. Its church is very large and very ancient. Parts of it were evidently built long and long before the Norman conquest. Burdett owns a great many of the houses in the village, which contains nearly two thousand people, and will, if he live many years, own nearly the whole. For as his eulogist, William Friend, the actuary, told the public, in a pamphlet in 1817, he has resolved that his numerous life-olds shall run out, and that those who are life-olders under his aunt, from whom he got the estate, shall become rack-renters to him, or quit the occupations. Besides this, he is continually purchasing lands and houses round about and in this place. He has now let his house to a Mr. Acres, and, as the morning herald says, is safe landed at Bordeaux with his family for the winter. When here he did not occupy a square inch of his land. He let it all, park and all, and only reserved a right of road from the highway to his door. He had and has a right to do all this. A right? Who denies that? But is this giving us a specimen of that liberality and generosity and hospitality of those English country gentlemen whose praises he so loudly sang last winter? His name is Francis Burdett Jones, which last name he was obliged to take by his aunt's will, and he actually used it for some time after the estate came to him. Jones was too common a name for him, I suppose. Sounded too much of the vulgar. However, what I have principally to do with is his absence from the country at a time like this, and if the newspapers be correct, his intended absence during the whole of next winter, and such a winter too as it is likely to be. He for many years complained, and justly, of the sinecure placeman, and are we to suffer him to be thus a sinecure member of Parliament? This is, in my opinion, a great deal worse than a sinecure placeman, for this is shutting an active member out. It is a dog-in-manger offence, and to the people of a place such as Westminster it is not only an injury but a most outrageous insult. If it be true that he intends to stay away during the coming session of Parliament, I trust not only that he never will be elected again, but that the people of Westminster will call upon him to resign, and this I am sure they will do too. The next session of Parliament must be a most important one, and that he knows well. Every member will be put to the test in the next session of Parliament. On the question of corn bills every man must declare for or against the people. He would declare against if he dared, and therefore he gets out of the way. Or, this is what we shall have a clear right to presume, if he be absent from the next session of Parliament. He knows that there must be something like a struggle between the landowners and the fundholders. His interest lies with the former. He wishes to support the law church and the army, and all sources of aristocratical profit, but he knows that the people of Westminster would be on the other side. It is better, therefore, to hear at Bordeaux about this struggle, than to be engaged in it. He must know of the great embarrassment, distress, and of the great bodily suffering now experienced by a large part of the people. And has he a right, after having got himself returned a member for such a place as Westminster, to go out of the country at such a time and leave his seat vacant? He must know that during the ensuing winter there must be a great distress in Westminster itself, for there will be a greater mass of the working people out of employ than there ever was in any winter before, and this calamity will too be owing to that infernal system which he has been supporting to those paper-money rooks with whom he is closely connected, and the existence of whose destructive rags he expressed his wish to prolong. He knows all this very well. He knows that in every quarter the distress and danger are great. And is it not then his duty to be here? Is he, who at his own request has been entrusted, with the representing of a great city, to get out of the way at a time like this, and under circumstances like these? If this be so, then is this great and once public-spirited city become more contemptible and infinitely more mischievous than the accursed hill of Wiltshire. But this is not so. The people of Westminster are what they always were, full of good sense and public spirit. They have been cheated by a set of bribed intriguers, and how this has been done I will explain to them. When I punish Sir Francis Burdett Jones for the sins committed for him by a hired Scotch writer, I shall dismiss him for the present with observing that if I had in me a millionth part of that malignity and vindictiveness which he so basely showed towards me, I have learned anecdotes sufficient to enable me to take ample vengeance on him for the stabs which he in 1817 knew that he was sending to the hearts of the defenceless part of my family. While our horses were baiting at Ramsbury it began to rain, and by the time that they had done it rained pretty hard, with every appearance of continuing to rain for the day, and it was now about eleven o'clock, we having eighteen or nineteen miles to go, 
before we got to the intended end of our journey. Having, however, for several reasons, a very great desire to get to Burghclere that night, we set off in the rain, and as we carry no great coats, we were wet to the skin pretty soon. Immediately upon quitting Ramsbury, we crossed the river Kennet, and mounting a higher shill, we looked back over Friend Sir Glory's Park, the sight of which brought into my mind the visit of Thimble and Cowhide, as described in the intense comedy, and when I thought of the bakers being starved to death, and of the heavy fall of snow, I could not help bursting out a laughing, though it poured of rain, and though I already felt the water on my skin. Memorandum to ask when I get to London what is become of the intense Councillor Brick, and whether he have yet had the justice to put the K to the end of his name. I saw a lovely female Shoyhoy, engaged in keeping the rooks from a newly sown wheat-field on the Cotswold Hills. That would be a very suitable match for him. And as his manners appear to be mended, as he now praises to the skies those forty-shilling freeholders, whom in my hearing he asserted to be beneath brute beasts, as he does in short appear to be rather less offensive than he was, I should have no objection to promote the union, and I am sure the farmer would like it of all things, for if Miss Stufto Straw can, when single, keep the devourers at a distance, say, you who know him, whether the sight of the husband's head would leave a rook in the country. Turning from viewing the scene of Thimble and Cowhide's cruel disappointment, we pushed through coppices and across fields, to a little village called Froxfield, which we found to be on the Great Bath Road. Here, crossing the road, and also a run of water, we, under the guidance of a man, who was good enough to go about a mile with us, and to whom we gave a shilling and the price of a pot of beer, mounted another hill, from which, after twisting about for a while, I saw and recognised the outbuildings of Prosperous Farm, towards which we pushed on as fast as we could, in order to keep ourselves in motion, so as to prevent our catching cold, for it rained and incessantly every step of the way. I had been at Prosperous before, so that I knew Mr. Blandy, the owner, and his family, who received us with great hospitality. They took care of our horses, gave us what we wanted in the eating and drinking way, and clothed us, shirts and all, while they dried all our clothes, for not only the things on our bodies were soaked, but those also which we carried in little thin leather rolls, fastened on upon the saddles before us. Notwithstanding all that could be done in the way of dispatch, it took more than three hours to get our clothes dry. At last, about three quarters of an hour before sunset, we got on our clothes again and set off, for, as an instance of real bad luck, it ceased to rain the moment we got to Mr. Blandy's. Including the numerous angles and windings, we had nine or ten miles yet to go, but I was so anxious to get to Berkeley, that contrary to my practice as well as my principle, I determined to encounter the darkness for once, though in cross-country roads presenting us at every mile, with ways crossing each other, or forming a Y, or kindly giving us the choice of three, forming the upper part of a Y and a half. Add to this that we were in an enclosed country, the lanes very narrow, deep-worn, and banks and hedges high. There was no moon, but it was starlight, and as I could see the Hampshire hills all along to my right, and knew that I must not get above a mile or so from them, I had a guide that could not deceive me, for as to asking the road in a case like this, it is of little use unless you meet someone at every half-mile, for the answer is, keep right on, aye, but in ten minutes perhaps you come to a Y, or to a T, or to a cross. A fellow told me once in my way from Chertsey to Guildford, keep right on, you can't miss your way. I was in the perpendicular part of the T, and the top part was only a few yards from me. Right on, said I, what, over that bank, into the wheat? No, no, said he, I mean that road, to be sure, pointing to the road that went off to the left. In down countries the direction of shepherds and pig and bird boys is always in precisely the same words, namely, right over the down, laying great stress upon the word right. But, said I, to a boy at the edge of the down at Kingsworthy, near Winchester, who gave me this direction to Stoke Charity, but what do you mean by right over the down? Why, said he, right on to Stoke, to be sure, sir. I, said I, but how am I, who was never here before, to know what is right, my boy? That posed him. It set him to thinking, and after a bit he proceeded to tell me that, when I got up the hill, I should see some trees, that I should go along by them, that I should then see a barn right before me, that I should go down to that barn, and that I should then see a wagon track that would lead me all down to Stoke. I, said I, now indeed you are a real clever fellow and I gave him a shilling, being part of my savings of the morning. Whoever tries it will find that the less they eat and drink when travelling, the better they will be. I act accordingly. Many days I have no breakfast and no dinner. I went from Devizes to Highworth without breaking my fast, a distance, including my deviations, of more than thirty miles. I sometimes take from a friend's house a little bit of meat between two bits of bread, which I eat as I ride along, but whatever I say from this fasting work, I think I have a clear right to give away, 
and accordingly I generally put the amount in copper into my waistcoat pocket and dispose of it during the day. I know well that I am the better for not stuffing and blowing myself out, and with the savings I make many and many a happy boy, and now and then I give a whole family a good meal with the cost of a breakfast or a dinner that would have done me mischief. I do not do this because I grudge innkeepers what they charge, for my surprise is how they can live without charging more than they do in general. It was dark by the time that we got to a village called East Woodhay. Sunday evening is the time for courting in the country. It is not convenient to carry this on before faces, and at farmhouses and cottages there are no spare apartments, so that the pairs turn out and pitch up to carry on their negotiations by the side of a stile or a gate. The evening was suspicious, it was pretty dark, the weather mild, and old Michaelmas, when yearly services end, was fast approaching, and accordingly, I do not recollect ever having before seen so many negotiations going on, within so short a distance. At West Woodhay my horse cast a shoe, and as the road was abominably flinty, we were compelled to go at a snail's pace, and I should have gone crazy with impatience, had it not been for these ambassadors and ambassadresses of Cupid, to every pair of whom I said something or other. I began by asking the fellow my road, and from the tone and manner of his answer, I could tell pretty nearly what prospect he had of success, and knew what to say to draw something from him. I had some famous sport with them, saying to them more than I should have said by daylight, and a great deal less than I should have said if my horse had been in a condition to carry me away as swiftly as he did, from Osman Ricardo's terrific cross. There, exclaims Mrs. Scripp, the stock-jobber's young wife, to her old hobbling whittle of a spouse. You see, my love, that this mischievous man could not let even these poor peasants alone. Peasants, you dirty-necked devil! And where got you that word? You, who but a few years ago came perhaps up from the country in a wagon, who made the bed you now sleep in, and who got the husband by helping him to get his wife out of the world, as some young party-coloured blade, is to get you and the old rogue's money by a similar process. We got to Berkeley about eight o'clock, after a very disagreeable day, but we found ample compensation in the house, and all within it, that we were now arrived at. Berkeley, Sunday, 8th September. It rained steadily this morning, or else, at the end of these six days of hunting for George, and two for me, we should have set off. The rain gives me time to give an account of Mr. Budd's crop of Tullian wheat. It was sown in rows and on ridges, with very wide intervals, ploughed all summer. If he reckoned that ground only which the wheat grew upon, he had one hundred and thirty bushels to the acre, and even if he reckoned the whole of the ground, he had twenty-eight bushels, all but two gallons, to the acre. But the best wheat he grew this year was dibbled in between rows of Swedish turnips in November, four rows upon a ridge, with an eighteen-inch interval between each two rows, and a five-feet interval between the outside rows on each ridge. It is the white cone that Mr. Budd sows. He had ears with a hundred and thirty grains in each. This would be the farming for labourers in their little plots. They might grow thirty bushels of wheat to the acre, and have crops of cabbages in the intervals at the same time, or of potatoes if they liked them better. Before my arrival here Mr. Budd had seen my description of the state of the labourers in Wiltshire, and had in consequence written to my son James, not knowing where I was, as follows. In order to see how the labourers are now screwed down, look at the following facts. Arthur Young, in 1771, fifty-five years ago, allowed for a man, his wife, and three children, thirteen shillings one pence a week, according to present money prices. By the Berkshire Magistrates' Table, made in 1795, the allowance was for such family, according to the present money prices, eleven shillings fourpence. Now it is, according to the same standard, eight shillings. According to your father's proposal, the sum would be, supposing there to be no malt tax, eighteen shillings a week, and little enough, too. Is not that enough to convince any one of the hellishness of this system? Yet Sir Glory applauds it. Is it not horrible to contemplate millions in this half-starving state, and is it not the duty of England's glory, who has said that his estate is a retaining fee for defending the rights of the people, is it not his duty to stay in England, and endeavour to restore the people, the millions, to what their fathers were, instead of going abroad, selling off his carriage-horses, and going abroad, there to spend some part at least of the fruits of English labour? I do not say that he has no right, generally speaking, to go and spend his money abroad. But I do say that, having got himself elected for such a city as Westminster, he had no right at a time like this to be absent from Parliament. However, what cares he? His retaining fee, indeed. He takes special care to augment that fee, but I challenge all his shoe-lickers, all the base worshippers of twenty thousand acres, to show me one single thing that he has ever done, or within the last twelve years attempted to do, for his clients. In short, this is a man that must now be brought to book. He 
he must not be suffered to insult Westminster any longer. He must turn to, or turn out. He is a sore to Westminster, a set fast on its back, a colic in its belly, a cramp in its limbs, a gag in its mouth. He is a nuisance, a monstrous nuisance in Westminster, and he must be abated. End of chapter 25《ニトリ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee.《Rural Rides》by William Cobbett.《Chapter 26 Ride from Berkeley to Lyndhurst in the New Forest. The reformers have yet many and powerful foes. We have to contend against a host, such as never existed before in the world. Nine-tenths of the press, all the channels of speedy communication of sentiment, all the pulpits, all the associations of rich people, all the taxing people, all the military and naval establishments, all the yeomanry cavalry tribes. Your allies are endless in number and mighty in influence. But we have one ally worth the whole of them put together, namely, the debt. This is an ally whom no honours or rewards can seduce from us. She is a steady, unrelaxing, persevering, incorruptible ally, an ally that is proof against all blandishments, all intrigues, all temptations, and all open attacks. She sets at defiance all military, all yeomanry cavalry. They may as well fire at a ghost. She cares no more for the sabres of the yeomanry or the life guards than Milton's angels did for the swords of Satan's myrmidons. This ally cares not a straw about spies and informers. She laughs at the employment of secret service money. She is always erect day and night, and is always firmly moving on in our cause, in spite of all the terrors of jails, dungeons, halters, and axes. Therefore, Mr. Jabbot, be not so pert. The combat is not so unequal as you seem to imagine, and, confident and insolent as you now are, the day of your humiliation may not be far distant." Letter to Mr. Jabbot of Birmingham, Register, Volume 31, page 477, November 1816. Hurstbourne Tarrant, commonly called Up Husband, Wednesday, 11th October, 1826. When quarters are good, you are apt to lurk in them, but really it was so wet that we could not get away from Berkeley till Monday evening. Being here, there were many reasons for our going to the great fair at Wayhill, which began yesterday and indeed the day before, at Appleshaw. These two days are allotted for the selling of sheep only, though the horse-fair begins on the tenth. To Appleshaw they bring nothing but those fine curled-horned and long-tailed ewes, which bring the house-lambs and the early Easter lambs, and these which to my taste are the finest and most beautiful animals of the sheep-kind, come exclusively out of Dorsetshire, and out of the part of Somersetshire bordering on that county. To Wayhill, which is a village of half a dozen houses on a down, just above Appleshaw, they bring from the down farms in Wiltshire and Hampshire, where they are bred, the South Down sheep, used to go away into the pasture and turnip countries to have lambs, where there is to be fatted and killed, and lambs nine months old to be kept to be sheep. At both fairs there is supposed to be about two hundred thousand sheep. It was of some consequence to ascertain how the price of these had been affected by late panic which ended the respite of 1822, or by the plethora of money, as Lone Man Baring called it. I can assure this political doctor that there was no such plethora at Wayhill yesterday, where, while I viewed the long faces of the farmers, while I saw consciousness of ruin painted on their countenances, I could not help saying to myself, the lone mongers think they are cunning, but, by God, they will never escape the ultimate consequences of this horrible ruin. The prices, take them on a fair average, were at both fairs, just about one half what they were last year. So that my friend Mr. Thwaites of the Herald, who had a lying Irish reporter at Preston, was rather hasty about three months ago, when he told his well-informed readers that those politicians were deceived who had supposed that prices of farm produce would fall in consequence of late panic and the subsequent measures. There were Dorsetshire ewes that sold last year for fifty shillings a head. We could hear of none this year that exceeded twenty-five shillings, and only think of twenty-five shillings for
for one of these fine large ewes nearly fit to kill and having two lambs in her ready to be brought forth in on an average six weeks time the average is three lambs to two of these ewes in eighteen twelve these ewes were from fifty five shillings to seventy two shillings each at this same appleshaw fair and in that year i bought southdown ewes at forty five shillings each just such as were yesterday sold for eighteen shillings yet the sheep and grass and all things are the same in real value what a false what a deceptious what an infamous thing this paper-money system is however it is a pleasure it is real it is great delight it is boundless joy to me to contemplate this infernal system in its hour of wreck swag here crack there scroop this way souse that way and such a rattling and such a squalling and the parsons and their wives looking so frightened beginning apparently to think that the day of judgment is at hand i wonder what master parson at sharncut whose church can contain eight persons a master parson of drake at foliot who is for want of a church inducted under a tent or temporary booth i wonder what they think of southdown lambs nine months old selling for six or seven shillings each i wonder what the bearings and the ricardos think of it i wonder what those master parsons think of it who are half pay naval or military officers as well as master parsons of the church made by law i wonder what the gaffer gooches with their parsonships and military officers think of it i wonder what daddy coke and suffield think of it and when i wonder do they mean to get into their holes and barns again to cry aloud against the roguery of reducing the interest of the debt when i wonder do these manly these modest these fair these candid these open and above all things these sensible fellows intend to assemble again and to call all the house of quidnam and the house of kilmenham or kinsalem or whatever it is for i really have forgotten to call i say all these about them in the holes and the barns and then and there again make a formal and solemn protest against cobbett and against his roguish proposition for reducing the interest of the debt and now i have these fellows on the hip and brave sport will i have with them before i have done mr blunt at whose house seven miles from weyhill i am went with me to the fair and we took particular pains to ascertain the prices we saw and spoke to mr john herbert of stoke near uphusband who was asking twenty shillings and who did not expect to get it for southdown ewes just such as he sold last year at this fair for thirty-six shillings mr jolliffe of crux easton was asking sixteen shillings for just such ewes as he sold last year at this fair for thirty-two shillings farmer holdway had sold for less than half his last year's price a farmer that i did not know told us that he had sold to a great sheep dealer of the name of smallpiece at the latter's own price i asked him what that own price was and he said that he was ashamed to say the horse fair appeared to have no business at all going on for indeed how were people to purchase horses who had only got half price for their sheep the sales of sheep at this one fair including appleshaw must have amounted this year to a hundred and twenty or thirty thousand pounds less than last year stick up in there master prosperity robinson and turn back to it again anon then came the horses not equal in amount to the sheep but of great amount then comes the cheese a very great article and it will have a falling off if you take quantity into view in a still greater proportion the hops being a monstrous crop their price is nothing to judge by but all is fallen even corn though in many parts all but the wheat and rye have totally failed is taking a quarter of each of the six sorts wheat rye barley oats peas and bean eleven shillings ninepence cheaper upon the whole that is to say eleven shillings ninepence upon two hundred and fifty eight shillings and if the late panic had not come it must and it would have been and according to the small bulk of the crop it ought to have been a hundred and fifty shillings dearer instead of eleven shillings ninepence cheaper yet it is too dear and far too dear for the working people to eat the masses the assembled masses must starve if the price of bread be not reduced that is to say in scotland and ireland for in england i hope that the people will demand and insist to use the language of the bill of rights on a just and suitable provision agreeably to the law and if they do not get it i trust that law and justice will in due course be done and strictly done upon those who refuse to make such provision though in time the price of corn will come down without any repeal of the corn bill and though it would have come down now if we had had a good crop or an average crop still the corn bill ought now to be repealed because people must not be starved in waiting for the next crop and the landowner's monopoly as the son of john with the bright sword calls it 
ought to be swept away, and the sooner it is done, the better for the country. I know very well that the landowners must lose their estates if such prices continue, and if the present taxes continue. I know this very well, and I like it well, for the landowners may cause the taxes to be taken off if they will. Ah, oh, wicked dog, say they. What then? You would have us lose the half-pay and the pensions and sinecures which our children and other relations, or that we ourselves are pocketing out of the taxes, which are squeezed in great part out of the labourer's skin and bone? Yes, upon my word, I would. But if you prefer losing your estates, I have no great objection, for it is hard that, in a free country, people should not have their choice of the different roads to the poor-house. Here is the rub. The vote-owners, the seat-owners, the big borough-mongers, have directly and indirectly so large a share of the loaves and fishes, that the share is, in point of clear income, equal to, and in some cases greater than, that from their estates, and though this is not the case with the small fry of jolterheads, they are so linked in with, and overawed by, the big ones, that they have all the same feeling, and that is, that to cut off half-pay, pensions, sinecures, commissionerships, such as that of Hobhouse's father, army, and the rest of the good things, would be nearly as bad as to take away the estates, which besides are, in fact, in many instances, nearly gone, at least from the present holder already, by the means of mortgage, annuity, rent-charge, settlement, jointure, or something or other. Then there are the parsons, who, with their keen noses, have smelled out long enough ago, that if any serious settlement should take place, they go to a certainty. In short, they know well how the whole nation, the interested accepted, feel towards them, they know well that were it not for their allies, it would soon be queer times with them. Here, then, is the rub. Here are the reasons why the taxes are not taken off. Some of these jolter-headed beasts were ready to cry, and I know that one did actually cry to a farmer, his tenant, in 1822. The tenant told him that Mr. Cobbett had been right about this matter. What, exclaimed he, I hope you do not read Cobbett, he will ruin you, and he would ruin us all. He would introduce anarchy, confusion, and destruction of property. Oh, no, jolter-head! There is no destruction of property. Matter, the philosophers say, is indestructible. But it is all easily transferable, as is well known to the base jolterheads and the blaspheming Jews. The former of these will, however, soon have the faint sweat upon them again. Their tenants will be ruined first. And hear what a foul robbery these landowners have committed, or at least enjoyed and pocketed the gain of. They have given their silent assent to the one-pound note abolition bill. They knew well that this must reduce the price of farm produce one half, or thereabouts, and yet they were prepared to take and to insist on, and they do take and insist on, as high rents as if that bill had never been passed. What dreadful ruin will ensue! How many, many farmers' families are now just preparing the way for their entrance into the poorhouse! How many, certainly many a score farmers did I see at Wayhill yesterday, who came there, as it were, to know their fate! and who are gone home thoroughly convinced that they shall, as farmers, never see Wayhill fair again. When such a man, his mind impressed with such conviction, returns home, and there beholds a family of children half-bred up, and in the notion that they were not to be mere working people, what must be his feelings? Why, if he have been a baller against Jacobins and Radicals, if he have approved of the power of imprisonment bill and of six acts, aye, if he did not rejoice at Castlereagh's cutting his own throat, if he have been a cruel screwer down of the labourers, reducing them to skeletons, if he have been an officious detector of what are called poachers, and have assisted in or approved of the hard punishments inflicted on them, then in either of these cases I say that his feelings, though they put the suicidal knife into his own hand, are short of what he deserves. I say this, and this I repeat with all the seriousness and solemnity with which a man can make a declaration. For had it not been for these base and selfish and unfeeling wretches, the deeds of 1817 and 1819 and 1820 would never have been attempted. These hard and dastardly dogs, armed up to the teeth, were always ready to come forth to destroy, not only to revile, to decry, to belie, to calumniate in all sorts of ways, but, if necessary, absolutely to cut the throats of those who had no object, and who could have no object, other than that of preventing a continuance in that course of measures, which have finally produced the ruin, and threatened to produce the absolute destruction, of these base, selfish, hard, and dastardly dogs themselves. Pity them! Let them go for pity to those whom they have applauded and abetted. The farmers, I mean the renters, will not now, as they did in 1819, stand a good long emptying out. They had, in 1822, lost nearly all. The present stock of the farms is not, in one half of the cases, the property of the farmer. It is borrowed stock, 
and the sweeping out will be very rapid. The notion that the ministers will do something is clung on to by all those who are deeply in debt, and all who have leases or other engagements for time. These believe, because they anxiously wish, that the paper money, by means of some sort or other, will be put out again, while the ministers believe, because they anxiously wish, that the thing can go on, that they can continue to pay the interest of the debt, and meet all the rest of their spendings, without one-pound notes, and without bank restriction. Both parties will be deceived, and in the midst of the strife, that the dissipation of the delusion will infallibly lead to, the whole thing is very likely to go to pieces. And that too, mind, tumbling into the hands and placed at the mercy of a people, the millions of whom have been fed upon less to four persons, than what goes down the throat of one single common soldier. Please to mind that, Monsieur, the admirers of select vestries. You have not done it, Messrs. Sturgers, Byrne, and the Hampshire Parsons. You thought you had. You meaned well. But it was a coup manqué, a missing of the mark, and that too, as is frequently the case, by overshooting it. The attempt will, however, produce its just consequences in the end, and those consequences will be of vast importance. From Wayhill I was shown yesterday the wood, in which took place the battle in which was concerned poor Turner, one of the young men who was hanged at Winchester in the year 1822. There was another young man named Smith who was, on account of another game battle, hanged on the same gallows. And this for the preservation of the game, you will observe, this for the preservation of the sports of that aristocracy, for whose sake, and solely for whose sake, Sir James Graham of Netherby, descendant of the Earls of Monteith, and of the seventh Earl of Galloway, K.T., being sure not to omit the K.T., this hanging of us is for the preservation of the sports of that aristocracy, for the sake of whom this Graham, this barefaced plagiarist, this bungling and yet impudent pamphleteer, would sacrifice, would reduce to beggary, according to his pamphlet, three hundred thousand families making doubtless two millions of persons in the middle rank of life it is for the preservation for upholding what he insolently calls the dignity of this sporting aristocracy that he proposes to rob all mortgagees all who have claims upon land the feudal lords in france had as mr young tells us a right when they came in fatigued from hunting or shooting to cause the belly of one of their vassals to be ripped up in order for the lord to soak his feet in the bowels Sir James Graham of the Bright Sword does not propose to carry us back so far as this. He is willing to stop at taking away the money and the victuals of a very large part of the community, and monstrous as it may seem, I will venture to say, that there are scores of the Lord Charles tribe who think him moderate to a fault. But, to return to the above-mentioned hanging at Winchester, a thing never to be forgotten by me, James Turner, aged twenty-eight years, was accused of assisting to kill Robert Baker, a gamekeeper, to Thomas Ashton Smith, Esquire, in the parish of South Tidworth, and Charles Smith, aged twenty-seven years, was accused of shooting at, not killing, Robert Snellgrove, assistant gamekeeper to Lord Palmerston, secretary at war, at Broadlands, in the parish of Romsey. Poor Charles Smith had better have been hunting after shares than after hares. Mines, however deep, he would have found less perilous than the pleasure-grounds of Lord Palmerston, I deem this hanging at Winchester worthy of general attention, and particularly at this time, when the aristocracy near Andover, and one at least of the members for that town, of whom this very Thomas Ashton Smith was until lately one, was, if the report in the morning chronicle, copied into the register of the seventh instant, be correct, endeavouring at the late meeting at Andover, to persuade people that they, these aristocrats, wish to keep up the price of corn for the sake of the labourers, whom Sir John Pollen, Thomas Ashton Smith's son's present colleague, as member for Andover, called poor devils, and who he said had hardly a rag to cover them. Oh! wish to keep up the price of corn for the good of the poor devils of labourers who have hardly a rag to cover them? Amiable feeling, tender-hearted souls, cared not a straw about rents, did not, oh no, did not care even about the farmers. It was only for the sake of the poor, naked devils of labourers that the colleague of young Thomas Ashton Smith cared. It was only for those who in the same rank of life as James Turner and Charles Smith were that these kind Andover aristocrats cared. This was the only reason in the world for their wanting corn to sell at a high price. We often say that beats everything, but really I think that these professions of the Andover aristocrats do beat everything. Ah, but, Sir John Pollen, these professions come too late in the day. The people are no longer to be deceived by such stupid attempts at disguising hypocrisy. 
However, the attempt shall do this. It shall make me repeat here that which I published on the Winchester hanging, in the register of the 6th of April, 1822. It made part of a letter to landlords. Many boys have, since this article was published, grown up to the age of thought. Let them now read it, and I hope that they will remember it well. I, last fall, addressed ten letters to you on the subject of the agricultural report. My object was to convince you that you would be ruined, and, when I think of your general conduct towards the rest of the nation, and especially towards the labourers, I must say that I have great pleasure in seeing that my opinions are in a fair way of being verified to the full extent. I dislike the Jews, but the Jews are not so inimical to the industrious classes of the country as you are. We should do a great deal better with the squires from Change Alley, who at any rate have nothing of the ferocious and bloody in their characters, and grafted upon your native want of feeling is the sort of military spirit of command that you have acquired during the late war. You appeared at the close of that war to think that you had made a conquest of the rest of the nation for ever, and, if it had not been for the burdens which the war left behind it, there would have been no such thing as air in England for any one but a slave to breathe. The Bay of Tunis never talked to his subjects in language more insolent than you talked to the people of England. The debt, the blessed debt, stood our friend, made you soften your tone, and will finally place you where you ought to be placed. This is the last letter that I shall ever take the trouble to address to you. In a short time you will become much too insignificant to merit any particular notice, but just in the way of farewell, and that there may be something on record to show what care has been taken of the partridges, pheasants, and hares, while the estates themselves have been suffered to slide away. I have resolved to address this one more letter to you, which resolution has been occasioned by the recent putting to death at Winchester of two men denominated poachers. This is a thing which, whatever you may think of it, has not been passed over, and is not to be passed over, without full notice and ample record. The account of the matter, as it appeared in the public prints, was very short, but the fact is such as never ought to be forgotten, and while you are complaining of your distress, I will endeavour to lay before the public that which will show that the law has not been unmindful of even your sports. The time is approaching when the people will have an opportunity of exercising their judgment as to what are called game laws, when they will look back a little at what has been done for the sake of ensuring sport to landlords. In short, landlords as well as labourers will pass under review but i must proceed to my subject reserving reflections for a subsequent part of my letter the account to which i have alluded is this hampshire the lent assizes for this county concluded on saturday morning the criminal calendar contained fifty-eight prisoners for trial sixteen of whom have been sentenced to suffer death but two only of that number poachers were left by the judges for execution viz james turner aged twenty-eight for aiding and assisting in killing Robert Baker, gamekeeper to Thomas Ashton Smith, Esquire, in the parish of South Tidworth, and Charles Smith, aged twenty-seven, for having wilfully and maliciously shot at Robert Snellgrove, assistant gamekeeper to Lord Palmerston, at Broadlands, in the parish of Romsey, with intent to do him grievous bodily harm. The judge, Borough, observed, it became necessary to these cases, that the extreme sentence of the law should be inflicted, to deter others, as resistance to gamekeepers was now arrived at an alarming height, and many lives had been lost. The first thing to observe here is that there were sixteen persons sentenced to suffer death, and that the only persons actually put to death were those who had been endeavouring to get at the hares, pheasants, or partridges of Thomas Ashton Smith, and of our Secretary to War, Lord Palmerston. Whether the Judge Borough, who was long chairman of the quarter sessions in Hampshire, uttered the words ascribed to him or not, I cannot say, but the words have gone forth in print and the impression they are calculated to make is this, that it was necessary to put these two men to death in order to deter others from resisting gamekeepers. The putting of these men to death has excited a very deep feeling throughout the county of Hans, a feeling very honourable to the people of that county, and very natural to the breast of every human being. In this case there appears to have been a killing in which Turner assisted, and Turner might by possibility have given the fatal blow, but in the case of Smith there was no killing at all, there was a mere shooting at, with intention to do him bodily harm. This latter offence was not a crime for which men were put to death, even when there was no assault, or attempt at assault, on the part of the person shot at. This was not a crime punished with death, until that terrible act brought in by the late Lord Ellenborough was passed, and formed a part of our matchless code, that code which there is such a talk about softening, but which softening does not appear to have in view this act, or any portion of the game laws. 
in order to form a just opinion with regard to the offence of these two men that had been hanged at Winchester, we must first consider the motives by which they were actuated in committing the acts of violence laid to their charge, for it is the intention, and not the mere act, that constitutes the crime. To make an act murder there must be malice aforethought. The question therefore is, did these men attack, or were they the attacked? It seems to be clear that they were the attacked parties, for they are executed according to this publication to deter others from resisting gamekeepers. I know very well that there is law for this, but what I shall endeavour to show is that the law ought to be altered, that the people of Hampshire ought to petition for such alteration, and that if you, the landlords, were wise, you would petition also for an alteration, if not a total annihilation of that terrible code called the game laws, which has been growing harder and harder all the time that it ought to have been wearing away. It should never be forgotten that, in order to make punishment sufficient in the way of example, they must be thought just by the community at large, and they will never be thought just if they aim at the protection of things belonging to one particular class of the community, and especially if those very things be grudged to this class by the community in general. When punishments of this sort take place, they are looked upon as unnecessary, the sufferers are objects of pity, the common feeling of the community is in their favour, instead of being against them, and it is those who cause the punishment, and not those who suffer it, who become objects of abhorrence. Upon seeing two of our countrymen hanging upon a gallows, we naturally and instantly run back to the cause. First we find the fighting with gamekeepers. Next we find that the men would have been transported if caught in or near a cover with guns after dark. Next we find that these trespassers are exposed to transportation because they are in pursuit, or supposed to be in pursuit, of partridges, pheasants, or hares. And then we ask, where is the foundation of a law to punish a man with transportation for being in pursuit of these animals? And where, indeed, is the foundation of the law to take from any man, be he who he may, the right of catching and using these animals? We know very well, we are instructed by mere feeling, that we have a right to live, to see, and to move. Common sense tells us that there are some things which no man can reasonably call his property, and though poachers, as they are called, do not read Blackstone's commentaries, they know that such animals, as are of a wild and untamable disposition, any man may seize upon and keep for his own use and pleasure. All these things, so long as they remain in possession, every man has a right to enjoy without disturbance, but if once they escape from his custody, or he voluntarily abandons the use of them, they return to the common stock, and any man else has an equal right to seize and enjoy them afterwards. Book 2, Chapter 1 In the second book and twenty-sixth chapter of Blackstone, the poacher might read as follows. With regard likewise to wild animals, all mankind had by the original grant of the Creator a right to pursue and take away any fowl or insect of the air, any fish or inhabitant of the waters, and any beast or reptile of the field. And this natural right still continues in every individual, unless where it is restrained by the civil laws of the country. And when a man has once so seized them, they become, while living, his qualified property, or, if dead, are absolutely his own. So that to steal them, or otherwise invade this property, is, according to the respective values, sometimes a criminal offence, sometimes only a civil injury." Poachers do not read this, but that reason, which is common to all mankind, tells them that this is true, and tells them also what to think of any positive law that is made to restrain them from this right granted by the Creator. Before I proceed further in commenting upon the case immediately before me, let me once more quote this English judge who wrote fifty years ago, when the game code was mild indeed, compared to the one of the present day. Another violent alteration, says he, of the English constitution, consisted in the depopulation of whole countries, for the purposes of the king's royal diversion, and subjecting both them and all the ancient forests of the kingdom to the unreasonable severities of forest laws imported from the continent, whereby the slaughter of a beast was made almost as penal as the death of a man. In the Saxon times, though no man was allowed to kill or chase the king's deer, yet he might start any game, pursue and kill it upon his own estate, but the rigour of these new constitutions vested the sole property of all the game in England in the king alone, and no man was entitled to disturb any fowl of the air, or any beast of the field, of such kinds as were specially reserved for the royal amusement of the sovereign, without express licence from the king, by a grant of a chase or free warren, and those franchises were granted as much with a view to preserve the breed of animals, as to indulge the subject. From a similar principle to which, though the forest laws are now mitigated, and by degrees grown entirely obsolete, yet from this root has sprung up a bastard slip, known by the name of the game-law, now arrived to and wantoning in its highest vigour. 
both founded upon the same unreasonable notions of permanent property in wild creatures, and both productive of the same tyranny to the commons, but with this difference, that the forest laws established only one mighty hunter throughout the land, the game laws have raised a little nimrod in every manner. Book 4, Chapter 33 When this was written, nothing was known of the present severity of the law. Judge Blackston says that the game law was then wantoning in its highest vigour. What then would he have said if any one had proposed to make it felony to resist a gamekeeper? He calls it tyranny to the commons, as it existed in his time. What would he have said of the present code, which, so far from being a thought a thing to be softened, is never so much as mentioned by those humane and gentle creatures, who are absolutely supporting a sort of reputation, and aiming at distinction in society, in consequence of their incessant talk about softening the criminal code? The law may say what it will, but the feelings of mankind will never be in favour of this code, and whenever it produces putting to death it will necessarily excite horror. It is impossible to make men believe that any particular set of individuals should have a permanent property in wild creatures. That the owner of land should have acquired possession of it is reasonable and right and necessary. It is also necessary that he should have the power of inflicting pecuniary punishment in a moderate degree upon such as trespass on his lands. But his right can go no further according to reason. If the law give him ample compensation for every damage that he sustains, in consequence of a trespass on his lands, what right has he to complain? The law authorises the king, in case of invasion or apprehended invasion, to call upon all his people to take up arms in defence of the country. The militia law compels every man, in his turn, to become a soldier. And upon what ground is this? There must be some reason for it, or else the law would be tyranny. The reason is that every man has rights in the country to which he belongs, and that therefore it is his duty to defend the country. Some rights, too, beyond that of merely living, merely that of breathing in the air. And then I should be glad to know what rights an Englishman has, if the pursuit of even wild animals is to be the ground of transporting him from his country. There is a sufficient punishment provided by the law of trespass, quite sufficient means to keep men off your land altogether. How can it be necessary, then, to have a law to transport them for coming upon your land? No, it is not for coming upon the land. It is for coming after the wild animals, which nature and reason tells them are as much theirs as they are yours. It is impossible for the people not to contrast the treatment of these two men at Winchester with the treatment of some gamekeepers that have killed or maimed the persons they call poachers, and it is equally impossible for the people, when they see these two men hanging on a gallows, after being recommended to mercy, not to remember the almost instant pardon given to the excise man, who was not recommended to mercy, and who was found guilty of wilful murder in the county of Sussex. It is said, and I believe truly, that there are more persons imprisoned in England for offences against the game laws than there are persons imprisoned in France, with more than twice the population, for all sorts of offences put together. When there was a loud outcry against the cruelties committed on the priests and the seigneurs by the people of France, Arthur Young bade them remember the cruelties committed on the people by the game laws, and to bear in mind how many had been made galley-slaves for having killed or tried to kill partridges, pheasants, and hares. However, I am aware that it is quite useless to address observations of this sort to you. I am quite aware of that, and yet there are circumstances in your present situation which, one would think, ought to make you not very gay upon the hanging of the two men at Winchester. It delights me, I assure you, to see the situation that you are in, and I shall therefore now once more, and for the last time, address you upon that subject. We all remember how haughty, how insolent you have been. We all bear in mind your conduct for the last thirty-five years, and the feeling of pleasure at your present state is as general as it is just. In my ten letters to you I told you that you would lose your estates. Those of you who have any capacity, except that which is necessary to enable you to kill wild animals, see this now, as clearly as I do, and yet you evince no intention to change your courses. You hang on with unrelenting grasp and cry, pauper and poacher and radical and lower orders, with as much insolence as ever. It is always thus. Men like you may be convinced of error, but they never change their conduct. They never become just because they are convinced that they have been unjust. They must have a great deal more than that conviction to make them just. Such was what I then addressed to the landlords. How well it fits the present time. They are just in the same sort of mess now that they were in 1822. But there is this most important difference, that the paper money cannot now be put out, in a quantity sufficient to save them, 
without producing not only a late panic, worse than the last, but in all probability a total blowing up of the whole system, game laws, new trespass laws, treadmill, Sunday tolls, six acts, sunset and sunrise laws, apple felony laws, select vestry laws, and all the whole thing, root and trunk and branch, aye, not sparing, perhaps, even the tent or booth of induction at Draycott Folio. Good Lord! How should we be able to live without game laws, and treadmills, then, and Sunday tolls? How should we get on without pensions, sinecures, tithes, and the other glorious institutions of this mighty empire? Let us turn, however, from the thought. But bearing this in mind, if you please, messieurs the game people, that if, no matter in what shape and under what pretence, if I tell you paper be put out again, sufficient to raise the price of a south down you to the last year's mark, the whole system goes to atoms. I tell you that, mind it, and look sharp about you, O oh, ye fat parsons, for tithes and half-pay will be you assured never from that day again go in company into parson's pocket. In this north of Hampshire, as everywhere else, the churches and all other things exhibit indubitable marks of decay. There are along under the north side of that chain of hills, which divide Hampshire from Berkshire in this part, taking into Hampshire about two or three miles wide of the low ground along under the chain, eleven churches along in a string in about fifteen miles, the chancels of which would contain a great many more than all the inhabitants, men, women, and children, sitting at their ease with plenty of room. How should this be otherwise when, in the parish of Berkeley, one single farmer holds by lease under Lord Carnarvon, as one farm, the lands that men now living can remember to have formed fourteen farms springing up in a respectable way, fourteen families. In some instances these small farmhouses and homesteads are completely gone. In others the buildings remain, but in a tumble-down state. In others the house is gone, leaving the barn for use as a barn or as a cattle-shed. In others the outbuildings are gone, and the house with rotten thatch, broken windows, rotten door-sills, and all threatening to fall, remains as the dwelling of a half-starved and ragged family of labourers, the grandchildren, perhaps, of the decent family of small farmers that formerly lived happily in this very house. This, with few exceptions, is the case all over England, and if we duly consider the nature and tendency of the hellish system of taxing, of funding, and of paper money, it must do so. Then, in this very parish of Berkeley, there was, until a few months ago, a famous cock-parson, the Honourable and Reverend George Herbert, who had grafted the parson upon the soldier and the justice upon the parson, for he died a little while ago, a half-pay officer in the army, rector of two parishes, and chairman of the quarter sessions of the county of Hants. Mr. Hohen gave us, in his memorable house that Jack built, a portrait of the clerical magistrate. Could not he, or somebody else, give us a portrait of the military and of the naval parson? For such are to be found all over the kingdom. Wherever I go, I hear of them. And yet there sits Burdett, and even Sir Bobby of the Borough, and say not a word upon the subject. This is the case. The king dismissed Sir Bobby from the half-pay list, scratched his name out, turned him off, stopped his pay. Sir Bobby complained, alleging that the half-pay was a reward for past services. No, no, said the ministers, it is a retaining fee for future services. Now the law is, and the Parliament declared, in the case of Parson Horn Took, that once a parson, always a parson, and that a parson cannot, of course, again serve as an officer under the crown. Yet these military and naval parsons have a retaining fee for future military and naval services. Never was so barefaced a thing before heard of in the world. And yet there sits Sir Bobby, stripped of his retaining fee, and says not a word about the matter. And there sit the big wigs, who gave Sir Bobby the subscription, having sons, brothers, and other relations, military and naval parsons. And the big wigs, of course, bid Sir Bobby, albeit given enough to twaddle, hold his tongue upon the subject. And there sit Mr. Weatherspoon, I think it is, and the rest of Sir Bobby's rump, toasting the independence of the borough and its member. That's our case, as the lawyers say. Match it if you can, devil, in all your roamings up and down throughout the earth. I have often been thinking, and indeed expecting, to see Sir Bobby turn parson himself, as the likeliest way to get back his half-pay. If he should have a call, I do hope we shall have him for parson at Kensington, and as an inducement I promise him that I will give him a good thumping Easter offering. In former rides, and especially in 1821 and 1822, I describe very fully this part of Hampshire. The land is a chalk bottom, with a bed of reddish, stiff loam, full of flints at top. In those parts where the bed of loam and flints is deep, the land is arable or woods. Where the bed of loam and flints is so shallow as to let the plough down to the chalk, 
the surface is downs. In the deep and long valleys, where there is constantly or occasionally a stream of water, the topsoil is blackish and the surface meadows. This has been the distribution from all antiquity, except that in ancient times part of that which is now downs and woods was cornland, as we know from the marks of the plough. And yet the Scotch fellows would persuade us that there were scarcely any inhabitants in England before it had the unspeakable happiness to be united to that fertile, warm, and hospitable country, where the people are so well off that they are above having poor rates. The tops of the hills here are as good cornland as any other part, and it is all excellent cornland, and the fields and woods singularly beautiful. Never was there what may be called a more hilly country, and all in use. Coming from Berkeley, you come up nearly a mile of steep hill, from the top of which you can see all over the country, even to the Isle of Wight. To your right a great part of Wiltshire, into Surrey on your left, and turning round you see, lying below you, the whole of Berkshire, great part of Oxfordshire, and part of Gloucestershire. This chain of lofty hills was a great favourite with kings and rulers in ancient times. At Highclere, at Coombe, and at other places, there are remains of great encampments or fortifications, and Kingsclere was a residence of the Saxon kings, and continued to be a royal residence long after the Norman kings came. King John, when residing at Kingsclere, founded one of the charities which still exists in the town of Newbury, which is but a few miles from Kingsclere. From the top of this lofty chain you come to Uphusband, or the Upper Hurstbourne, over two miles or more of ground, descending in the way that the body of a snake descends, when he is going fast, from the high part near the head, down to the tail, that is to say, over a series of hill and dell, but the dell part going constantly on increasing upon the hilly part, till you come down to this village and then you, continuing on southward towards Andover, go up directly half a mile of hill so steep as to make it very difficult for an ordinary team with a load to take that load up it. So this Uphurstbourne, called so because higher up the valley than the other Hurstbournes, the flat part of the road to which, from the north, comes in between two side hills, is in as narrow and deep a dell as any place that I ever saw. The houses of the village are in great part scattered about, and are amongst very lofty and fine trees and from many, many points round about, from the hilly fields, now covered with the young wheat, or with scarcely less beautiful same foin, the village is a sight worth going many miles to see. The lands, too, are pretty beyond description. These chains of hills make below them an endless number of lower hills, of varying shapes and sizes and aspects, and of relative state as to each other, while the surface presents in the size and form of the fields, in the woods, the hedgerows, the same foin, the young wheat, the turnips, the tares, the fallows, the sheepfolds and the flocks, and at every turn of your head a fresh and different set of these. The surface altogether presents that which I, at any rate, could look at with pleasure for ever. Not a sort of country that I like so well as when there are downs, and a broader valley and more of meadow, but a sort of country that I like next to that. For here, as there, there are no ditches, no water furrows, no dirt, and never any drought to cause inconvenience. The chalk is at bottom, and it takes care of all. The crops of wheat have been very good here this year, and those of barley not very bad. The same foin has given a fine crop of the finest sort of hay in the world, and this year without a drop of wet. I wish that, in speaking of this pretty village, which I always return to with additional pleasure, I could give a good account of the state of those without whose labour there would be neither corn, nor same foin, nor sheep. I regret to say that my account of this matter, if I give it truly, must be a dismal account indeed." for I have in no part of England seen the labouring people so badly off as they are here. This has made so much impression on me that I shall enter fully into the matter, with names, dates, and all the particulars, in the fourth number of The Poor Man's Friend. This is one of the great purposes for which I take these rides. I am persuaded that, before the day shall come, when my labours must cease, I shall have mended the meals of millions. I may overrate the effects of my endeavours, but this being my persuasion, I should be guilty of a great neglect of duty, were I not to use those endeavours. Andover, Sunday, 15th October. I went to Wayhill yesterday, to see the close of the hop and of the cheese fair, for, after the sheep, these are the principal articles. The crop of hops has been in parts where they are grown, unusually large, and of super-excellent quality. The average price of the Farnham hops has been, as nearly as I can ascertain, seven pounds for a hundredweight, that of Kentish hops, five pounds, and that of the Hampshire and Surrey hops, other than those of Farnham, about five pounds also. The prices are, considering the great weight of the crop, very good. But if it had not been for the effects of late panic, proceeding, as Baring said, from a plethora of money, 
these prices would have been a full third, if not nearly one half higher. For though the crop has been so large and so good, there was hardly any stock on hand, the country was almost wholly without hops. As to cheese, the price, considering the quantity, has been not one half so high as it was last year. The fall in the positive price has been about twenty per cent, and the quantity made in 1826 has not been above two-thirds as great as that made in 1825, so that here is a fall of one half in real relative price, that is to say the farmer, while he has the same rent to pay that he paid last year, has only half as much money to receive for cheese as he received for cheese last year, and observe on some farms cheese is almost the only saleable produce. After the fair was over yesterday, I came down from the hill three miles to this town of Andover, which has within the last twenty days been more talked of in other parts of the kingdom than it ever was before from the creation of the world to the beginning of those twenty days. The Thomas Ashton Smiths and the Sir John Pollens, famous as they have been under the banners of the old navy purser, George Rose, and his successors, have never, even since the death of poor Turner, been half so famous, they and this corporation whom they represent, as they have been since the meeting which they held here, which ended in their defeat and confusion, pointing them out as worthy of that appellation of poor devils, which Pollen thought proper to give to those labourers without whose toil his estate would not be worth a single farthing. Having laid my plan to sleep at Andover last night, I went with two Farnham friends, Messrs. Knowles and West, to dine at the ordinary at the George Inn, which is kept by one Sutton, a rich old fellow, who wore a round-skirted sleeved fustian waistcoat, with a dirty white apron tied round his middle, and with no coat on. Having a look the eagerest, and the sharpest that I ever saw in any set of features in my whole lifetime, having an air of authority and of mastership which, to a stranger as I was, seemed quite incompatible with the meanness of his dress and the vulgarity of his manners, and there being visible to every beholder, constantly going on in him a pretty even contest between the servility of avarice and the insolence of wealth. A great part of the farmers and other fair people having gone off home, we found preparations made for dining only about ten people, but after we sat down and it was seen that we designed to dine, guests came in apace, the preparations were augmented, and as many as could dine came and dined with us. After the dinner was over, the room became fuller and fuller. Guests came in from the other inns where they had been dining, till at last the room became as full as possible in every part, the door being opened, the doorway blocked up, and the stairs leading to the room crammed from bottom to top. In this state of things Mr. Knowles, who was our chairman, gave my health, which, of course, was followed by a speech. And as the reader will readily suppose, to have an opportunity of making a speech was the main motive for my going to dine at an inn at any hour, and especially at seven o'clock at night. In this speech I, after descanting on the present devastating ruin, and on those successive acts of the ministers and the Parliament, by which such ruin had been produced, after remarking on the shuffling, the tricks, the contrivances from 1797 up to last March, I proceeded to offer to the company my reasons for believing that no attempt would be made to relieve the farmers and others by putting out the paper money again, as in 1822, or by a bank restriction. Just as I was stating these my reasons, on a prospective matter of such deep interest to my hearers, amongst whom were landowners, land renters, cattle and sheep dealers, hop and cheese producers and merchants, and even one, two or more country bankers, just as I was engaged in stating my reasons for my opinion, on a matter of such vital importance to the parties present, who were all listening to me with the greatest attention, just at this time a noise was heard, and a sort of row was taking place in the passage, the cause of which was, upon inquiry, found to be no less a personage than our landlord, our host Sutton, who it appeared, finding that my speech-making had cut off, or at least suspended all intercourse between the dining, now become a drinking-room, and the bar, who, finding that I had been the cause of a great restriction in the exchange of our money for his neat, genuine commodities downstairs, and being apparently an ardent admirer of the liberal system of free trade, who, finding in short, or rather supposing that, if my tongue were not stopped from running, his taps would be, had, though an old man fought, or at least forced his way up the throng stairs, and through the passage and doorway into the room, and was, with what breath the struggle had left him, beginning to bawl out to me, when some one called to him and told him that he was causing an interruption, to which he answered that that was what he had come to do. And then he went on to say, in so many words, that my speech injured his sale of liquor. The disgust and abhorrence which such conduct could not fail to excite produced at first a desire to quit the room and the house, and even a proposition to that effect. But after a minute or so, to reflect, the company resolved not to quit the room, but to turn him out of it, who had caused the interruption. And the old fellow, finding himself tackled, 
save the labour of shoving or kicking him out of the room, by retreating out of the doorway with all the activity of which he was master. After this I proceeded with my speech-making, and this being ended, the great business of the evening, namely drinking, smoking, and singing, was about to be proceeded in by a company, who had just closed an arduous and anxious week, who had before them a Sunday morning to sleep in, and whose wives were, for the far greater part, at a convenient distance. An assemblage of circumstances more auspicious to free trade in the neat and genuine has seldom occurred. But now, behold, the old fustian-jacketed fellow, whose head was, I think, powdered, took it into that head not only to lay restrictions upon trade, but to impose an absolute embargo, cut off entirely all supplies whatever from his bar to the room, as long as I remained in that room. A message to this effect from the old fustian man having been, through the waiter, communicated to Mr. Knowles, and he having communicated it to the company, I addressed the company in nearly these words. Gentlemen, born and bred, as you know I was, on the borders of this county, and fond as I am of bacon, Hampshire hogs have with me always been objects of admiration rather than of contempt. But that which has just happened here induces me to observe that this feeling of mine has been confined to hogs of four legs. For my part I like your company too well to quit it. I have paid this fellow six shillings for the wing of a fowl, a bit of bread, and a pint of small beer. I have a right to sit here. I want no drink. And those who do, being refused it here, have a right to send to other houses for it, and to drink it here. However, Mammon soon got the upper hand downstairs, all the fondness for free trade returned, and up came the old fustian jacketed fellow, bringing pipes, tobacco, wine, grog, sling, and seeming to be as pleased as if he had just sprung a mine of gold. Nay, he, soon after this, came into the room with two gentlemen, who had come to him to ask where I was. He actually came up to me, making me a bow, and telling me that those gentlemen wished to be introduced to me. He, with a fawning look, laid his hand upon my knee. "'Take away your paw,' said I, and shaking the gentleman by the hand, I said, "'I am happy to see you, gentlemen, even though introduced by this fellow.' Things now proceeded without interruption. Songs, toasts, and speeches filled up the time, until half-past two o'clock this morning, though in the house of a landlord who receives the sacrament, but who from his manifestly ardent attachment to the liberal principles of free trade would, I have no doubt, have suffered us, if we could have found money and throats and stomachs, to sit and sing and talk and drink until two o'clock of a Sunday afternoon, instead of two o'clock of a Sunday morning. It was not politics, it was not personal dislike to me, for the fellow knew nothing of me. It was, as I told the company, just this. He looked upon their bodies as so many gutters to drain off the contents of his taps, and upon their purses as so many small heaps, from which to take the means of augmenting his great one. And finding that I had been, no matter how, the cause of suspending this work of reciprocity, he wanted, and no matter how, to restore the reciprocal system to motion. All that I have to add is this, that the next time this old sharp-looking fellow gets six shillings from me for a dinner, he shall, if he choose, cook me, in any manner that he likes, and season me with hand so unsparing as to produce in the feeders thirst unquenchable. Tomorrow morning we set off for the new forest, and indeed we have lounged about here long enough. But as some apology I have to state that, while I have been in a sort of waiting upon this great fair, where one hears, sees, and learns so much, I have been writing number four of The Poor Man's Friend, which Price Tuppence is published once a month. I see in the London newspapers accounts of dispatches from Canning, I thought that he went solely on a party of pleasure. So the dispatchers come to tell the king how the pleasure party gets on. No, what he has gone to Paris for is to endeavour to prevent the holy allies from doing anything which shall sink the English government in the eyes of the world, and thereby favour the radicals, who are enemies of all regular government, and whose success in England would revive republicanism in France. This is my opinion. The subject, if I be right in my opinion, was too ticklish to be committed to paper, Granville Levison Gower, for that is the man that is now Lord Granville, was perhaps not thought quite a match for the French as a talker, and therefore the captain of Eton, who in 1817 said that the ever-living luminary of British prosperity was only hidden behind a cloud, and who in 1819 said that Peel's bill had set the currency question at rest for ever, therefore the profound captain is gone over to see what he can do. But, captain, a word in your ear. We do not care for the Bourbons any more than we do for you. My real opinion is that there is nothing that can put England to rights that will not shake the Bourbon government. This is my opinion, but I defy the Bourbons to save, or to assist in saving, the present system in England, unless they and their friends will subscribe and pay off your debt for you, captain of toad-eating and nonsensical and shoe-licking Eton. Let them pay off your debt for you, captain. Let the Bourbons and their allies do that, or they cannot save you. No, nor can they help you, 
even in the smallest degree. Rumsey, Hampshire, Monday noon, 16th October. Like a very great fool, I, out of senseless complaisance, waited this morning to breakfast with the friends at whose house we slept last night at Andover. We thus lost two hours of dry weather, and have been justly punished by about an hour's ride in the rain. I settled on Lyndhurst as a place to lodge at to-night, so we are here feeding our horses, drying our clothes, and writing the account of our journey. We came as much as possible all the way through the villages, and almost all the way avoided the turnpike roads. From Andover to Stockbridge, about seven or eight miles, is for the greatest part an open corn and sheep country, a considerable portion of the land being downs. The wheat and rye and vetch and sainfoin fields look beautiful here, and during the whole of the way from Andover to Rumsey, the early turnips of both kinds are not bad, and the stubble turnips very promising. The downs are green, as meadows usually are in April. The grass is most abundant in all situations, where grass grows. From Stockbridge to Rumsey we came nearly by the riverside, and had to cross the river several times. This, the river test, which, as I described in my ride of last November, begins at Uphusband, by springs bubbling up in March, out of the bed of that deep valley. It is at first a burn, that is to say a stream, that runs only a part of the year, and is the rest of the year as dry as a road. About five miles from this periodical source, it becomes a stream all the year round. After winding about between the chalk hills for many miles, first in a general direction towards the south-east, and then in a similar direction towards the south-west and south, it is joined by the little stream that rises just above, and that passes through the town of Andover. It is after this joined by several other little streams, with names, and here at Rumsey it is a large and very fine river, famous all the way down for trout and eels, and both of the finest quality. Lindhurst, New Forest, Monday evening, 16th October. I have just time before I go to bed to observe that we arrived here about four o'clock, over about ten or eleven miles, of the best road in the world, having a choice too for the great part of the way, between these smooth roads and greensward. Just as we came out of Rumsey, or Romsey, and crossed our river test once more, we saw to our left the sort of park called Broadlands, where poor Charles Smith, who has mentioned above, was hanged for shooting at, not killing, one Snellgrove, an assistant gamekeeper of Lord Palmerston, who was then our secretary at war, and who is in that office, I believe, now, though he is now better known as a director of the Grand Mining Joint Stock Company, which shows the great industry of this noble and right honourable person, and also the great scope and the various nature and tendency of his talents. What would our old fathers of the Dark Ages have said, if they had been told that their descendants would at last become so enlightened as to enable Jews and loan-jobbers to take away noblemen's estates by mere watching the turn of the market, and to cause members, or at least one member, of that most honourable, noble, and reverend assembly, the King's Privy Council, in which he himself sits, so enlightened, I say, as to cause one of this most honourable and reverend body to become a director in a mining speculation. How one pities our poor, dark-aged, bigoted ancestors, who would, I dare say, have been as ready to hang a man for proposing such a liberal system as this, as they would have been to hang him for shooting at, not killing, an assistant gamekeeper. Poor old fellows! How much they lost by not living in our enlightened times! I am here close by the old purser's son, George Roses. End of chapter 26《Chapter 27 of Rural Rides》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter 27 Ride from Lyndhurst, New Forest, to Bewley Abbey, thence to Southampton and Weston, thence to Botley, Allington, Weston, near Hambledon, and thence to Petersfield, Thursley, Godalming. But where is now the goodly audit ale, the purse-proud tenant never known to fail, the farm which never yet was left on hand, the marsh reclaimed to most improving land, the impatient hope of the expiring lease, the doubling rental? What an evil's peace! In vain the prize excites the ploughman's skill, in vain the commons pass their patriot bill, the landed interest— you may understand the phrase much better, leaving out the land. The land self-interest groans from shore to shore, for fear that plenty should attain the poor. 
up up again ye rents exalt your notes or else the ministry will lose their votes and patriotism so delicately nice her loaves will lower to the market price lord byron age of bronze western grove wednesday eighteenth october eighteen twenty six yesterday from lyndhurst to this place was a ride including our roundabouts of more than forty miles but the roads the best in the world one half of the way green turf and the day as fine an one as ever came out of the heavens we took in a breakfast calculated for a long day's work and for no more eating till night we had slept in a room the access to which was only through another sleeping room which was also occupied and as i had got up about two o'clock at andover we went to bed at lyndhurst about half past seven o'clock i was of course awake by three or four i had eaten little over night so that here lay i not liking even after daylight began to glimmer to go through a chamber where by possibility there might be a lady actually in bed here lay i my bones aching with lying in bed my stomach growling for victuals imprisoned by my modesty but at last i grew impatient for modesty here or modesty there i was not to be penned up and starved so after having shaved and dressed and got ready to go down i thrust a george out a little before me into the other room and through we pushed previously resolving of course not to look towards the bed that was there but as the devil would have it just as i was about the middle of the room i like lot's wife turned my head all that i shall say is first that the consequences that befell her did not befall me and second that i advise those who are likely to be hungry in the morning not to sleep in inner rooms or if they do to take some bread and cheese in their pockets having got safe downstairs i lost no time in inquiry after the means of obtaining a breakfast to make up for the bad fare of the previous day and finding my landlady rather tardy in the work and not seemingly having a proper notion of the affair i went myself and having found a butcher's shop bought a loin of small fat weather mutton which i saw cut out of the sheep and cut into chops these were brought to the inn george and i ate about two pounds out of the five pounds and while i was writing a letter and making up my packet to be ready to send from southampton george went out and found a poor woman to come and take away the rest of the loin of mutton for our fastings of the day before enabled us to do this and though we had about forty miles to go to get to this place through the route that we intended to take i had resolved that we would go without any more purchase of victuals and drink this day also i beg leave to suggest to my well-fed readers i mean those who have at their command more victuals and drink than they can possibly swallow i beg to suggest to such whether this would not be a good way for them all to find the means of bestowing charity some poet has said that that which is given in charity gives a blessing on both sides to the giver as well as the receiver but i really think that if in general the food and drink given came out of food and drink deducted from the usual quantity swallowed by the giver the blessing would be still greater and much more certain i can speak for myself at any rate i hardly ever eat more than twice a day when at home never and i never if i can well avoid it eat any meat later than about one or two o'clock in the day i drink a little tea or milk and water at the usual tea-time about seven o'clock i go to bed at eight if i can i write or read from about four to about eight and then hungry as a hunter i go to breakfast eating as small a parcel of cold meat and bread as i can prevail upon my teeth to be satisfied with i do just the same at dinner-time i very rarely taste garden stuff of any sort if any man can show me that he has done or can do more work bodily and mentally united i say nothing about good health for of that the public can know nothing but i refer to the work the public know they see what i can do and what i actually have done and what i do and when any one has shown the public that he has done or can do more then i will advise my readers attend to him on the subject of diet and not to me as to drink the less the better and mine is milk and water or not sour small beer if i can get the latter for the former i always can i like the milk and water best but i do not like much water and if i drink much milk it loads and stupefies and makes me fat having made all preparations for a day's ride we set off as our first point for a station in the forest called new park there to see something about plantations and other matters connected with the affairs of our prime cocks the surveyors of woods and forests and crown lands and estates but before i go forward any further i must just step back again to rumsey which we passed rather too hastily through on the sixteenth as noticed in the ride that was published last week this town was in ancient times a very grand place though it is now nothing more than a decent market town without anything to entitle it to particular notice except its church which was the church of an abbey nunnery 
founded more, I think, than a thousand years ago, and which church was the burial place of several of the Saxon kings, and of Lady Palmerston, who, a few years ago, died in childbirth. What a mixture! But there was another personage buried here, and who was, it would seem, a native of the place, namely Sir William Petty, the ancestor of the present Marquis of Lansdowne. He was the son of a cloth weaver, and was doubtless himself a weaver, when young. He became a surgeon, was first in the service of Charles I, then went into that of Cromwell, whom he served as physician-general to his army in Ireland. Alas, poor Ireland! And in this capacity he resided at Dublin, till Charles II came, when he came over to London, having become very rich, was knighted by that profligate and ungrateful king, and he died in 1687, leaving a fortune of fifteen thousand pounds a year. This is what his biographers say. He must have made pretty good use of his time while physician-general to Cromwell's army in poor Ireland. Petty by nature as well as by name, he got from Cromwell a patent for double writing invented by him, and he invented a double-bottomed ship to sail against wind and tide, a model of which is still preserved in the library of the Royal Society, of which he was a most worthy member. His great art was, however, the amassing of money, and the getting of grants of lands in poor Ireland, in which he was one of the most successful of the English adventurers. I had the other day occasion to observe that the word petty manifestly is the French word petit, which means little, and that it is in these days of degeneracy pleasing to reflect that there is one family, at any rate, that old England still boasts one family, which retains the character designated by its pristine name, a reflection that rushed with great force into my mind when, in the year 1822, I heard the present noble head of the family say in the House of Lords that he thought that a currency of paper convertible into gold was the best and most solid and safe, especially since platina had been discovered. "'Oh, God!' exclaimed I to myself, as I stood listening and admiring below the bar. "'Oh, great God! There it is, there it is, still running in the blood, that genius which discovered the art of double writing and of making ships with double bottoms to sail against wind and tide. This noble and profound descendant of Cromwell's army physician has now seen that paper convertible into gold is not quite so solid and safe as he thought it was. He has now seen what a late panic is, and he might, if he were not so very well worthy of his family name, openly confess that he was deceived when in 1819 he, as one of the committee who reported in favour of Peel's bill, said that the country could pay the interest of the debt in gold. Talk of a change of ministry indeed! What is to be gained by putting this man in the place of any of those who are in power now? To come back now to Lyndhurst, we had to go about three miles to New Park, which is a farm in the New Forest, and nearly in the centre of it. We got to this place about nine o'clock. There is a good and large mansion-house here, in which the commissioners of woods and forest reside, when they come into the forest. There is a garden, a farmyard, a farm, and a nursery. The place looks like a considerable gentleman's seat. The house stands in a sort of park, and you can see that a great deal of expense has been incurred in levelling the ground, and making it pleasing to the eye of my lords the commissioners. My business here was to see whether anything had been done towards the making of locust plantations. I went first to Lyndhurst to make inquiries, but I was there told that New Park was the place, and the only place, at which to get information on the subject, and I was told further that the commissioners were now at New Park, that is to say those experienced tree-planters, Messrs. Arbuthnot, Dawkins and Company. Gad, thought I, I am here coming in close contact with a branch, or at least a twig, of the great thing itself. When I heard this, I was at breakfast, and of course dressed for the day. I could not, out of my extremely limited wardrobe, afford a clean shirt for the occasion, and so off we set, just as we were, hoping that their worships, the nation's tree-planters, would, if they met with us, excuse our dress when they considered the nature of our circumstances. When we came to the house, we were stopped by a little fence and fastened gate. I got off my horse, gave him to George to hold, went up to the door, and rang the bell. Having told my business to a person who appeared to be a foreman or bailiff, he, with great civility, took me into a nursery which is at the back of the house, and I soon drew from him the disappointing fact that my lords, the tree-planters, had departed the day before. I found as to locusts that a patch was sowed last spring which I saw, which are from one foot to four feet high, and very fine and strong, and are in number about enough to plant two acres of ground, the plants at four feet apart each way. I found that last fall some few locusts had been put out into plantations of other trees already made, but that they had not thriven, and had been barked by the hares. But a little bunch of these trees, same age, which were planted in the nursery, ought to convince my lords, the tree-planters, that, 
if they were to do what they ought to do, the public would very soon be owners of fine plantations of locusts, for the use of the navy. And what are the hares kept for here? Who eats them? What right have these commissioners to keep hares here to eat up the trees? Lord Folkestone killed his hares before he made his plantation of locusts. And why not kill the hares in the people's forest? For the people's it is, and that these commissioners ought always to remember. And then again, why this farm? What is it for? Why the pretence for it is this, that it is necessary to give the deer hay in winter, because the lopping down of limbs of trees for them to browse, as used to be the practice, is injurious to the growth of timber. That would be a very good reason for having a hay farm, when my lord shall have proved two things. First, that hay, in quantity equal to what is raised here, could not be bought for a twentieth part of the money that this farm and all its trappings cost, and second, that there ought to be any deer kept. What are these deer for? Who are to eat them? Are they for the royal family? Why, there are more deer bred in Richmond Park alone, to say nothing of Bushy Park, Hyde Park, and Windsor Park. There are more deer bred in Richmond Park alone than would feed all the branches of the royal family and all their households all the year round, if every soul of them ate as hearty as ploughmen, and if they never touched a morsel of any kind of meat but venison. For what, and for whom, then, are deer kept in the new forest? And why an expense of hay-farm, of sheds, of racks, of keepers, of lodgers, and other things attending the deer and the game, an expense amounting to more money annually than would have given relief to all the starving manufacturers in the north? And again I say, who is all this venison and game for? There is more game even in Kew Gardens than the royal family can want. And in short, do they ever taste or even hear of any game or any venison from the new forest? What a pretty thing here is, then! Here is another deep bite into us by the long and sharp-fanged aristocracy who so love old Sarum. Is there a man who will say that this is right, and that the game should be kept too to eat up trees, to destroy plantations, to destroy what is first paid for the planting of, and that the public should pay keepers to preserve this game, and that the people should be transported if they go out by night to catch the game that they pay for feeding? Blessed state of an aristocracy! It is pity that it has got a nasty, ugly, obstinate debt to deal with. It might possibly go on for ages, dear and all, were it not for this debt. This new forest is a piece of property as much belonging to the public as the Custom House at London is. There is no man, however poor, who has not a right in it. Every man is owner of a part of the deer, the game, and of the money that goes to the keepers, and yet any man may be transported if he go out by night to catch any part of this game. We are compelled to pay keepers for preserving game to eat up the trees that we are compelled to pay people to plant. Still, however, there is comfort. We might be worse off. For the Turks made the Tartars pay a tax called tooth money. That is to say, they eat up the victuals of the Tartars, and then made them pay for the use of their teeth. No man can say that we are come quite to that yet. And besides, the poor Tartars had no debt, no blessed debt, to hold out hope to them. The same person, a very civil and intelligent man, that showed me the nursery, took me in my way back through some plantations of oaks, which had been made amongst fir-trees. It was indeed a plantation of Scotch firs, about twelve years old, in rows at six feet apart. Every third row of firs was left, and oaks were, about six years ago, planted instead of the firs that were grubbed up, and the winter shelter that the oaks have received from the remaining firs has made them grow very finely, though the land is poor. Other oaks planted in the open twenty years ago, and in land deemed better, are not nearly so good. However, these oaks between the firs will take fifty or sixty good years to make them timber, and until they be timber they are of very little use, whereas the same ground planted with locusts, and the hairs of my lords kept down, would at this moment have been worth fifty pounds an acre. What do my lords care about this? For them, for my lords, the new forest would be no better than it is now. No, nor so good as it is now, for there would be no hairs for them. From New Park I was bound to Bewley Abbey, and I ought to have gone in a south-easterly direction instead of going back to Lyndhurst, which lay in precisely the opposite direction. My guide through the plantations was not apprised of my intended route, and therefore did not instruct me. Just before we parted, he asked me my name. I thought it lucky that he had not asked it before. When we got nearly back to Lyndhurst, we found that we had come three miles out of our way. Indeed, it made six miles altogether, for we were, when we got to Lyndhurst, three miles further from Bewley Abbey, than we were when we were at New Park. We wanted very much to go to the site of this ancient and famous abbey, of which the people of the New Forest seem to know very little. They call the place Bewley, and even in the maps it is called Bowley. 
Lee in the Saxon language means place, or rather open place, so that they put Lee in place of Lear, thus beating the Normans out of some part of the name, at any rate. I wish besides to see a good deal of this new forest. I had been before from Southampton to Lyndhurst, from Lyndhurst to Lymington, from Lymington to Sway. I had now come in on the north of Minstead from Romsey, so that I had seen the north of the forest and all the west side of it down to the sea. I had now been to New Park and had got back to Lyndhurst, so that, if I rode across the forest down to Bewley, I went right across the middle of it from north-west to south-east. Then, if I turned towards Southampton and went to Dipton and on to Ealing, I should see, in fact, the whole of this forest, or nearly the whole of it. We therefore started, or rather turned away from Lyndhurst, as soon as we got back to it, and went about six miles over a heath, even worse than Bagshot Heath, as barren as it is possible for land to be. A little before we came to the village of Bewley, which, observe, the people call Bewley, we went through a wood, chiefly of beech, and that beech seemingly destined to grow food for pigs, of which we saw, during this day, many, many thousands. I should think that we saw at least a hundred hogs to one deer. I stopped at one time and counted the hogs and pigs just round about me, and they amounted to a hundred and forty, all within fifty or sixty yards of my horse. After a very pleasant ride, on land without a stone in it, we came down to the Bewley River, the highest branch of which rises at the foot of a hill, about a mile and a half to the north-east of Lyndhurst. For a great part of the way down to Bewley it is a very insignificant stream. At last, however, augmented by springs from the different sand-hills, it becomes a little river, and has on the sides of it lands which were formerly very beautiful meadows. When it comes to the village of Bewley it forms a large pond of a great many acres, and on the east side of this pond is the spot where this famous abbey formerly stood, and where the external walls of which, or a large part of them, are now actually standing. We went down on the western side of the river. The abbey stood, and the ruins stand, on the eastern side. Happening to meet a man before I got into the village, I, pointing with my whip across towards the abbey, said to the man, "'I suppose there's a bridge down here to get across to the abbey?' "'That's not the abbey, sir,' says he. "'The abbey is about four miles further on.' I was astonished to hear this, but he was very positive, said that some people called it the abbey, but that the abbey was further on, and was at a farm occupied by farmer John Beale. Having chapter and verse for it, as the saying is, I believed the man, and pushed on towards farmer John Beale's, which I found, as he had told me, at the end of about four miles. When I got there, not having observed, gone over the water, to ascertain that the other was the spot where the abbey stood, I really thought at first that this must have been the site of the abbey of Bewley, because the name meaning fine place, this was a thousand times finer place than that where the abbey, as I afterwards found, really stood. After looking about it for some time, I was satisfied that it had not been an abbey, but the place is one of the finest that ever was seen in this world. It stands at about half a mile's distance from the water's edge at high water mark, and at about the middle of the space along the coast, from Calshot Castle to Lymington Haven. It stands, of course, upon a rising ground. It has a gentle slope down to the water. To the right you see Hurst Castle, and that narrow passage called the Needles, I believe, and to the left you see Spithead, and all the ships that are sailing or lie anywhere opposite Portsmouth. The Isle of Wight is right before you, and you have in view, at one and the same time, the towns of Yarmouth, Newton, Cowes, and Newport, with all the beautiful fields of the island, lying upon the side of a great bank before, and going up the edge of hills in the middle of the island. Here are two little streams, nearly close to the ruin, which fill ponds for fresh-water fish, while there was the Bewley River at about a half a mile or three-quarters of a mile to the left, to bring up the salt-water fish. The ruins consist of part of the walls of a building about two hundred feet long, and about forty feet wide. It has been turned into a barn in part, and the rest into cattle-sheds, cow-pens, and enclosures and walls, to enclose a small yard. But there is another ruin, which was a church or chapel, and which stands now very near to the farmhouse of Mr. John Beale, who owns the farm of the Duchess of Bucklew, who is now the owner of the abbey lands, and of the lands belonging to this place. The little church or chapel, of which I have just been speaking, appears to have been a very beautiful building. A part only of its walls is standing, but you see by what remains of the arches, that it was finished in a manner the most elegant and expensive of the day in which it was built. Part of the outside of the building is now surrounded by the farmer's garden. The interior is partly a pigsty and partly a goose-pen. Under that arch, which had once seen so many rich men bow their heads, we entered into the goose-pen, which is by no means one of the nicest concerns in the world. Beyond the goose-pen was the pigsty, and in it a hog, which, when fat, will weigh about thirty score, actually rubbing his shoulders against a little sort of column, which had supported the font and its holy water. 
The farmer told us that there was a hole which indeed we saw going down into the wall, or rather into the column where the font had stood, and he told us that many attempts had been made to bring water to fill that hole, but that it never had been done. Mr. Beale was very civil to us. As far as related to us, he performed the office of hospitality, which was the main business of those who formerly inhabited the spot. He asked us to dine with him, which we declined, for want of time, but being exceedingly hungry, we had some bread and cheese, and some very good beer. The farmer told me that a great number of gentlemen had come there to look at that place, but that he never could find out what the place had been, or what the place at Bewley had been. I told him that I would, when I got to London, give him an account of it, that I would write the account down, and send it down to him. He seemed surprised that I should make such a promise, and expressed his wish not to give me so much trouble. I told him not to say a word about the matter, for that his bread and cheese and beer were so good, that they deserved a full history to be written of the place, where they had been eaten and drunk. "'God bless me, sir! No, no! I said I will upon my soul, farmer. I now left him very grateful on our part for his hospitable reception, and he, I dare say, hardly being able to believe his own ears, at the generous promise that I had made him, which promise, however, I am now about to fulfil. I told the farmer a little upon the spot to begin with. I told him that the name was all wrong, that it was no Bewley but Beaulieu, and that Beaulieu meant fine place, and I proved this to him in this manner. You know, said I, farmer, that when a girl has a sweetheart, people call him her beau. Yes, said he, so they do. Very well, you know also that we say sometimes, you shall have this in lieu of that, and that when we say lieu, we mean in place of that. Now the beau means fine, as applied to the young man, and the lieu means place, and thus it is that the name of this place is Beaulieu, as it is so fine as you see it is. He seemed to be wonderfully pleased with the discovery, and we parted, I believe, with hearty good wishes on his part, and I am sure with very sincere thanks on my part. The Abbey of Beaulieu was founded in the year 1204 by King John, for thirty monks of the reformed Benedictine order. It was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It flourished until the year 1540, when it was suppressed, and the lands confiscated in the reign of Henry the Eighth. Its revenues were, at that time, four hundred and twenty-eight pounds, six shillings and eight pence a year, making, in money of the present day, upwards of eight thousand five hundred pounds a year. The lands in the abbey, and all belonging to it, were granted by the king to one Thomas Rothsley, who was a court pander of that day. From him it passed by sale, by will, by marriage, or by something or another, till at last it is got, after passing through various hands, into the hands of the Duchess of Buckley. So much for the abbey. And now, as for the ruins on the farm of Mr. John Beale, they were the dwelling-place of Knights Templars, or Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. The building they inhabited was called an hospital, and their business was to relieve travellers, strangers, and persons in distress, and if called upon to accompany the king in his wars to uphold Christianity. Their estate was also confiscated by Henry the Eighth. It was worth, at the time of being confiscated, upwards of two thousand pounds a year, money of the present day. This establishment was founded a little before the Abbey of Bewley was founded, and it was this foundation and not the other that gave the name of Bewley to both establishments. The Abbey is not situated in a very fine place. The situation is low, the lands above it rather swamp than otherwise, pretty enough altogether, but by no means a fine place. The Templars had all the reason in the world to give the name of Beaulieu to their place, and it is by no means surprising that the monks were willing to apply it to their abbey. Now, Farmer John Beale, I dare say that you are a very good Protestant, and I am a monstrous good Protestant too. We cannot bear the Pope, nor they their priests that makes men confess their sins, and go down upon their marrow bones before them. But, Master Beale, let us give the devil his due, and let us not act worse by those Roman Catholics, who, by the by, were our forefathers, than we are willing to act by the devil himself. Now then, here were a set of monks, and also a set of knights templars. Neither of them could marry, of course, neither of them could have wives and families. They could possess no private property, they could bequeath nothing, they could own nothing, but that which they owned in common with the rest of their body. They could hoard no money, they could save nothing, Whatever they received as rent for their lands, they must necessarily spend upon the spot, for they never could quit that spot. They did spend it all upon the spot. They kept all the poor. Bewley, and all round about Bewley, saw no misery, and had never heard the damned name of pauper pronounced, as long as those monks and Templars continued. You and I are excellent Protestants, Farmer John Beale. You and I have often assisted on the 5th of November to burn Guy Fawkes, the Pope, and the Devil. But you and I, Farmer John Beale, would much rather be life-holders 
under monks and templars than rack renters under duchesses the monks and the knights were the lords of their manors but the farmers under them were not rack renters the farmers under them held by lease of lives continued in the same farms from father to son for hundreds of years they were real yeomen and not miserable rack renters such as now till the land of this once happy country and who are little better than the drivers of the labourers for the profit of the landlords farmer john beale what the duchess of buckley does you know and i do not she may for anything that i know to the contrary leave her farms on lease of lives with rent so very moderate and easy as for the farm to be half as good as the farmer's own at any rate the duchess may for anything that i know to the contrary feed all the hungry clothe all the naked comfort all the sick and prevent the hated name of pauper from being pronounced in the district of Bewley. her grace may for anything that i know to the contrary make poor rates to be wholly unnecessary and unknown in your country she may receive lodge and feed the stranger she may in short employ the rents of this fine estate of Bewley to make the whole district happy she may not carry a farthing of the rents away from the spot and she may consume by herself and her own family and servants only just as much as is necessary to the preservation of their life and health her grace may do all this i do not say or insinuate that she does not do it at all but protestant here or protestant there farmer john beale this i do say that unless her grace do all this the monks and the templars were better for Bewley than her grace from the former station of the templars from real Bewley of the new forest we came back to the village of Bewley and there across the water to come on towards Southampton. Here we pass close along under the old abbey walls, a great part of which are still standing. There is a mill here which appears to be turned by the fresh water, but the fresh water falls here into the salt water, as at the village of Botley. We did not stop to go about the ruins of the abbey, for ye seldom make much out of minute inquiry. It is the political history of these places, or at least their connection with political events, that is interesting. Just about the banks of this little river, there are some woods and coppices and some corn land. But at the distance of half a mile from the water side, we came out again upon the intolerable heath, and went on for seven or eight miles over that heath, from the village of Bewley to that of Marchwood, having a list of trees and enclosed lands away to our right all the way along. Which list of trees from the southwest side of that arm of the sea, which goes from Calshot Castle to Redbridge, passing by Southampton, which lies on the northeast side? Never was a more barren tract of land than these seven or eight miles. We had come seven miles across the forest in another direction in the morning, so that a poorer spot than this new forest there is not in all England, nor, I believe, in the whole world. It is more barren and miserable than Bagshot Heath. There are less fertile spots in it in proportion to the extent of each. Still, it is so large, it is of such great extent, being, if moulded into a circle not so little, I believe, as sixty or seventy miles in circumference, that it must contain some good spots of land, and if properly and honestly managed, those spots must produce a prodigious quantity of timber. It is a pretty curious thing that, while the admirers of the paper system are boasting of our vast improvements, ma'am, there should have been such a visible and such an enormous dilapidation in all the solid things of the country. I have in former parts of this ride stated that in some counties, while the parsons have been pocketing the amount of the tithes and of the glebe, they have suffered the parsonage-houses either to fall down, and to be lost brick by brick and stone by stone, or to become such miserable places as to be unfit for anything bearing the name of a gentleman to live in. I have stated, and I am at any time ready to prove, that in some counties this is the case in more than one half of the parishes. And now, amidst all these vast improvements, let us see how the account of timber stands in the new forest. In the year 1608, a survey of the timber in the New Forest was made, when there were loads of oak timber fit for the navy, 315,477. Mark that, reader. Another survey was taken in the year 1783, that is to say, in the glorious Jubilee reign, and when there were, in this same New Forest, loads of oak timber fit for the navy, 20,830. Whilst improvements, ma'am, under the pilot that weathered the storm, and in the reign of jubilee what the devil some one would say could have become of all this timber does the reader observe that there were three hundred and fifteen thousand four hundred and seventy seven loads and does he observe that a load is fifty two cubic feet does the reader know what is the price of this load of timber i suppose it is now taking in lop top and bark and bought upon the spot 
timber fit for the navy, mind, ten pounds a load at the least. But let us suppose that it has been upon an average since the year 1608, just the time that the Stuarts were mounting the throne, let us suppose that it has been, on an average, four pounds a load. Here's a pretty tough sum of money. This must have gone into the pockets of somebody. At any rate, if we had the same quantity of timber now, that we had when the Protestant Reformation took place, or even when old Betsy turned up her toes, we should be now three millions of money richer than we are, not in bills, not in notes payable to bearer on demand, not in Scotch cash credits, not, in short, in lies, falseness, impudence, downright blackguard cheatery and mining shares, and Greek cause and the devil knows what. I shall have occasion to return to this new forest, which is in reality, though in general a very barren district, a much more interesting object to Englishmen than are the services of my Lord Palmerston and the warlike undertakings of Burdett, Galloway and Company. But I cannot quit this spot even for the present, without asking the Scotch population mongers and Malthus and his crew, and especially George Chalmers, if he should yet be creeping about upon the face of the earth, what becomes of all their notions of the scantiness of the ancient population of England? What becomes of all these notions, of all their bundles of ridiculous lies about the fewness of the people in former times? What becomes of them all, if historians have told us one word of truth, with regard to the formation of the new forest by William the Conqueror? All the historians say, every one of them says, that this king destroyed several populous towns and villages in order to make this new forest. End of chapter 27《I broke off abruptly under this same date in my last register, when speaking of William the Conqueror's demolishing of towns and villages to make the new forest, and I was about to show that all the historians have told us lies the most abominable about this affair of the new forest, or that the Scotch writers on population, and particularly charmers, have been the greatest of fools, or the most impudent of impostors. I therefore now resume this matter, it being, in my opinion, a matter of great interest, at a time when, in order to account for the present notoriously bad living of the people of England, it is asserted that they are become greatly more numerous than they formerly were. This would be no defence of the government, even if the fact were so. But, as I have over and over again proved, the fact is false. And to this I challenge denial, that either churches and great mansions and castles were formerly made without hands, or England was, seven hundred years ago, much more populous than it is now. But what has the formation of the new forest to do with this? A great deal, for the historians tell us that, in order to make this forest, William the Conqueror destroyed many populous towns and villages, and thirty-six parish churches. The devil he did! How populous, then, good God, must England have been at that time, which was about the year 1090, that is to say, seven hundred and thirty-six years ago? For the Scotch will hardly contend that the nature of the soil has been changed for the worse since that time, especially as it has not been cultivated." No, no, brassy as they are, they will not do that. Come, then, let us see how this matter stands. This forest has been crawled upon by favourites, and is now much smaller than it used to be. A time may and will come for inquiring how George Rose and others became owners of some of the very best parts of this once public property. A time for such inquiry must come, before the people of England will ever give their consent to a reduction of the interest of the debt. But this we know, that the new forest formerly extended westward from the Southampton water and the river Ouse, to the river Avon, and northward from Lymington Haven to the borders of Wiltshire. We know that this was its utmost extent, and we know also that the towns of Christchurch, Lymington, Ringwood, and Fordingbridge, and the villages of Boulder, Forley, Lyndhurst, Dipton, Ealing, Minstead, and all the other villages that now have churches, we know, I say, and pray mark it, that all these towns and villages existed before the Norman conquest, because the Roman names of several of them, all the towns, are in print, and because an account of them all is to be found in Doomsday Book, which was made by this very William the Conqueror. Well then, now Scotch population liars and you Malthusian blasphemers, 
who contend that God has implanted in man a principle that leads him to starvation. Come now, and face this history of the new forest. Cook, in his geography of Hampshire, says that the conqueror destroyed here many populous towns and villages, and thirty-six parish churches. The same writer says that, in the time of Edward the Confessor, just before the conqueror came, two-thirds of the forest was inhabited and cultivated. Guthrie says nearly the same thing. But let us hear the two historians who are now pitted against each other, Hume and Lingard. The former, volume 2, page 277, says, There was one pleasure to which William, as well as all the Normans and ancient Saxons, was extremely addicted, and that was hunting. But this pleasure he indulged more at the expense of his unhappy subjects, whose interests he always disregarded, than to the loss or diminution of his own revenue. Not content with those large forests which former kings possessed in all parts of England, he resolved to make a new forest near Winchester, the usual place of his residence, and for that purpose he laid waste the county of Hampshire, for an extent of thirty miles, expelled the inhabitants from their houses, seized their property, even demolished churches and convents, and made the sufferers no compensation for the injury. Pretty well for a pensioned Scotchman. And now let us hear Dr. Lingard to prevent his society from presenting whose work to me, the sincere and pious Samuel Butler, was ready to go down upon his marrow-bones. Let us hear the good doctor upon this subject. He says, volume 1, pages 452 and 453, Though the king possessed sixty-eight forests, besides parks and chases in different parts of England, he was not yet satisfied, but for the occasional accommodation of his court, a forested and extensive tract of country lying between the city of Winchester and the sea-coast. The inhabitants were expelled, the cottages and the churches were burnt, and more than thirty square miles of a rich and populous district were withdrawn from cultivation, and converted into a wilderness, to afford sufficient range for the deer and ample space for the royal diversion. The memory of this act of despotism has been perpetuated in the name of the new forest, which it retains at the present day, after the lapse of seven hundred and fifty years. Historians should be careful how they make statements relative to places which are within the scope of the reader's inspection. It is next impossible not to believe that the doctor has, in this case, a very interesting one, merely copied from Hume. Hume says that the king expelled the inhabitants, and Lingard says the inhabitants were expelled. Hume says that the king demolished the churches, and Lingard says that the churches were burned. But Hume says churches and convents, and Lingard knew that to be a lie. The doctor was too learned upon the subject of convents to follow the Scotchman here. Hume says that the king laid waste the country for an extent of thirty miles. The doctor says that a district of thirty square miles was withdrawn from cultivation and converted into a wilderness. Now what Hume mean by the loose phrase an extent of thirty miles I cannot say, but this I know that Dr. Lingard's thirty square miles is a piece of ground only five and a half miles each way so that the doctor has got here a curious district and a not less curious wilderness, and what number of churches could William find to burn in a space five miles and a half each way? If the doctor means thirty miles square instead of square miles, the falsehood is so monstrous as to destroy his credit for ever, for here we have nine hundred square miles, containing five hundred and seventy-six thousand acres of land, that is to say fifty-six thousand nine hundred and sixty acres more than are contained in the whole of the county of Surrey, and ninety-nine thousand eight hundred and forty acres more than are contained in the whole of the county of Berks. This is history, is it? And these are historians. The true statement is this. The new forest, according to its ancient state, was bounded thus, by the line going from the river Ouse to the river Avon, and which line there separates Wiltshire from Hampshire, by the river Avon, by the sea from Christchurch to Calshot Castle, by the Southampton water, and by the river Ouse. These are the boundaries, and, as any one may by scale and compass ascertain, there are within these boundaries about 224 square miles, containing 143,360 acres of land. Within these limits there are now remaining eleven parish churches, all of which were in existence before the time of William the Conqueror, so that if he destroyed thirty-six parish churches, what a populous country this must have been! There must have been forty-seven parish churches, so that there was over this whole district one parish church to every four and three-quarter square miles. Thus then the churches must have stood on an average at within one mile and about two hundred yards of each other, and observe the parishes could on an average contain no more each than two thousand nine hundred and sixty-six acres of land, not a very large farm, so that here was a parish church to every large farm, unless these historians are all fools and liars. 
I defy any one to say that I make hazardous assertions. I have plainly described the ancient boundaries. There are the maps. Any one can, with scale and compass, measure the area as well as I can. I have taken the statements of historians, as they call themselves. I have shown that their histories, as they call them, are fabulous, or, and mind this or, that England was at one time, and that too eight hundred years ago, beyond all measures more populous than it is now. For observe, notwithstanding what Dr. Lingard asserts, notwithstanding that he describes this district as rich, it is the very poorest in the whole kingdom. Dr. Lingard was, I believe, born and bred at Winchester. And how then could he be so callous, or indeed so regardless of truth? And I do not see why I am to mince the matter with him, as to describe this as a rich district. Innumerable persons have seen Bagshot Heath. Great numbers have seen the barren heaths between London and Brighton. Great numbers also have seen that wide sweep of barrenness, which exhibits itself between the golden Farmer Hill and Blackwater. Nine-tenths of each of these are less barren than four-fifths of the land in the New Forest. Supposing it to be credible that a man so prudent and so wise as William the Conqueror, supposing that such a man should have pitched upon a rich and populous district wherewith to make a chase, supposing, in short, these historians to have spoken the truth, and supposing this barren land to have been all inhabited and cultivated, and the people so numerous and so rich as to be able to build and endow a parish church upon every four and three-quarter square miles upon this extensive district, supposing them to have been so rich in the produce of the soil as to want a priest to be stationed at every mile in two hundred yards in order to help them to eat it, supposing, in a word, these historians not to be the most farcical liars that ever put pen upon paper, this country must, at the time of the Norman conquest, have literally swarmed with people. For there is the land now, and all the land too. Neither Hume nor Dr. Lingard can change the nature of that. There it is, an acre of it not having, upon an average, so much of productive capacity in it as one single square rod, taking the average of Worcestershire. And if I were to say one single square yard, I should be right. There is the land. And if that land were, as these historians say it was, covered with people and with churches, what the devil must Worcestershire have been? To this, then, we come at last, having made out what I undertook to show, namely, that the historians, as they call themselves, are either the greatest fools or the greatest liars that have existed, or that England was beyond all measure more populous eight hundred years ago than it is now. Poor, however, as this district is, and culled about as it has been, for the best spots of land by those favourites who have got grants of land or leases or something or other, still there are some spots here and there which would grow trees, but never will it grow trees, or anything else to the profit of this nation, until it become private property. Public property must in some cases be in the hands of public officers, but this is not an affair of that nature. This is too loose a concern, too little controllable by superiors. It is a thing calculated for jobbing above all others, calculated to promote the success of favouritism. Who can imagine that the persons employed about plantations and farms for the public are employed because they are fit for the employment? Supposing the commissioners to hold in abhorrence the idea of paying for services to themselves under the name of paying for services to the public, supposing them never to have heard of such a thing in their lives, can they imagine that nothing of this sort takes place while they are in London eleven months out of twelve in the year? I never feel disposed to cast much censure upon any of the persons engaged in such concerns. The temptation is too great to be resisted. The public must pay for everything à poids d'or. Therefore no such thing should be in the hands of the public, or rather of the government, and I hope to live to see this thing completely taken out of the hands of this government. It was nightfall when we arrived at Ealing, that is to say, at the head of the Southampton water. Our horses were very hungry. We stopped to bait them, and set off just about dusk to come to this place, Weston Grove, stopping at Southampton on our way, and leaving a letter to come to London. Between Southampton and this place we cross a bridge over the Itchen River, and, coming up a hill into a common, which is called Town Hill Common, we passed, lying on our right, a little park and house, occupied by the Irish Bible man, Lord Ashdown, I think they call him, whose real name is French, and whose family are so very well known in the most unfortunate sister kingdom. Just at the back of his house, in another sort of paddock place, lives a man, whose name I forget, who was, I believe, a coachmaker in the East Indies, and whose father or uncle kept a turnpike gate at Chelsea a few years ago. See the effects of industry and enterprise. But even these would be nothing, were it not for this wondrous system, by which money can be snatched away from the labourer in this very parish, for instance, sent off to the East Indies, their help to make a mass to put into the hands of an adventurer, and that the mass may be brought back in the pockets of the adventurer, 
and caused him to be called a squire by the labourer, whose earnings were so snatched away. Wondrous system! Pity it cannot last for ever! Pity that it has got a debt of a thousand millions to pay! Pity that it cannot turn paper into gold! Pity that it will make such fools of Prosperity Robinson and his colleagues! The moon shone very bright by the time that we mounted the hill, and now, skirting the enclosures upon the edge of the common, we passed several of those cottages which I so well recollected, and in which I had the satisfaction to believe that the inhabitants were sitting comfortably with bellies full by a good fire. It was eight o'clock before we arrived at Mr. Chamberlain's, whom I had not seen since, I think, the year 1816, for in the fall of that year I came to London, and I never returned to Botley, which is only about three miles and a half from Weston, to stay there for any length of time. To those who like water scenes, as nineteen-twentieths of people do, it is the prettiest spot, I believe, in all England. Mr. Chamberlain built the house about twenty years ago. He has been bringing the place to greater and greater perfection from that time to this. All round about the house is in the neatest possible order. I should think that altogether there cannot be so little as ten acres of short grass, and when I say that, those who know anything about gardens will form a pretty correct general notion as to the scale on which the thing is carried on. Until of late Mr. Chamberlain was owner of only a small part, comparatively, of the lands hereabouts. He is now the owner, I believe, of the whole of the lands that come down to the water's edge, and that lie between the ferry over the Itchen at Southampton, and the river which goes out from the Southampton water at Hamble. And now let me describe as well as I can what this land and its situation are. The Southampton water begins at Portsmouth and goes up by Southampton to Redbridge, being, upon an average, about two miles wide having on the one side the new forest, and on the other side, for a great part of the way, this fine and beautiful estate of Mr. Chamberlain. Both sides of this water have rising lands divided into hill and dale, and very beautifully clothed with trees, the woods and lawns and fields being most advantageously intermixed. It is very curious that at the back of each of these tracts of land there are extensive heaths on this side as well as on the new forest side. To stand here and look across the water at the new forest, you would imagine that it was really a country of woods, for you can see nothing of the heaths from here. Those heaths over which we rode, and from which we could see a windmill down among the trees, which windmill is now to be seen just opposite this place. So that the views from this place are the most beautiful that can be imagined. You see up the water and down the water to Redbridge one way, and out to Spithead the other way. Through the trees to the right you see the spires of Southampton, and you have only to walk a mile over a beautiful lawn and through a not less beautiful wood, to find in a little dell surrounded with lofty woods the venerable ruins of Netley Abbey, which make part of Mr. Chamberlain's estate. The woods here are chiefly of oak. The ground consists of a series of hill and dale, as you go longwise from one end of the estate to the other, about six miles in length. Down almost every little valley that divides these hills or hillocks, there is more or less of water, making the underwood in those parts very thick and dark to go through, and these form the most delightful contrast with the fields and lawns. There are innumerable vessels of various sizes continually upon the water, and to those that delight in water scenes this is certainly the very prettiest place that I ever saw in my life. I had seen it many years ago, and as I intended to come here on my way home, I told George before we set out that I would show him another western before we got to London. The parish in which his father's house is is also called Weston, and a very beautiful spot it certainly is, but I told him I questioned whether I could not show him a still prettier Weston than that. We let him alone for the first day. He sat in the house and saw great multitudes of pheasants and partridges upon the lawn before the window. He went down to the waterside by himself, and put his foot upon the ground to see the tide rise. He seemed very much delighted. The second morning at breakfast we put it to him which he would rather have this western, or the western he had left in Herefordshire. But though I introduced the question in a way almost to extort a decision in favour of the Hampshire western, he decided instantly and plump for the other, in a manner very much to the delight of Mr. Chamberlain and his sister. So true it is that when people are uncorrupted, they always like home best, be it in itself what it may. Everything that nature can do has been done here, and money most judiciously employed has come to her assistance. Here are a thousand things to give pleasure to any rational mind, but there is one thing which in my estimation surpasses in pleasure, to contemplate all the lawns and all the groves and all the gardens, and all the game and everything else, and that is the real unaffected goodness of the owner of this estate. He is a member for Southampton, he has other fine estates, he 
He has great talents, he is much admired by all who know him. But he has done more by his justice, by his just way of thinking with regard to the labouring people, than in all other ways put together. This was nothing new to me, for I was well informed of it several years ago, though I had never heard him speak of it in my life. When he came to this place, the common wages of day-labouring men were thirteen shillings a week, and the wages of carpenters, bricklayers, and other tradesmen were in proportion. Those wages he has given, from that time to this, without any abatement whatever. With these wages a man can live, having, at the same time, other advantages attending the working for such a man as Mr. Chamberlain. He has got less money in his bags than he would have had, if he had ground men down in their wages. But if his sleep be not sounder than that of the hard-fisted wretch that can walk over grass and gravel, kept in order by a poor creature that is half-starved, if his sleep be not sounder than the sleep of such a wretch, then all that we have been taught is false, and there is no difference between the man who feeds and the man who starves the poor. All the scripture is a bundle of lies, and instead of being propagated, it ought to be flung into the fire. It is curious enough that those who are the least disposed to give good wages to the labouring people should be the most disposed to discover for them schemes for saving their money. I have lately seen, I saw it at Uphusband, a prospectus or scheme, for establishing what they call a county-friendly society. This is a scheme for getting from the poor a part of the wages that they receive, just as if a poor fellow could put anything by out of eight shillings a week. If indeed the schemers were to pay the labourers twelve or thirteen shillings a week, then these might have something to lay by at some times of the year. But then indeed there would be no poor rates wanted, and it is to get rid of the poor rates that these schemers have invented their society. What wretched drivellers they must be, to think that they should be able to make the pauper keep the pauper, to think that they shall be able to make the man that is half-starved lay by part of his loaf. I know of no county where the poor are worse treated than in many parts of this county of Hants. It is happy to know of one instance in which they are well treated, and I deem it a real honour to be under the roof of him, who has uniformly set so laudable an example in this most important concern. What are all his riches to me? They form no title to my respect. "'Tis not for me to set myself up in judgment as to his taste, his learning, his various qualities and endowments. But of these his unequivocal works I am a competent judge. I know how much good he must do, and there is a great satisfaction in reflecting on the great happiness that he must feel when, in laying his head upon his pillow of a cold and dreary winter night, he reflects that there are scores, ay, scores upon scores, of his country people, of his poor neighbours, of those whom the scripture denominates his brethren, who have been enabled through him to retire to a warm bed after spending a cheerful evening and taking a full meal by the side of their own fire. People may talk what they will about happiness, but I can figure to myself no happiness surpassing that of the man who falls to sleep with reflections like these in his mind. Now observe, it is a duty on my part to relate what I have here related as to the conduct of Mr. Chamberlain, not a duty towards him, for I can do him no good by it, and I do most sincerely believe that both he and his equally benevolent sister, would rather that their goodness remained unproclaimed. But it is a duty towards my country, and particularly towards my readers. Here is a striking and a most valuable practical example. Here is a whole neighbourhood of labourers, living as they ought to live, enjoying that happiness which is the just reward of their toil. And shall I suppress facts so honourable to those who are the cause of this happiness, facts so interesting in themselves, and so likely to be useful in the way of example? Shall I do this, I, and besides this, tacitly give a false account of Weston Grove, and this too, from the stupid and cowardly fear of being accused of flattering a rich man? Netley Abbey ought, it seems, to be called Letley Abbey, the Latin name being Latus Locus, or Pleasant Place. Letley was made up of an abbreviation of the Latus, and of the Saxon word Lee, which meaned place, field, or piece of ground. This abbey was founded by Henry the Third in 1239, for twelve monks of the Benedictine order, and when suppressed by the wife-killer its revenues amounted to three thousand two hundred pounds a year of our present money. The possessions of these monks were, by the wife-killing founder of the Church of England, given away, though they belonged to the public, to one of his court sycophants, Sir William Paulet, a man the most famous in the whole world for sycophancy, time-serving, and for all those qualities which usually distinguish the favourites of kings, like the wife-killer. This Paulet changed from the Popish to Henry the Eighth's religion, and was a great actor in punishing the Papists. When Edward the Sixth came to the throne, this Paulet turned Protestant, and was a great actor in punishing those who adhered to Henry the Eighth's religion. 
when queen mary came to the throne this paulet turned back to papist and was one of the great actors in sending protestants to be burnt in smithfield when old bess came to the throne this paulet turned back to protestant again and was until the day of his death one of the great actors in persecuting in fining in mulcting and in putting to death those who still had the virtue and the courage to adhere to the religion in which they and he had been born and bred the head of this family got at last to be earl of wiltshire marquis of winchester and duke of bolton this last title is now gone or rather it is changed to that of lord bolton which is now borne by a man of the name of ord who is the son of a man of that name who died some years ago and who married a daughter i think it was of the last duke of bolton pretty curious and not a little interesting to look back at the origin of this dukedom of bolton and then to look at the person now bearing the title of bolton and then to go to abbotston near winchester and survey the ruins of the proud palace once inhabited by the duke of bolton which ruins and the estate on which they stand are now the property of the loan-maker alexander baring curious turn of things henry the wife-killer and his confiscating successors granted the estates of netley and of many other monasteries to the head of these paulettes to maintain these and other similar grants a thing called a reformation was made to maintain the reformation a glorious revolution was made to maintain the glorious revolution a debt was made to maintain the debt a large part of the rents must go to the debt dealers or loan makers and thus at last the bearings only in this one neighbourhood have become the successors of the rothsleys the paulettes and the russells who throughout all the reigns of confiscation were constantly in the way when a distribution of good things was taking place curious enough all this but the thing will not stop here the loan makers think that they shall outwit the old grantee fellows and so they might and the people too and the devil himself but they cannot outwit events those events will have a thorough rummaging and of this fact the turn of the market gentlemen may be assured can it be law i put the question to lawyers can it be law i leave reason and justice out of the inquiry can it be law that if i to-day see dressed in good clothes and with a full purse a man who was notoriously penniless yesterday can it be law that i being a justice of the peace have a right to demand of that man how he came by his clothes and his purse and can it be law that i seeing within a state a man who was notoriously not worth a crown piece a few years ago and who is notoriously related to nothing more than one degree above beggary can it be law that i a magistrate seeing this have not a right to demand of this man how he came by his estate no matter however for if both these be law now they will not i trust be law in a few years from this time mr chamberlain has caused the ancient fish-ponds at netley abbey to be reclaimed as they call it what a loss what a national loss there has been in this way and in the article of waterfowl i am quite satisfied that in these two articles and in that of rabbits the nation has lost has had annihilated within the last two hundred and fifty years food sufficient for two days in the week on an average taking the year throughout these are things too which cost so little labour you can see the marks of old fish-ponds in thousands and thousands of places i have noticed i dare say five hundred since i left home a trifling expense would in most cases restore them but nowadays all is looked for at shops all is to be had by trafficking scarcely any one thinks of providing for his own wants out of his own land and other his own domestic means to buy the thing ready-made is the taste of the day thousands who are housekeepers buy their dinners ready cooked nothing is so common as to rent breasts for children to suck a man actually advertised in the london papers about two months ago to supply childless husbands with heirs in this case the articles were of course to be ready-made for to make them to order would be the devil of a business though in desperate cases even this is i believe sometimes resorted to Hamilton, Sunday, 22nd October, 1826. We left Weston Grove on Friday morning, and came across to Botley, where we remained during the rest of the day, and until after breakfast yesterday. I had not seen the Botley parson for several years, and I wished to have a look at him now, but could not get a sight of him, though we rode close before his house, and much about his breakfast time, and though we gave him the strongest of invitation that could be expressed by hallooing and by cracking of whips. The fox was too cunning for us, and do all we could. We could not provoke him to put even his nose out of kennel. From Mr. James Warner's at Botley we went to Mr. Hallett's at Hallington, and had the very great pleasure of seeing him in excellent health. We intended to go back to Botley, and then to go to Titchfield, and in our way to this place over Portsdown Hill, whence I intended to show George the harbour and the fleet, and of still more importance the spot on which we signed the Hampshire petition in 1817 
that petition which foretold that which the Norfolk petition confirmed, that petition which will be finally acted upon or that petition was the very last thing that I wrote at Botley. I came to London in November 1816. The power of imprisonment bill was passed in February 1817. Just before it was passed, the meeting took place on Portsdown Hill, and I, in my way to the hill from London, stopped at Botley and wrote the petition. We had one meeting afterwards at Winchester, when I heard Parsons swear like troopers, and saw one of them hawk up his spittle, and spit it into Lord Cochrane's poll. Ah, my bucks, we have you now! You are got nearly to the end of your tether, and what is more, you know it. Pay off the debt, Parsons! It is useless to swear and spit and to present addresses applauding power of imprisonment bills, unless you can pay off the debt. Pay off the debt, Parsons! They say you can lay the devil. Lay this devil, then. Or confess that he is too many for you, ay, and for Sturgis born, or born Sturgis, I forget which, at your backs. From Arlington, we, fearing that it would rain before we could get round by Titchfield, came across the country over Waltham Chase and Soberton Down. The chase was very green and fine, but the down was the very greenest thing that I have seen in the whole country. It is not a large down, perhaps not more than five or six hundred acres, but the land is good. The chalk is at a foot from the surface or more. The mould is a hazel mould. And when I was upon the opposite hill, I could, though I knew the spot very well, hardly believe that it was a down. The green was darker than that of any pasture or even any same foin or clover, that I had seen throughout the whole of my ride, and I should suppose that there could not have been many less than a thousand sheep in the three flocks that were feeding upon the down when I came across it. I do not speak with anything like positiveness as to the measurement of this down, but I do not believe that it exceeds six hundred and fifty acres. They must have had more rain in this part of the country than in most other parts of it. Indeed, no part of Hampshire seems to have suffered very much from the drought. I found the turnips pretty good of both sorts all the way from Andover to Rumsey. Through the new forest you may as well expect to find loaves of bread growing in fields as turnips, where there are any fields for them to grow in. From Redbridge to Weston we had not light enough to see much about us, but when we came down to Botley we there found the turnips as good as I had ever seen them in my life, as far as I could judge from the time I had to look at them. Mr. Warner has as fine turnip fields as I ever saw him have, Swedish turnips and white also, and pretty nearly the same may be said of the whole of that neighbourhood for many miles round. After quitting Soberton Down, we came up a hill leading to Hambledon, and turned off to our left to bring us down to Mr. Goldsmith's at West End, where we now are, at about a mile from the village of Hambledon. A village it now is, but it was formerly a considerable market town, and it had three fairs in the year. There is now not even the name of market left, I believe, and the fairs amount to little more than a couple of three gingerbread stalls, with dolls and whistles for children. If you go through the place, you see that it has been a considerable town. The church tells the same story. It is now a tumble-down rubbishy place. It is partaking in the fate of all those places which were formerly a sort of rendezvous for persons with things to buy and things to sell. Wens have devoured market towns and villages, and shops have devoured markets and fairs, and this to the infinite injury of the most numerous classes of the people. Shopkeeping, merely a shopkeeping, is injurious to any community. What are the shop and the shopkeeper for? To receive and distribute the produce of the land. There are other articles, certainly, but the main part is the produce of the land. The shop must be paid for, the shopkeeper must be kept, and the one must be paid for and the other must be kept by the consumer of the produce, or perhaps partly by the consumer and partly by the producer. When fairs were very frequent, shops were not needed. A manufacturer of shoes, of stockings, of hats, of almost anything that man wants, could manufacture at home in an obscure hamlet, with cheap house rent, good air and plenty of room. He need pay no heavy rent for shop, and no disadvantages from confined situation, and then by attending three or four or five or six fairs in a year, he sold the work of his hands, unloaded with a heavy expense attending the keeping of a shop. He would get more for ten shillings in a booth at a fair or market, than he would get in a shop for ten or twenty pounds. Of course he could afford to sell the work of his hands for less, and thus a greater portion of the earnings remained with those who raised the food and the clothing from the land. I had an instance of this in what occurred to myself at Wayhill Fair. When I was at Salisbury in September, I wanted to buy a whip. It was a common hunting whip with a hook to it to pull open gates with, and I could not get it for less than seven shillings and sixpence. This was more than I had made up my mind to give, and I went on with my switch. When we got to Wayhill Fair, George had made shift to lose his whip some time before, and I had made him go without one by way of punishment. 
but now having come to the fair and seen plenty of whips i bought him one just such a one as had been offered me at salisbury for seven and sixpence for four and sixpence and seeing the man with his whips afterwards i thought i would have one myself and he let me have it for three shillings so that here were two whips precisely of the same kind and quality as the whip at salisbury bought for the money which the man at salisbury asked me for one whip and yet far be it from me to accuse the man at salisbury of an attempt at extortion he had an expensive shop and a family in a town to support while my wayhill fellow had been making his whips in some house in the country which he rented probably for five or six pounds a year with a good garden to it does not every one see in a minute how this exchanging of fairs and markets for shops creates idlers and traffickers creates those locusts called middlemen who create nothing who add to the value of nothing who improve nothing but who live in idleness and who live well too out of the labour of the producer and the consumer the fair and the market those wise institutions of our forefathers and with regard to the management of which they were so scrupulously careful the fair and the market bring the producer and the consumer in contact with each other whatever is gained is at any rate gained by one or the other of these the fair and the market bring them together and enable them to act for their mutual interest and convenience the shop and the trafficker keeps them apart the shop hides from both producer and consumer the real state of matters the fair and the market lay everything open going to either you see the state of things at once and the transactions are fair and just not disfigured too by falsehood and by those attempts at deception which disgrace traffickings in general very wise too and very just were the laws against forestalling and regrating they were laws to prevent the producer and the consumer from being cheated by the trafficker there are whole bodies of men indeed a very large part of the community who live in idleness in this country in consequence of the whole current of the laws now running in favour of the trafficking monopoly it has been a great object with all wise governments in all ages from the days of moses to the present day to confine trafficking mere trafficking to as few hands as possible it seems to be the main object of this government to give all possible encouragement to traffickers of every description and to make them swarm like the lice of egypt there is that numerous sect the quakers this sect arose in england they were engendered by the jewish system of usury till excises and loanmongering began these vermin were never heard of in england they seem to have been hatched by that fraudulent system as maggots are bred by putrid meat or as the flounders come in the livers of rotten sheep the base vermin do not pretend to work all they talk about is dealing and the government in place of making laws that would put them in the stocks or cause them to be whipped at the cart's tail really seem anxious to encourage them and to increase their numbers nay it is not long since mr broom had the effrontery to move for leave to bring in a bill to make men liable to be hanged upon the bare word of these vagabonds this is with me something never to be forgotten but everything tends the same way all the regulations all the laws that have been adopted of late years have a tendency to give encouragement to the trickster and the trafficker and to take from the labouring classes all the honour and a great part of the food that fairly belonged to them in coming along yesterday from waltham chase to soberton down we passed by a big white house upon a hill that was when i lived at botley occupied by one good lad who was a cock justice of the peace and who had been a chap of some sort or other in india there was a man of the name of singleton who lived in waltham chase and who was deemed to be a great poacher this man having been forcibly ousted by the order of this good lad and some others from an encroachment that he had made in the forest threatened revenge soon after this a horse i forget to whom it belonged was stabbed or shot in the night time in a field singleton was taken up tried at winchester convicted and transported i cannot relate exactly what took place i remember that there were some curious circumstances attending the conviction of this man the people in that neighbourhood were deeply impressed with these circumstances singleton was transported but goodlad and his wife were both dead and buried in less i believe than three months after the departure of poor singleton i do not know that any injustice really was done but i do know that a great impression was produced and a very sorrowful impression too on the minds of the people in that neighbourhood i cannot quit waltham chase without observing that i heard last year that a bill was about to be petitioned for to enclose that chase never was so monstrous a proposition in this world the bishop of winchester is lord of the manor over this chase if the chase be enclosed the timber must be cut down young and old and here are a couple of hundred acres of land worth ten thousand acres of land in the new forest this is as fine timber land as any in the wheels of surrey sussex or kent 
There are two enclosures of about forty acres each, perhaps, that were simply surrounded by a bank being thrown up about twenty years ago, only twenty years ago, and on the poorest part of the chase, too. And these are now as beautiful plantations of young oak trees as man ever set his eyes on, many of them as big or bigger round than my thigh. Therefore, besides the sweeping away of two or three hundred cottages, besides plunging into ruin and misery all these numerous families, here is one of the finest pieces of timber land in the whole kingdom, going to be cut up into miserable clay fields for no earthly purpose, but that of gratifying the stupid greediness of those who think that they must gain, if they are to the breadth of their private fields. But if a thing like this be permitted, we must be prettily furnished with commissioners of woods and forests. I do not believe that they will sit in Parliament and see a bill like this passed, and hold their tongues. But if they were to do it, there is no measure of reproach which they would not merit. Let them go and look at the two plantations of oaks of which I have just spoken, and then let them give their consent to such a bill, if they can. Thursley, Monday evening, 23rd October. When I left Weston, my intention was to go from Hambledon to Up Park, thence to Arundel, thence to Brighton, thence to Eastbourne, thence to Wittersham in Kent, and then by Cranbrook, Tunbridge, Godston, and Reigate to London. But when I got to Botley, and particularly when I got to Hambledon, I found my horse's back so much hurt by the saddle, that I was afraid to take so long a stretch, and therefore resolved to come away straight to this place, to go hence to Reigate, and so to London. Our way, therefore, this morning was over Butser Hill to Petersfield, in the first place, then to Liphook, and then to this place, in all about twenty-four miles. Butser Hill belongs to the back chain of the South Downs, and indeed it terminates that chain to the westward. It is the highest hill in the whole country. Something that Hindhead, which is the famous sand hill over which the Portsmouth Road goes, at sixteen miles to the north of this great chalk hill. Something that Hindhead is the highest hill of the two. Be this as it may, Butser Hill, which is the right-hand hill of the two, between which you go at three miles from Petersfield, going towards Portsmouth. This Butser Hill is, I say, quite high enough, and was more than high enough for us, for it took us up amongst clouds that wet us very nearly to the skin. In going from Mr. Goldsmith's to the hill, it is all uphill for five miles. Now and then a little stoop, not much, but regularly, with these little exceptions, uphill for these five miles. The hill appears at a distance to be a sharp ridge on its top. It is, however, not so. It is in some parts half a mile wide or more. The road lies right along the middle of it from west to east, and just when you are at the highest part of the hill, it is very narrow from north to south, not more, I think, than about a hundred or a hundred and thirty yards. This is as interesting a spot, I think, as the foot of man ever was placed upon. Here are two valleys, one to your right and the other to your left, very little less than half a mile down to the bottom of them, and much steeper than a tiled roof of a house. These valleys may be, where they join the hill, three or four hundred yards broad. They get wider as they get further from the hill. Of a clear day you see all the north of Hampshire, nay the whole county, together with a great part of Surrey and of Sussex. You see the whole of the South Downs to the eastward as far as your eye can carry you, and lastly you see over Portsdown Hill, which lies before you to the south, and there are spread open to your view the Isle of Portsea, Porchester, Wimmering, Fareham, Gosport, Portsmouth, the harbour, Spithead, the Isle of Wight, and the ocean. But something still more interesting occurred to me here in the year 1808, when I was coming on horseback over the same hill from Botley to London. It was a very beautiful day, and in summer. Before I got upon the hill, on which I had never been before, a shepherd told me to keep on in the road in which I was, till I came to the London Turnpike Road. When I got to within a quarter of a mile of this particular point of the hill, I saw at this point what I thought was a cloud of dust, and speaking to my servant about it I found that he thought so too. But this cloud of dust disappeared all at once. Soon after there appeared to arise another cloud of dust at the same place, and then that disappeared and the spot was clear again. As we were trotting along a pretty smart pace, we soon came to this narrow place, having one valley to our right, and the other valley to our left, and there, to my great astonishment, I saw the clouds come one after another, each appearing to be about as big as two or three acres of land, skimming along in the valley on the north side, a great deal below the tops of the hills, and successively as they arrived at our end of the valley, rising up, crossing the narrow pass, and then descending down into the other valley and going off to the south, so that we who sat there upon our horses were alternately in clouds and in sunshine, it is an universal rule that if there be a fog in the morning, and that fog go from the valleys to the tops of the hills, there will be rain that day, and if it disappear by sinking in the valley, 
there will be no rain that day. The truth is that fogs are clouds, and clouds are fogs. They are more or less full of water, but they are all water, sometimes a sort of steam, and sometimes water that falls in drops. Yesterday morning the fogs had ascended to the tops of the hills, and it was raining on all the hills round about us before it began to rain in the valleys. We, as I observed before, got pretty nearly wet to the skin upon the top of Butzer Hill, but we had the pluck to come on and let the clothes dry upon our backs. I must here relate something that appears very interesting to me, and something which, though it must have been seen by every man that has lived in the country, or at least in any hilly country, has never been particularly mentioned by anybody as far as I can recollect. We frequently talk of clouds coming from dews, and we actually see the heavy fogs become clouds. We see them go up to the tops of hills, and taking a swim round, actually come and drop down upon us and wet us through. But I am now going to speak of clouds coming out of the sides of hills, in exactly the same manner that you see smoke come out of a tobacco pipe and rising up with a wider and wider head like the smoke from a tobacco pipe go to the top of the hill or over the hill or very much above it and then come over the valleys in rain at about a mile's distance from mr palmer's house at bollitry in herefordshire there is a large long beautiful wood covering the side of a lofty hill winding round in the form of a crescent the bend of the crescent being towards mr palmer's house it was here that I first observed this mode of forming clouds. The first time I noticed it, I pointed it out to Mr. Palmer. We stood and observed cloud after cloud come out from different parts of the side of the hill, and tower up and go over the hill out of sight. He told me that that was a certain sign that it would rain that day, for that these clouds would come back again and would fall in rain. It rained sure enough, and I found that the country people, all round about, had this mode of the forming of the clouds as a sign of rain. The hill is called Penyard, and this forming of the clouds they call Old Penyard smoking his pipe, and it is a rule that it is sure to rain during the day, if Old Penyard smokes his pipe in the morning. These appearances take place especially in warm and sultry weather. It was very warm yesterday morning. It had thundered violently the evening before. We felt it hot even while the rain fell upon us at Butzer Hill. Petersfield lies in a pretty broad and very beautiful valley. On three sides of it are very lofty hills, partly downs and partly covered with trees, and as we proceeded on our way from the bottom of Butzer Hill to Petersfield, we saw thousands upon thousands of clouds continually coming puffing out from different parts of these hills and towering up to the top of them. I stopped George several times to make him look at them, to see them come puffing out of the chalk downs as well as out of the woodland hills, and bade him remember to tell his father of it when he should get home, to convince him that the hills of Hampshire could smoke their pipes as well as those of Herefordshire. This is a really curious matter. I have never read, in any book, anything to lead me to suppose that the observation has ever found its way into print before. Sometimes you will see only one or two clouds during the a whole morning come out of the side of a hill, but we saw thousands upon thousands bursting out, one after another, in all parts of these immense hills. The first time that I have leisure, when I am in the high countries again, I will have a conversation with some old shepherd about this matter, if he cannot enlighten me upon the subject, I am sure that no philosopher can. We came through Petersfield without stopping, and baited our horses at Lippook, where we stayed about half an hour. In coming from Lippook to this place, we overtook a man who asked for relief. He told me he was a weaver, and as his accent was northern, I was about to give him the balance that I had in hand, arising from our savings in the fasting way, amounting to about three shillings and sixpence. But unfortunately for him, I asked him what place he had lived at as a weaver, and he told me that he was a Spitalfields weaver. I instantly put on my glove, and returned my purse into my pocket, saying, Go then to Sidmouth and Peel and the rest of them, and get relief, for I have this minute, while I was stopping at Lippook, read in the evening mail newspaper, an address to the king from the Spitalfields weavers, for which address they ought to suffer death from starvation. In that address those base wretches tell the king that they were loyal men, that they detested the designing men who were guilty of seditious practices in 1817, they, in short, expressed their approbation of the power of imprisonment bill, of all the deeds committed against the reformers in 1817 and 1819. They, by fair inference, expressed their approbation of the thanks given to the Manchester Yeomanry. You are one of them. My name is William Cobbett, and I would sooner relieve a dog than relieve you. Just as I was closing my harangue, we overtook a countryman and woman that were going the same way. The weaver attempted explanations. He said that they only said it in order to get relief, but that they did not mean it in their hearts. "'Oh, base dog!' said I. "'It is precisely by such men that ruin is brought upon nations. 
it is precisely by such baseness and insincerity such scandalous cowardice that ruin has been brought upon them i had two or three shillings to give you i had them in my hand i have put them back into my purse i trust i shall find somebody more worthy of them rather than give them to you i would fling them into that sand-pit and bury them for ever how curiously things happen it was by mere accident that i took up a newspaper to read it was merely because i was compelled to stay a quarter of an hour in the room without doing anything and above all things it was miraculous that i should take up the evening mail into which i believe i never before looked in my whole life i saw the royal arms at the top of the paper took it for the old times and in a sort of lounging mood said to george give me hold of that paper and let us see what that foolish devil anna brodie says seeing the word spitalfields i read on till i got to the base and scoundrelly part of the address i then turned over and looked at the title of the paper and the date of it resolving in my mind to have satisfaction of some sort or other upon these base vagabonds little did i think that an opportunity would so soon occur of showing my resentment against them and that too in so striking so appropriate and so efficient a manner i dare say that it was some tax-eating scoundrel who drew up this address which i will insert in the register as soon as i can find it but that is nothing to me and my fellow sufferers of eighteen seventeen and eighteen nineteen this infamous libel upon us is published under the name of the spitalfields weavers and if i am asked what the poor creatures were to do being without bread as they were i answer by asking whether they could find no knives to cut their throats with seeing that they ought to have cut their throats ten thousand times over if they could have done it rather than sanction the publication of so infamous a paper as this it is not thus that the weavers in the north have acted some scoundrel wanted to inveigle them into an applauding of the ministers but they though nothing so infamous as this address was proposed to them rejected the proposition though they were ten times more in want than the weavers of spitalfields have ever been they were only called upon to applaud the ministers for the recent orders in council but they justly said that the ministers had a great deal more to do before they would merit their applause what would these brave and sensible men have said to a tax-eating scoundrel who should have called upon them to present an address to the king and in that address to applaud the terrible deeds committed against the people in eighteen seventeen and eighteen nineteen I have great happiness in reflecting that this baseness of the Spitalfields weavers will not bring them one single mouthful of bread. This will be their lot. This will be the fruit of their baseness. And the nation, the working classes of the nation, will learn from this that the way to get redress of their grievances, the way to get food and raiment in exchange for their labour, the way to ensure good treatment from the government, is not to crawl to that government, to lick its hands and seem to deem it an honour to be its slaves. Before we got to Thursley I saw three poor fellows getting in turf for their winter fuel, and I gave them a shilling apiece. To a boy at the bottom of Hindhead I gave the other sixpence, towards buying him a pair of gloves, and thus I disposed of the money which was at one time actually out of my purse, and going into the hand of the loyal Spitalfields weaver. We got to this place, Mr. Knowles's of Thursley, about five o'clock in the evening, very much delighted with our ride. Kensington, Thursday, 26th October we left at Mr. Knowles's on Thursday morning, came through Godalming, stopped at Mr. Rowland's at Chilworth, and then came on through Dorking to Colley Farm near Reigate, where we slept. I have so often described the country from Hindhead to the foot of Reigate Hill, and from the top of Reigate Hill to the Thames, that I shall not attempt to do it again here. When we got to the River Way, we crossed it from Godalming Pismarsh to come up to Chilworth. I desired George to look round the country, and asked him if he did not think it was very pretty. I put the same question to him when we got into the beautiful neighbourhood of Dorking, and when we got to Reigate, and especially when we got to the tip-top of Reigate Hill, from which there is one of the finest views in the whole world. But ever after our quitting Mr. Knowles's, George insisted that that was the prettiest country that we had seen in the course of our whole ride, and that he liked Mr. Knowles's place better than any other place that he had seen. I reminded him of Weston Grove, and I reminded him of the beautiful ponds and grass and plantations at Mr. Leach's, but he still persisted in his judgment in favour of Mr. Knowles's place, in which decision, however, the greyhounds and the beagles had manifestly a great deal to do. From Thursley to Reigate inclusive, on the chalk side, as well as on the sand side, the crops of turnips of both kinds were pretty nearly as good as I ever saw them in my life. On a farm of Mr. Drummond's at Albury, rented by a farmer Petto, I saw a piece of cabbages of the large kind which will produce, I should think, not much short of five and twenty tons to the acre and here i must mention i do not know why i must by the by an instance of my own skill in measuring land by the eye the cabbages stand upon half a field and on the part of it furthest from the road where we were 
We took the liberty to open the gate and ride into the field, in order to get closer to the cabbages to look at them. I intended to notice this piece of cabbages, and I asked George how much ground he thought there was in the piece. He said two acres, and asked me how much I thought. I said that there were above four acres, and that I should not wonder if there were four acres and a half. Thus divided in judgment, we turned away from the cabbages to go out of the field at another gate, which pointed towards our road. Near this gate we found a man turning a heap of manure. This man, as it happened, had hoed the cabbages by the acre, or had had a hand in it. We asked him how much ground there was in that piece of cabbages, and he told us, four acres and a half. I suppose it will not be difficult to convince the reader that George looked upon me as a sort of conjurer. At Mr. Pym's at Colley Farm, we found one of the very finest pieces of mangle wurzel that I had ever seen in my life. We calculated that there would be little short of forty tons to the acre, and there being three acres to the piece, Mr. Pym calculates that this mangle wurzel, the produce of these three acres of land, will carry his ten or twelve milk cows nearly, if not wholly, through the winter. There did not appear to be a spurious plant, and there was not one plant that had gone to seed in the whole piece. I have never seen a more beautiful mass of vegetation, and I had the satisfaction to learn, after having admired the crop, that the seed came from my own shop, and that it had been saved by myself. Talking of the shop, I came to it in a very few hours after looking at this mangle wurzel, and I soon found that it was high time for me to get home again, for here had been pretty devil's works going on. Here I found the Greek cause in all its appendages, figuring away in grand style. But I must make this matter of separate observation. I have put an end to my ride of August, September, and October, 1826, during which I have travelled 568 miles, and have slept in 30 different beds, having written three monthly pamphlets, called The Poor Man's Friend, and have also written, including the present one, 11 registers. I have been in three cities, in about 20 market towns, in perhaps 500 villages, and I have seen the people nowhere so well off as in the neighbourhood of Weston Grove, and nowhere so badly off as in the dominions of the select vestry of Hurstbourne Tarrant, commonly called up husband. During the whole of this ride I have very rarely been abed after daylight. I have drunk neither wine nor spirits. I have eaten no vegetables, and only a very moderate quantity of meat. And it may be useful to my readers to know that the riding of twenty miles was not so fatiguing to me at the end of my tour as the riding of ten miles was at the beginning of it. Some ill-natured fools will call this egotism. Why is it egotism? Getting upon a good strong horse and riding about the country has no merit in it. There is no conjuration in it. It requires neither talents nor virtues of any sort. But health is a very valuable thing. And when a man has had the experience which I have had in this instance, it is his duty to state to the world, and to his own countrymen and neighbours in particular, the happy effects of early rising, sobriety, abstinence, and a resolution to be active. It is his duty to do this, and it becomes imperatively his duty, when he has seen in the course of his life so many men, so many men of excellent hearts and of good talents, rendered prematurely old, cut off ten or twenty years before their time, by a want of that early rising, sobriety, abstinence, and activity, from which he himself has derived so much benefit and such inexpressible pleasure. During this ride I have been several times wet to the skin, at some times of my life, after having indulged for a long while in coddling myself up in the house, these soakings would have frightened me half out of my senses. But I care very little about them. I avoid getting wet if I can, but it is very seldom that rain, come when it would, has prevented me from performing the day's journey that I had laid out beforehand. And this is a very good rule, to stick to your intention, whether it be attended with inconveniences or not, to look upon yourself as bound to do it. In the whole of this ride I have met with no one untoward circumstance, properly so called, except the wounding of the back of my horse, which grieved me much more on his account than on my own. I have a friend who, when he is disappointed in accomplishing anything that he has laid out, says that he has been beaten, which is a very good expression for the thing. I was beaten, in my intention to go through Sussex and Kent, but I will retrieve the affair in a very few months' time, or perhaps few weeks. The collective will be here now in a few days, and as soon as I have got the Preston petition fairly before them, and find, as I dare say I shall, that the petition will not be tried until February, I shall take my horse and set off again to that very spot in the London Turnpike Road, at the foot of Butser Hill, whence I turned off to go to Petersfield, instead of turning the other way to go to Up Park. I shall take my horse and go to this spot, and with a resolution not to be beaten next time, go along through the whole length of Sussex, and sweep round through Kent and Surrey, till I come to Reigate again, and then home to Kensington, 
for I do not like to be beaten by horses sore back, or by anything else. And besides that, there are several things in Sussex and Kent that I want to see and give an account of. For the present, however, farewell to the country, and now for the wen and its villainous corruptions. End of chapter 28《Chapters 29 and 30 of Rural Rides》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter 29 Rural Ride to Tring in Hertfordshire. Barn Elm Farm, 23rd September, 1829. As if to prove the truth of all that has been said in the woodlands about the impolicy of cheap planting, as it is called, Mr. Elliman has planted another and larger field with a mixture of ash, locusts, and larches, not upon trench ground, but upon ground moved with a plough. The larches made great haste to depart this life, bequeathing to Mr. Elliman a very salutary lesson. The ash appeared to be alive, and that is all. The locusts, though they had to share in all the disadvantages of their neighbours, appeared, it seems, to be doing pretty well, and had made decent shoots, when a neighbour's sheep invaded the plantation, and being fond of the locust leaves and shoots, as all cattle are, reduced them to mere stumps, as it were to put them upon a level with the ash. In the woodlands I have strongly pressed the necessity of effectual fences. Without these you plant and sow in vain. You plant and sow the plants and seeds of disappointment and mortification and the earth, being always grateful, is sure to reward you with a plentiful crop. One half acre of Mr. Elliman's plantation of locusts before mentioned, time will tell him, is worth more than the whole of the six or seven acres of this cheaply planted field. Besides the twenty-five thousand trees which Mr. Elliman had from me, he had some, and a part of them fine plants, which he himself had raised from seed, in the manner described in the woodlands, under the head locust. This seed he bought from me, and— as I shall sell but a very few more locust plants, I recommend gentlemen to sow the seed for themselves, according to the directions given in the woodlands, in paragraphs 383 to 386 inclusive. In that part of the woodlands will be found the most minute directions for the sowing of this seed, and particularly in the preparing of it for sowing, for, unless the proper precautions are taken here, one seed out of one hundred will not come up, and with the proper precautions, one seed in one hundred will not fail to come up. I beg the reader who intends to sow locusts to read with great care the latter part of paragraph 368 of the Woodlands. At this town of Tring, which is a very pretty and respectable place, I saw what reminded me of another of my endeavours to introduce useful things into this country. At the door of a shop I saw a large case with the lid taken off, containing bundles of straw for plaiting. It was straw of spring wheat tied up in small bundles with the ear on, just such as I myself have grown in England many times, and bleached for plaiting according to the instructions so elaborately given in the last edition of my cottage economy, and which instructions I was enabled to give from the information collected by my son in America. I asked the shopkeeper where he got this straw. He said that it came from Tuscany, and that it was manufactured there at Tring and other places, for, as I understood, some single individual master manufacturer. I told the shopkeeper that I wondered that they should send to Tuscany for the straw, seeing that it might be grown, harvested, and equally well bleached at Tring, that it was now at this time grown, bleached, and manufactured into bonnets in Kent, and I showed to several persons at Tring a bonnet made in Kent, from the straw of wheat grown in Kent, and presented by that most public-spirited and excellent man, Mr. John Wood of Wettersham, who died to the great sorrow of the whole country round about him, three or four years ago. He had taken infinite pains with this matter, had brought a young woman from Suffolk at his own expense, to teach the children at Wettersham the whole of this manufacture from beginning to end, and before he died he saw as handsome bonnets made as ever came from Tuscany. At Benenden, the parish in which Mr. Hodges resides, there is now a manufactory of the same sort begun in the first place, under the benevolent auspices of that gentleman's daughters, who began by teaching a poor fellow who had been a cripple from his infancy, who was living with a poor widowed mother, and who is now the master of a school of this description, in the beautiful villages of Benenden and Rolvenden, in Kent. My wife, wishing to have her bonnet cleaned some time ago, applied to a person who performed such work at Brighton, and got into a conversation with her about the English leghorn bonnets. 
The woman told her that they looked very well at first, but that they would not retain their colour, and added, They will not clean, ma'am, like this bonnet that you have. She was left with a request to clean that, and the result being the same as with all Leghorn bonnets, she was surprised upon being told that was an English Leghorn. In short, there is no difference at all in the two. And if these people at Tring choose to grow the straw instead of importing it from Leghorn, and if they choose to make plat and to make bonnets just as beautiful and as lasting as those which come from Leghorn, they have nothing to do but to read my cottage economy. Paragraph 224 to paragraph 234 inclusive where they will find, as plain as words can make it, the whole mass of directions for taking the seed of the wheat and converting the produce into bonnets. There they will find directions first as to the sort of wheat, second as to the proper land for growing the wheat, third season for sowing, fourth quantity of seed to the acre and manner of sowing, fifth season for cutting the wheat, sixth manner of cutting it, seventh manner of bleaching, eighth manner of housing the straw, ninth plaiting, tenth manner of knitting, eleventh manner of pressing i request my correspondents to inform me if any one can where i can get some spring wheat the botanical name of it is triticum aestivum it is sown in the spring at the same time that barley is these latin words mean summer wheat it is a small grain bearded wheat i know from experience that the little brown grained winter wheat is just as good for the purpose but that must be sown earlier and there is danger of its being thinned on the ground by worms and other enemies I should like to sow some this next spring in order to convince the people of Tring and other places that they need not go to Tuscany for the straw. Of Cobbett's corn there is no considerable piece in the neighbourhood of Tring, but I saw some plants even upon the high hill where the locusts are growing, and which is very backward land, which appear to be about as forward as my own is at this time. If Mr. Elliman were to have a patch of good corn by the side of his locust trees, and a piece of spring wheat by the side of the corn, People might then go and see specimens of the three great undertakings, or rather great additions to the wealth of the nation, introduced under the name of Cobbett. I am the more desirous of introducing this manufacture at Tring, on account of the very marked civility which I met with at that place. A very excellent friend of mine, who is professionally connected with that town, was, some time ago, apprised of my intention of going thither to see Mr. Elliman's plantation. He had mentioned this intention to some gentlemen of that town and neighbourhood, and I, to my great surprise, found that a dinner had been organised to which I was to be invited. I never liked to disappoint anybody, and therefore to this dinner I went. The company consisted of about forty-five gentlemen of the town and neighbourhood, and certainly, though I have been at dinners in several parts of England, I never found, even in Sussex, where I have frequently been so delighted, a more sensible, hearty, entertaining, and hospitable company than this. From me something in the way of speech was expected as a matter of course, and though I was from a cold so hoarse as not to be capable of making myself heard in a large place, I was so pleased with the company and with my reception that, first and last, I dare say I addressed the company for an hour and a half. We dined at two and separated at nine, and, as I declared at parting, for many, many years I had not spent a happier day. There was present the editor, or some other gentleman, from the newspaper called The Bucks Gazette and General Advertiser, who has published in his paper the following account of what passed at the dinner. As far as the report goes, it is substantially correct, and though this gentleman went away at a very early hour, that which he has given of my speech, which he has given very judiciously, contains matter which can hardly fail to be useful to great numbers of his readers. Mr. Cobbett at Tring Mr. Elliman, a draper at Tring, has lately formed a considerable plantation of the locust tree, which Mr. Cobbett claims the merit of having introduced into this country. The number he has planted is about thirty thousand, on five acres and a half of very indifferent land, and they have thrived so uncommonly well, that not more than five hundred of the whole number have failed. The success of the plantation being made known to Mr. Cobbett, induced him to pay a visit to Tring to inspect it, and during his sojourn it was determined upon by his friends to give him a dinner at the Rose and Crown Inn. Thursday was fixed for the purpose, when about forty persons, agriculturists and tradesmen of Tring and the neighbouring towns, assembled and sat down to a dinner served up in very excellent style by mr northwood the landlord mr faithful solicitor of tring is the chair the usual routine toast having been given the chairman said he was sure the company would drink the toast with which he should conclude what he was about to say with every mark of respect in addressing the company he rose under feelings of no ordinary kind for he was about to give the health of a gentleman who had the talent of communicating to his writings an energy and perspicuity which he had never met with elsewhere, who conveyed knowledge in a way so clear that all who read could understand. 
he the chairman had read the political register from the first of them to the last with pleasure and benefit to himself and he would defy any man to put his finger upon a single line which was not in direct support of a kingly government he advocated the rights of the people but he always expressed himself favourable to our ancient form of government he certainly had strongly but not too strongly attacked the corruption of the government but had never attacked its form or its just powers as a public writer he considered him the most impartial that he knew he well recollected he knew not if mr cobbett himself recollected it a remarkable passage in his writings he was speaking of the pleasure of passing from censure to praise and thus expressed himself it is turning from the frowns of a surly winter to welcome a smiling spring come dancing over the daisied lawn crowned with garlands and surrounded with melody nature had been bountiful to him it had blessed him with a constitution capable of enduring the greatest fatigues and a mind of superior order brilliancy it was said was a mere meteor it was so it was the solidity and depth of understanding such as he possessed that were really valuable he had visited this place in consequence of a gentleman having been wise and bold enough to listen to his advice and to plant a large number of locust trees and he trusted he would enjoy prosperity and happiness in duration equal to that of the never decaying wood of those trees he concluded by giving mr cobbett's health mr cobbett returned thanks for the manner in which his health had been drunk and was certain that the trees which had been the occasion of their meeting would be a benefit to the children of the planter though it might appear like presumption to suppose that those who were assembled that day came solely in compliment to him yet it would be affectation not to believe that it was expected he should say something on the subject of politics every one who heard him was convinced that there was something wrong and that a change of some sort must take place or ruin to the country would ensue though there was a diversity of opinions as to the cause of the distress and as to the means by which a change might be effected and though some were not so deeply affected by it as others all now felt that a change must take place before long whether they were manufacturers brewers butchers bakers or of any other description of persons they had all arrived at the conviction that there must be a change it would be presumptuous to suppose that many of those assembled did not understand the cause of the present distress yet there were many who did not and those gentlemen who did he begged to have the goodness to excuse him if he repeated what they already knew politics was a science which they ought not to have the trouble of studying they had sufficient to do in their respective avocations without troubling themselves with such matters for what were the ministers and a whole tribe of persons under them paid large sums of money from the country but for the purpose of governing its political affairs their fitness for their stations was another thing he had been told that mr huskisson was so ignorant of the cause of the distress that he had openly said he should be glad if any practical man would tell him what it all meant if any man present were to profess his ignorance of the cause of the distress it would be no disgrace to him he might be a very good butcher a very good farmer or a very good baker he might well understand the business by which he gained his living and if any one should say to him because he did not understand politics you are a very stupid fellow he might fairly reply what is that to you but it was another thing to those who were so well paid to manage the affairs of the country to plead ignorance of the cause of the prevailing distress mr gulburn with a string of figures as long as his arm had endeavoured to prove in the house of commons that the withdrawal of the one pound notes being altogether so small an amount little more than two millions would be of no injury to the country and that its only effect would be to make bankers more liberal in discounting with their fives he would appeal to the company if they had found this to be the case mr gulburn had forgotten that the one pound notes were the legs upon which the fives walked he had heard the duke of wellington use the same language in the other house taught as they now were by experience it would scarcely be believed fifty years hence that a set of men could have been found with so little foresight as to have devised measures so fraught with injury he felt convinced that if he looked to the present company or any other accidentally assembled that he would find thirteen gentlemen more fit to manage the affairs of the kingdom than were those who now presided at the head of government not that he imputed to them any desire to do wrong or that they were more corrupt than others it was clear that with the eyes of the public upon them they must wish to do right it was owing to their sheer ignorance their entire unfitness to carry on the government that they did no better ignorance and unfitness were however pleas which they had no business to make it was nothing to him if a man was ignorant and stupid under ordinary circumstances but if he entrusted a man with his money thinking that he was intelligent and was deceived then it was something he had a right to say you are not what i took you for you are an ignorant fellow you have deceived me you are an impostor such was the language proper to all under such circumstances never mind their titles 
A friend had that morning taken him to view the beautiful vale of Aylesbury, which he had never before seen, and the first thought that struck him on seeing the rich pasture was this. Good God! Is a country like this to be ruined by the folly of those who govern it? When he was a naughty boy, he used to say that if he wanted to select members for our Houses of Parliament, he would put a string across any road leading into London, and that the first thousand men that ran against his string he would choose for members, and he would better wager that they would be better qualified than those who now fill those houses. That was when he was a naughty boy, but since that time a bill had been passed, which made it banishment for life to use language that brought the Houses of Parliament into contempt, and therefore he did not say so now. The government, it should be recollected, had passed all these acts with a hearty concurrence of both Houses of Parliament. They were thus backed by these Houses, and they were backed by ninety-nine out of one hundred of the papers, which affected to see all their acts in rose colour, for no one who was in the habit of reading the papers could have anticipated from what they there saw the ruin which had fallen on the country. Thus we had an ignorant government, an ignorant parliament, and something worse than an ignorant press, the latter being employed, some of them with considerable talent, to assail and turn into ridicule those who had the boldness and honesty to declare their dissent from the opinion of the wisdom of the measures of government. It was no easy task to stand unmoved to their ridicule and sarcasms, and many were thus deterred from expressing the sentiments of their minds. In this country we had all the elements of prosperity, an industrious people such as were nowhere else to be found, a country too which was once called the finest and greatest on the earth, for whatever might be said of the country in comparison with others, the turnips of England were worth more this year than all the vines of France. It was a glorious and a great country until the government had made it otherwise and it ought still to be what it once was, and to be capable of driving the Russians back from the country of our old and best ally, the Turks. During the time of war we were told that it was necessary to make great sacrifices to save us from disgrace. The people made those sacrifices. They gave up their all. But had the government done its part? Had it saved us from disgrace? No. We were now the laughing stock of all other countries. The French and all other nations derided us, and by and by it would be seen that they would make a partition of Turkey with the Russians, and make a fresh subject for laughter. Never since the time of Charles had such disgrace been brought upon the country. And why was this? When were we again to see the labourer receiving his wages from the farmer, instead of being sent on the road to break stones? Some people, under this state of things, consoled themselves by saying things would come about again. They had come about before, and would come about again. They deceived themselves. Things did not come about. The seasons came about, it was true, but something must be done to bring things about. Instead of the neuter verb, to speak as a grammarian, they should use the active. They should not say things will come about, but things must be put about. He thought that the distress would shortly become so great, perhaps, about Christmas, that the parliamentary gentlemen, finding they received but a small part of their rents, without which they could not do any more than the farmer without his crops, would endeavour to bring them about and the measures they would propose for that purpose, as far as he could judge, would be bank restriction, and the reissue of one-pound notes, and what the effect of that would be they would soon see. One of those persons who were so profoundly ignorant would come down to the house prepared to propose a return to bank restriction, and the issue of small notes, and a bill to that effect would be passed. If such a bill did pass, he would advise all persons to be cautious in their dealings. It would be perilous to make bargains under such a state of things." Money was the measure of value, but if this measure was liable to be three times as large at one time as at another, who could know what to do? How was any one to know how to purchase wheat, if the bushel was to be altered at the pleasure of the government to three times its present size? The remedy for the evils of the country was not to be found in palliatives. It was not to be found in strong measures. The first step must be taken in the House of Commons, but that was almost hopeless. For although many persons possessed the right of voting, it was of little use to them, whilst a few great men could render their votes of no avail. If we had possessed a House of Commons that represented the feelings and wishes of the people, they would not have submitted to much of what had taken place. And until we had a reform, we should never, he believed, see measures emanating from that House which would conduce to the glory and safety of the country. He feared that there would be no improvement until a dreadful convulsion took place, and that was an event which he prayed God to avert from the country. The chairman proposed prosperity to agriculture when— Mr. Cobbett again rose, and said the chairman had told him he was entitled to give a sentiment. He would give prosperity to the towns of Aylesbury and Tring, but he would again advise those who calculated upon the return of prosperity to be careful. Until there was an equitable adjustment, or government took off part of the taxes, 
which was the same thing, there could be no return of prosperity. After the reporter went away, we had a great number of toasts, most of which were followed by more or less of speech, and before we separated, I think that the seeds of common sense on the subject of our distresses were pretty well planted in the lower part of Hertfordshire and in Buckinghamshire. The gentlemen present were men of information, well able to communicate to others that which they themselves had heard, and I endeavoured to leave no doubt in the mind of any man that heard me that the cause of the distress was the work of the government and House of Commons, and that it was nonsense to hope for a cure until the people had a real voice in the choosing of that house. I think that these truths were well implanted, and I further think that if I could go to the capital of every county in the kingdom, I should leave no doubt in the minds of any part of the people. I must not omit to mention, in conclusion, that though I am no eater or drinker, and though I tasted nothing but the breast of a little chicken, and drank nothing but water, the dinner was the best that ever I saw called a public dinner, and certainly unreasonably cheap. There were excellent joints of meat of the finest description, fowls and geese in abundance, and finally a very fine haunch of venison, with a bottle of wine for each person, and all for seven shillings and sixpence per head. Good waiting upon, civil landlord and landlady, and in short everything at this very pretty town pleased me exceedingly. Yet what is Tring but a fair specimen of English towns and English people? And is it right, and is it to be suffered, that such a people should be plunged into misery by the acts of those whom they pay so generously, and whom they so loyally and cheerfully obey? As far as I had opportunity of ascertaining the facts, the farmers feel all the pinchings of distress, and the still harsher pinchings of anxiety for the future, and the labouring people are suffering in a degree not to be described. The shutting of the male paupers up in pounds is common through Bedfordshire and Buckinghamshire. Left at large during the day, they roam about and maraud. What are the farmers to do with them? God knows how long the peace is to be kept, if this state of things be not put a stop to. The natural course of things is that an attempt to impound the paupers in cold weather will produce resistance in some place, that those of one parish will be joined by those of another, that a formidable band will soon be assembled, then will ensue the rummaging of pantries and cellars, that this will spread from parish to parish, and that finally mobs of immense magnitude will set the law at open defiance. Jails are next to useless in such a case. Their want of room must leave the greater part of the offenders at large. The agonising distress of the farmers will make them comparatively indifferent with regard to these violences, and at last general confusion will come. This is by no means an unlikely progress, or an unlikely result. It therefore becomes those who have much at stake, to join heartily in their applications to government for a timely remedy for these astounding evils. End of chapter 29 Rural Rides by William Cobbett, chapter 30 Northern Tour Sheffield, 31st January, 1830 On the 26th instant, I gave my third lecture at Leeds. I should in vain endeavour to give an adequate description of the pleasure which I felt at my reception, and at the effect which I produced in that fine and opulent capital of this great county of York, for the capital it is in fact, though not in name. On the first evening the playhouse, which is pretty spacious, was not completely filled in all its parts, but on the second and the third it was filled brimful, boxes, pit, and gallery, besides a dozen or two of gentlemen who were accommodated with seats on the stage. Owing to a cold which I took at Huddersfield, and which I spoke of before, I was, as the players call it, not in very good voice. But the audience made allowance for that, and very wisely preferred sense to sound. I never was more delighted than with my audience at Leeds, and what I set the highest value on is that I find I produced a prodigious effect in that important town. There had been a meeting at Doncaster a few days before I went to Leeds from Ripley, where one of the speakers, a Mr. Beckett Denison, had said, speaking of the taxes, that there must be an application of the pruning-hook or of the sponge. This gentleman is a banker, I believe. He is one of the Becketts connected with the Lowthers, and he is a brother or very near relation of that Sir John Beckett, who is the Judge Advocate General, so that at last others can talk of the pruning-hook and the sponge as well as I. From Leeds I proceeded on to this place, not being able to stop at either Wakefield or Barnsley, except merely to change horses. The people in those towns were apprised of the time that I should pass through them, and at each place great numbers assembled to see me, to shake me by the hand, and to request me to stop. I was so hoarse as not to be able to make the post-boy hear me when I called to him, and therefore it would have been useless to stop. Yet I promised to go back if my time and my voice would allow me. 
They do not, and I have written to the gentlemen of those places to inform them, that when I go to Scotland in the spring I will not fail to stop in those towns, in order to express my gratitude to them. All the way along, from Leeds to Sheffield, it is coal and iron, and iron and coal. It was dark before we reached Sheffield, so that we saw the iron furnaces in all the horrible splendour of their everlasting blaze. Nothing can be conceived more grand or more terrific than the yellow waves of fire that incessantly issue from the top of these furnaces, some of which are close by the wayside. Nature has placed the beds of iron and the beds of coal alongside of each other, and art has taught man to make one to operate upon the other, as to turn the iron stone into liquid matter, which is drained off from the bottom of the furnace, and afterwards moulded into blocks and bars and all sorts of things. The combustibles are put into the top of the furnace, which stands thirty, forty, or fifty feet up in the air, and the ever-blazing mouth of which is kept supplied with coal and coke and ironstone, from little iron wagons forced up by steam and brought down again to be refilled. It is a surprising thing to behold, and it is impossible to behold it without being convinced that, whatever other nations may do with cotton and with wool, they will never equal England with regard to things made of iron and steel. This Sheffield and the land all about it is one bed of iron and coal. They call it Black Sheffield, and black enough it is. But from this one town and its environs go nine-tenths of the knives that are used in the whole world, there being, I understand, no knives made at Birmingham, the manufacture of which place consists of the larger sort of implements, of locks of all sorts, and guns and swords, and of all the endless articles of hardware which go to the furnishing of a house. As to the land, viewed in the way of agriculture, it really does appear to be very little worth. I have not seen, except at Harewood and Ripley, a stack of wheat since I came into Yorkshire, and even there the whole I saw, and all that I have seen since I came into Yorkshire, and all that I saw during a ride of six miles that I took into Derbyshire the day before yesterday, all put together would not make the one half of what I have many times seen in one single rickyard of the vales of Wiltshire. But this is all very proper. These coal-diggers and iron-melters and knife-makers compel us to send the food to them, which, indeed, we do very cheerfully, in exchange for the produce of their rocks and the wondrous works of their hands. The trade of Sheffield has fallen off less in proportion than that of the other manufacturing districts. North America, and particularly the United States, where the people have so much victuals to cut, form a great branch of the custom of this town. If the people of Sheffield could only receive a tenth part of what their knives sell for by retail in America, Sheffield might pave its streets with silver. A gross of knives and forks is sold to the Americans, for less than three knives and forks can be bought at retail in a country store in America. No fear of rivalship in this trade. The Americans may lay on their tariff and double it and triple it, but as long as they continue to cut their victuals, from Sheffield they must have the things to cut it with. The ragged hills all round about this town are bespangled with groups of houses inhabited by the working cutlers. They have not suffered like the working weavers, for to make knives there must be the hand of man. Therefore machinery cannot come to destroy the wages of the labourer. The home demand has been very much diminished, but still the depression has here not been what it has been and what it is, where the machinery can be brought into play. We are here just upon the borders of Derbyshire, a nook of which runs up and separates Yorkshire from Nottinghamshire. I went to a village the day before yesterday called Mosborough, the whole of the people of which are employed in the making of sickles and scythes, and where, as I was told, they are very well off even in these times. A prodigious quantity of these things go to the United States of America. In short, there are about twelve millions of people there continually consuming these things, and the hardware merchants here have their agents and their stores in the great towns of America, which country, as far as relates to this branch of business, is still a part of old England. Upon my arriving here on Wednesday night, the twenty-seventh instant, I by no means intended to lecture until I should be a little recovered from my cold, but to my great mortification I found that the lecture had been advertised, and that great numbers of persons had actually assembled. To send them out again and give back the money was a thing not to be attempted. I therefore went to the music-hall, the place which had been taken for the purpose, gave them a specimen of the state of my voice, asked them whether I should proceed, and they, answering in the affirmative, on I went. I then rested until yesterday, and shall conclude my labours here to-morrow, and then proceed to fair Nottingham, as we used to sing when I was a boy, in celebrating the glorious exploits of Robin Hood and Little John. By the by, as we went from Huddersfield to Dewsbury, we passed by a hill which is celebrated as being the burial-place of the famed Robin Hood, of whom the people in this country talk to this day. At Nottingham they have advertised for my lecturing at the playhouse, 
for the third, fourth, and fifth of February, and for a public breakfast to be given to me on the first of those days, I having declined a dinner agreeably to my original notification, and my friends insisting upon something or other in that sort of way. It is very curious that I have always had a very great desire to see Nottingham. This desire certainly originated in the great interest that I used to take, and that all country boys took, in the history of Robin Hood, in the record of whose achievements, which were so well calculated to excite admiration in the country boys, this Nottingham, with the word fair always before it, was so often mentioned. The word fair, as used by our forefathers, meant fine, for we frequently read in old descriptions of parts of the country, of such a district or such a parish, containing a fair mansion, and the like, so that this town appears to have been celebrated as a very fine place, even in ancient times. But within the last thirty years Nottingham has stood high in my estimation, from the conduct of its people, from their public spirit, from their excellent sense as to public matters, from the noble struggle which they have made from the beginning of the French war to the present hour. If only forty towns in England equal in size to Nottingham had followed its bright example, there would have been no French war against liberty, the debt would have been now nearly paid off, and we should have known nothing of those manifold miseries which now afflict, and those greater miseries which now menace, the country. The French would not have been in Cadiz, the Russians would not have been at Constantinople, the Americans would not have been in the Floridas, we should not have had to dread the combined fleets of America, France, and Russia, and which is the worst of all, we should not have seen the jails four times as big as they were, and should not have seen Englishmen reduced to such a state of misery as for the honest labouring man to be fed worse than the felons in the jails. End of chapter 30《ハッピーナイトの日本語で、This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. r u r a l Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter 31, Part 1. Eastern Tour. You permit the Jews openly to preach in their synagogues, and call Jesus Christ an impostor. And you send women to jail, to be brought to bed there too, for declaring their unbelief in Christianity. King of Bohemia's Letter to Canning, published in the Register, 4th of January, 1823. Harfham, 22nd March, 1830. I set off from London on the 8th of March, got to Bury St. Edmunds that evening, and to my great mortification saw the county election and the assizes both going on at Chelmsford, where, of course, a great part of the people of Essex were met. If I had been aware of that, I should certainly have stopped at Chelmsford, in order to address a few words of sense to the unfortunate constituents of Mr. Weston. At Bury St. Edmunds I gave a lecture on the ninth and another on the 10th of March, in the playhouse, to very crowded audiences. I went to Norwich on the 12th, and gave a lecture there on that evening, and on the evening of the 13th. The audience here was more numerous than at Bury St. Edmunds, but not so numerous in proportion to the size of the place, and contrary to what has happened in most other places, it consisted more of townspeople than of country people. During the 14th and 15th I was at a friend's house at Yelverton, halfway between Norwich and Bungay, which last is in Suffolk, and at which place I lectured on the 16th to an audience consisting chiefly of farmers, and was entertained there in a most hospitable and kind manner at the house of a friend. The next day, being the 17th, I went to I and there lectured in the evening in the neat little playhouse of the place, which was crowded in every part, stage and all. The audience consisted almost entirely of farmers, who had come in from Dis, from Harleston, and from all the villages round about, in this fertile and thickly settled neighbourhood. I stayed at I all the day of the 18th, having appointed to be at Ipswich on the 19th. I is a beautiful little place, though an exceedingly rotten borough. All was harmony and good humour, everybody appeared to be of one mind. And as these friends observed to me, so I thought, that more effect had been produced by this one lecture in that neighbourhood than could have been produced in a whole year, if the register had been put into the hands of every one of the hearers during that space of time. For though I never attempt to put forth that sort of stuff which the intense people on the other side of St. George's Channel call eloquence, I bring out strings of very interesting facts, I use pretty powerful arguments, and I hammer them down so closely upon the mind, that they seldom fail to produce a lasting impression. On the 19th I proceeded to Ipswich, 
not imagining it to be the fine, populous, and beautiful place that I found it to be. On that night, and on the night of the twentieth, I lectured to boxes and pit, crowded principally with opulent farmers, and to a gallery filled, apparently, with journeymen tradesmen and their wives. On the Sunday before I came away, I heard from all quarters that my audiences had retired deeply impressed with the truths which I had endeavoured to inculcate. One thing, however, occurred towards the close of the lecture of Saturday the twentieth, that I deem worthy of particular attention. In general it would be useless for me to attempt to give anything like a report of these speeches of mine, consisting as they do of words uttered pretty nearly as fast as I can utter them, during a space of never less than two, and sometimes of nearly three hours. But there occurred here something that I must notice. I was speaking of the degrees by which the established church had been losing its legal influence since the peace. First the Unitarian Bill, removing the Penal Act, which forbade an impugning of the doctrine of the Trinity. Second, the repeal of the Test Act, which declared, in effect, that the religion of any of the dissenters was as good as that of the Church of England. Third, the repeal of the penal and excluding laws, with regard to the Catholics, and this last act, said I, does in effect declare that the thing called the Reformation was unnecessary. No, said one gentleman, in a very loud voice, and he was followed by four or five more, who said, No, no. Then, said I, we will, if you like, put it to the vote. Understand, gentlemen, that I do not say, whatever I may think, that the Reformation was unnecessary, but I say that this act amounts to a declaration that it was unnecessary, and without losing our good humour we will, if that gentleman choose, put this question to the vote. I paused a little while, receiving no answer, and perceiving that the company were with me, I proceeded with my speech, concluding with the complete demolishing blow which the Church would receive by the bill for giving civil and political power for training to the bar, and seating on the bench, for placing in the commons and amongst the peers, and for placing in the council, along with the king himself, those who deny that there ever existed a redeemer, who give the name of impostor to him whom we worship as God, and who boast of having hanged him upon the cross. Judge you, gentlemen, said I, of the figure which England will make when its laws will seat on the bench, from which people have been sentenced to suffer most severely for denying the truth of Christianity, from which bench it has been held that Christianity is part and parcel of the law of the land, Judge you of the figure which England will make amongst Christian nations, when a Jew, a blasphemer of Christ, a professor of the doctrines of those who murdered him, shall be sitting upon that bench. And judge, gentlemen, what we must think of the clergy of this church of ours, if they remain silent while such a law shall be passed. We were entertained at Ipswich by a very kind and excellent friend, whom, as is generally the case, I had never seen or heard of before. The morning of the day of the last lecture I walked about five miles, then went to his house to breakfast, and stayed with him, and dined. On the Sunday morning, before I came away, I walked about six miles, and repeated the good cheer at breakfast at the same place. Here I heard the first singing of the birds this year, and I here observed an instance of that pitico government, which apparently pervades the whole of animated nature. A lark, very near to me in a ploughed field, rose from the ground, and was saluting the sun with his delightful song. He was got about as high as the dome of St. Paul's, having me for a motionless and admiring auditor, when the hen started up from nearly the same spot whence the cock had risen, flew up and passed close by him. I could not hear what she said, but supposed that she must have given him a pretty smart reprimand, for down she came upon the ground, and he, ceasing to sing, took a twirl in the air, and came down after her. Others have, I dare say, seen this a thousand times over, but I never observed it before. About twelve o'clock my son and I set off for this place, Haltham, coming through Needham Market, Stowe Market, Bury St. Edmunds, and Thetford at which latter place I intended to have lectured to-day and to-morrow, where the theatre was to have been the scene. But the mayor of the town thought it best not to give his permission until the assizes, which commenced to-day the twenty-second, should be over, lest the judge should take offence, seeing that it is the custom, while his lordship is in the town, to give up the civil jurisdiction to him. Bless his worship! What in all the world should he think would take me to Thetford, except it being a time for holding the assizes? At no other time should I have dreamed of finding an audience in so small a place, and in a country so thinly inhabited. I was attracted, too, by the desire of meeting some of my learned friends from the Wen, for I deal in arguments founded on the law of the land and on acts of Parliament. The deuce take this mayor for disappointing me, and now I am afraid that I shall not fall in with this learned body during the whole of my spring tour. Finding Thetford to be forbidden ground, I came hither to Sir Thomas Beaver's, where I had left my two daughters, having, since the twelfth inclusive, travelled a hundred and twenty miles, and delivered six lectures. Those hundred and twenty miles have been through a fine farming country, 
and without my seeing until I came to Thetford, but one spot of waste or common land, and that not exceeding, I should think, from fifty to eighty acres. From this place to Norwich, and through Attleborough, and Wimmendham, the land is all good, and the farming excellent. It is pretty nearly the same from Norwich to Bungay, where we enter Suffolk. Bungay is a large and fine town, with three churches, lying on the side of some very fine meadows. Harleston, on the road to Eye, is a very pretty market town. Of Eye I have spoken before. From Eye to Ipswich we pass through a series of villages, and at Ipswich, to my great surprise, we found a most beautiful town, with a population of about twelve thousand persons, and here our profound Prime Minister might have seen most abundant evidence of prosperity, for the new houses are indeed very numerous. But if our famed and profound Prime Minister, having Mr. Wilmot Horton by the arm, and standing upon one of the hills that surround this town, and which, each hill seeming to surpass the other hill in beauty, command a complete view of every house, or, at least of the top of every house, in this opulent town, if he thus standing and thus accompanied, were to hold up his hands, clap them together, and bless God for the proofs of prosperity contained in the new and red bricks, and were to cast his eye southward of the town, and see the numerous little vessels upon the little arm of the sea which comes up from Harwich, and which here finds its termination, and were in those vessels to discover an additional proof of prosperity, if he were to be thus situated, and to be thus feeling, would not some doubts be awakened in his mind, if I standing behind him were to whisper in his ear, do you not think that the greater part of these new houses have been created by taxes, which went to pay the about twenty thousand troops that were stationed here for pretty nearly twenty years during the war, and some of which are stationed here still? Look at that immense building, my Lord Duke. It is fresh and new and fine and splendid, and contains indubitable marks of opulence. But it is a barrack, ay, and the money to build that barrack and to maintain the twenty thousand troops has assisted to beggar, to dilapidate, to plunge into ruin and decay, hundreds upon hundreds of villages and hamlets in Wiltshire, in Dorsetshire, in Somersetshire, and in other counties who shared not in the ruthless squanderings of the war. But, leaning my arm upon the Duke's shoulder, and giving Wilmot a poke in the pole, to make him listen and look, and pointing with my forefinger to the twelve large, lofty, and magnificent churches, each of them at least seven hundred years old, and saying, Do you think Ipswich was not larger and far more populous seven hundred years ago than it is at this hour? putting this question to him, would it not check his exultation, and would it not make even Wilmot begin to reflect? Even at this hour, with all the unnatural swellings of the war, there are not two thousand people, including the bedridden and the babies, to each of the magnificent churches. Of adults there cannot be more than about fourteen hundred to a church. And there is one of the churches which, being well filled as in ancient times, would contain from four to seven thousand persons, for the nave of it appears to me to be larger than St. Andrew's Hall at Norwich, which hall was formerly the church of the Benedictine Priory. And perhaps the great church here might have belonged to some monastery, for here were three Augustine Priories, one of them founded in the reign of William the Conqueror, another founded in the reign of Henry the Second, another in the reign of King John, with an Augustine Priory, a Carmelite Priory, an hospital founded in the reign of King John, and here too was the college founded by Cardinal Wolsey, the gateway of which, though built in brick, is still preserved, being the same sort of architecture as that of Hampton Court, and St. James's Palace. There is no doubt but that this was a much greater place than it is now. It is the great outlet for the immense quantities of corn grown in this most productive county, and by farmers the most clever that ever lived. I am told that wheat is worth six shillings a quarter more at some times at Ipswich than at Norwich, the navigation to London being so much more speedy and safe. Immense quantities of flour are sent from this town. The windmills on the hills in the vicinage are so numerous that I counted while standing in one place no less than seventeen. They are all painted or wash white, the sails are black. It was a fine morning, the wind was brisk, and their twirling altogether added greatly to the beauty of the scene, which, having the broad and beautiful arm of the sea on the one hand, and the fields and meadows studded with farmhouses on the other, appeared to me the most beautiful sight of the kind that I had ever beheld. The town and its churches were down in the dell before me, and the only object that came to disfigure the scene was the barrack, and made me utter involuntarily the words of Blackstone. The laws of England recognise no distinction between the citizen and the soldier. They know of no standing soldier, no inland fortresses, no barracks. Ah, said I to myself, but loud enough for any one to have heard me a hundred yards. Such were the laws of England when mass was said in those magnificent churches, and such they continued until a septennial parliament came and deprived the people of England of their rights. I know of no town to be compared with Ipswich, except it be Nottingham, and there is this difference in the two, 
that Nottingham stands high, and on one side looks over a very fine country, whereas Ipswich is in a dell, meadows running up above it, and a beautiful arm of the sea below it. The town itself is substantially built, well paved, everything good and solid, and no wretched dwellings to be seen on its outskirts. From the town itself you can see nothing, but you can, in no direction, go from it a quarter of a mile, without finding views that a painter might crave, and then the country round about it, so well cultivated, the land in such a beautiful state, the farmhouses all white and all so much alike, the barns and everything about the homestead so snug, the stocks of turnips so abundant everywhere, the sheep and cattle in such fine order, the wheat all drilled, the ploughmen so expert, the furrows of a quarter of a mile long as straight as a line, and laid as truly as if with a level. In short, here is everything to delight the eye, and to make the people proud of their country, and this is the case throughout the whole of this county. I have always found Suffolk farmers great boasters of their superiority over others, and I must say that it is not without reason. But observe, this has been a very highly favoured county. It has had poured into it millions upon millions of money, drawn from Wiltshire and other inland counties. I should suppose that Wiltshire alone has, within the last forty years, had two or three millions of money drawn from it, to be given to Essex and Suffolk. At one time there were not less than sixty thousand men kept on foot in these counties. The increase of London, too, the swellings of the immortal Wen, have assisted to heap wealth upon these counties. But in spite of all this, the distress pervades all ranks and degrees, except those who live on the taxes. At I, butter used to sell for eighteen pence a pound. It now sells for nine pence halfpenny, though the grass has not yet begun to spring, and eggs were sold at thirty-four shilling. Fine times for me, whose principal food is eggs, and whose sole drink is milk, but very bad times for those who sell me the food and the drink. Coming from Ipswich to Bury St. Edmunds, you pass through Needham Market and Stowe Market, two very pretty market towns, and, like all the other towns in Suffolk, free from the drawback of shabby and beggarly houses on the outskirts. I remarked that I did not see in the whole county one single instance of paper or rags supplying the place of glass in any window, and did not see one miserable hovel in which a labourer resided. The county, however, is flat, with the exception of the environs of Ipswich. There is none of that beautiful variety of hill and dale, and hanging woods, that you see at every town in Hampshire, Sussex, and Kent. It is curious, too, that though the people, I mean the poorer classes of people, are extremely neat in their houses, and though I found all their gardens dug up and prepared for cropping, you do not see about their cottages, and it is just the same in Norfolk, that ornamental gardening, the walks and the flower-borders and the honeysuckles and roses trained over the doors or over arched sticks that you see in Hampshire, Sussex, and Kent, that I have many a time sitten upon my horse to look at so long and so often as greatly to retard me on my journey. Nor is this done for show or ostentation. If you find a cottage in those counties by the side of a by-lane or in the midst of a forest, you find just the same care about the garden and the flowers. In those counties, too, there is great taste with regard to trees of every description, from the hazel to the oak. In Suffolk it appears to be just the contrary. Here is the great dissight of all these three eastern counties. Almost every bank of every field is studded with pollards, that is to say trees that have been beheaded at from six to twelve feet from the ground, than which nothing in nature can be more ugly. They send out shoots from the head which are lopped off once in ten or a dozen years for fuel, or other purposes. To add to the deformity, the ivy is suffered to grow on them, which, at the same time checks the growth of the shoots. These pollards become hollow very soon, and as timber, are fit for nothing but gate-posts, even before they be hollow. Upon a farm of a hundred acres these pollards, by root and shade, spoil at least six acres of the ground, besides being most destructive to the fences. Why not plant six acres of the ground with timber and underwood? Half an acre a year would most amply supply the farm with poles and brush, and with everything wanted in the way of fuel. And why not plant hedges to be unbroken by these pollards? I have scarcely seen a single farm of a hundred acres without pollards, sufficient to find the farmhouse in fuel, without any assistance from coals, for several years. However, the great number of farmhouses in Suffolk, the neatness of those houses, the moderation in point of extent which you generally see, and the great store of the food in the turnips, and the admirable management of the whole, form a pretty good compensation for the want of beauties. The land is generally as clean as a garden ought to be, and, though it varies a good deal as to lightness and stiffness, they make it all bear prodigious quantities of Swedish turnips, and on them pigs, sheep, and cattle all equally thrive. I did not observe a single poor miserable animal in the whole county. To conclude an account of Suffolk, and not to sing the praises of Bury St. Edmunds, 
would offend every creature of Suffolk birth, even at Ipswich when I was praising that place, the very people of that town asked me if I did not think Bury St. Edmund's the nicest town in the world. Meet them wherever you will, they have all the same boast. And indeed, as a town in itself, it is the neatest place that ever was seen. It is airy, it has several fine open places in it, and it has the remains of the famous abbey walls, and the abbey gate and tower, and it is so clean and so neat that nothing can equal it in that respect. It was a favourite spot in ancient times, greatly endowed with monasteries and hospitals. Besides the famous Benedictine Abbey, there were once a college and a friary, and as to the Abbey itself it was one of the greatest in the kingdom, and was so ancient as to have been founded only about forty years after the landing of St. Austin in Kent. The land all round about it is good, and the soil is of that nature as not to produce much dirt at any time of the year. But the country about it is flat, and not of that beautiful variety that we find at Ipswich. After all, what is the reflection now called for? It is that this fine county, for which nature has done all that she can do, soil, climate, seaports, people, everything that can be done, and an internal government, civil and ecclesiastical, the most complete in the world, wanting nothing but to be let alone, to make every soul in it as happy as people can be upon earth, the peace provided for by the county rates, property protected by the law of the land, the poor provided for by the poor rates, religion provided for by the tithes and the church rates, easy and safe conveyance provided for by the highway rates, extraordinary danger provided against by the militia rates, a complete government in itself, but having to pay a portion of sixty millions a year in taxes over and above all this, and that too on account of wars carried on, not for the defence of England, not for the upholding of English liberty and happiness, but for the purpose of crushing liberty and happiness in other countries, and all this because, and only because, a septennial Parliament has deprived the people of their rights. That which we admire most is not always that which would be our choice. One might imagine that after all that I have said about this fine county, I should certainly prefer it as a place of residence. I should not, however. My choice has been always very much divided between the woods of Sussex and the downs of Wiltshire. I should not like to be compelled to decide, but if I were compelled I do believe that I should fix on some vale in Wiltshire. Water meadows at the bottom, corn-land going up towards the hills, those hills being downland, and a farmhouse in a clump of trees, in some little cross-vale between the hills, sheltered on every side but the south. In short, if Mr. Bennet would give me a farm, the house of which lies on the right-hand side of the road going from Salisbury to Warminster, in the parish of Norton Bovent, just before you enter that village, if he would but be so good as to do that, I would freely give up all the rest of the world to the possession of whoever may get hold of it. I have hinted this to him once or twice before, but I am sorry to say that he turns a deaf ear to my hinting. Cambridge, 28th March, 1830. I went from Harfham to Lynn, on Tuesday the 23rd. But owing to the disappointment at Thetford, everything was deranged. It was market day at Lynn, but no preparations of any sort had been made, and no notification given. I therefore resolved, after staying at Lynn on Wednesday, to make a short tour, and to come back to it again. This tour was to take in Ely, Cambridge, St. Ives, Stamford, Peterborough, Wisbeach, and was to bring me back to Lynn after a very busy ten days. I was particularly desirous to have a little political preaching at Ely, the place where the flogging of the English local militia under a guard of German bayonets cost me so dear. I got there about noon on Thursday, the 25th, being market day, but I had been apprised even before I left Lynn that no place had been provided for my accommodation. A gentleman at Lynn gave me the name of one at Ely, who, as he thought, would be glad of an opportunity of pointing out a proper place, and of speaking about it. But just before I set off from Lynn I received a notification from this gentleman that he could do nothing in the matter. I knew that Ely was a small place, but I was determined to go and see the spot where the militiamen were flogged, and also determined to find some opportunity or other of relating that story as publicly as I could at Ely and of describing the tale of the story, of which I will speak presently. Arrived at Ely, I first walked round the beautiful cathedral, that honour to our Catholic forefathers, and that standing disgrace to our Protestant selves. It is impossible to look at that magnificent pile without feeling that we are a fallen race of men. The cathedral would, leaving out the palace of the bishop, and the houses of the dean, canons, and prebendaries, weigh more, if it were put into a scale, than all the houses in the town, and all the houses for a mile round the neighbourhood, if you exclude the remains of the ancient monasteries. You have only to open your eyes to be convinced that England must have been a far greater and more wealthy country in those days than it is in these days. 
the hundreds of thousands of loads of stone of which this cathedral and the monasteries in the neighbourhood were built must all have been brought by sea from distant parts of the kingdom these foundations were laid more than a thousand years ago and yet there are vagabonds who have the impudence to say that it is the protestant religion that has made england a great country ely is what one may call a miserable little town very prettily situated but poor and mean everything seems to be on the decline as indeed is the case everywhere where the clergy are the masters they say that this bishop has an income of eighteen thousand pounds a year he and the dean and chapter are the owners of all the land and tithes for a great distance round about in this beautiful and most productive part of the country and yet this famous building the cathedral is in a state of disgraceful irrepair and disfigurement the great and magnificent windows to the east have been shortened at the bottom and the space plastered up with brick and mortar in a very slovenly manner for the purpose of saving the expense of keeping the glass in repair great numbers of the windows in the upper part of the building have been partly closed up in the same manner and others quite closed up one doorway which apparently had stood in need of repair has been rebuilt in modern style because it was cheaper and the churchyard contained a flock of sheep acting as vergers for those who live upon the immense income not a penny of which ought to be expended upon themselves while any part of this beautiful building is in a state of irrepair this cathedral was erected to the honour of god and the holy church my daughters went to the service in the afternoon in the choir of which they saw god honoured by the presence of two old men forming the whole of the congregation i dare say that in catholic times five thousand people at a time have been assembled in this church the cathedral and town stand upon a little hill about three miles in circumference raised up as it were for the purpose amidst the rich fen land by which the hill is surrounded and i dare say that the town formerly consisted of houses built over a great part of this hill and of probably from fifty to a hundred thousand people the people do not now exceed above four thousand including the bedridden and the babies having no place provided for lecturing and knowing no single soul in the place i was thrown upon my own resources the first thing i did was to walk up through the market which contained much more than an audience sufficient for me but leaving the market people to carry on their affairs i picked up a sort of labouring man asked him if he recollected when the local militiamen were flogged under the guard of the germans and receiving an answer in the affirmative i asked him to go and show me the spot which he did he showed me a little common along which the men had been marched and into a piece of pasture land where he put his foot upon the identical spot where the flogging had been executed on that spot i told him what i had suffered for expressing my indignation at that flogging i told him that a large sum of english money was now every year sent abroad to furnish half pay and allowances to the officers of those german troops and to maintain the widows and children of such of them as were dead and i added you have to work to help to pay that money part of the taxes which you pay on your malt hops beer leather soap candles tobacco tea sugar and everything else goes abroad every year to pay these people it has thus been going abroad ever since the peace and it will thus go abroad for the rest of your life if this system of managing the nation's affairs continue and i told him that about one million seven hundred thousand pounds had been sent abroad on this account since the peace when i opened i found that this man was willing to open too and he uttered sentiments that would have convinced me if i had not before been convinced of the fact that there are very few even amongst the labourers who do not clearly understand the cause of their ruin i discovered that there were two ely men flogged upon that occasion and that one of them was still alive and residing near the town i sent for this man who came to me in the evening when he had done his work and who told me that he had lived seven years with the same master when he was flogged and was bailiff or headman to his master he has now a wife and several children is a very nice-looking and appears to be a hard-working man and to bear an excellent character but how was i to harangue for i was determined not to quit ely without something of that sort i told this labouring man who showed me the flogging spot my name which seemed to surprise him very much for he had heard of me before after i had returned to my inn i walked back again through the market amongst the farmers then went to an inn that looked out upon the market-place went into an upstairs room threw up the sash and sat down at the window and looked out upon the market little groups soon collected to survey me while i sat in a very unconcerned attitude the farmers had dined or i should have found out the most numerous assemblage and have dined with them the next best thing was to go and sit down in the room where they usually dropped in to drink after dinner and as they nearly all smoke to take a pipe with them this therefore i did and after a time we began to talk 
The room was too small to contain a twentieth part of the people that would have come in, if they could. It was hot to suffocation, but nevertheless I related to them the account of the flogging, and of my persecution on that account, and I related to them the account above stated, with regard to the English money now sent to the Germans, at which they appeared to be utterly astonished. I had not time sufficient for a lecture, but I explained to them briefly the real cause of the distress which prevailed. I warned the farmers particularly against the consequences of hoping that this distress would remove itself. I portrayed to them the effects of the taxes, and showed them that we owe this enormous burden to the want of being fairly represented in the Parliament. Above all things, I did that which I never failed to do, showed them the absurdity of grumbling at the six millions a year given in relief to the poor, while they were silent and seemed to think nothing, of the sixty millions of taxes collected by the government at London, and I asked them how any man of property could have the impudence to call upon the labouring man to serve in the militia, and to deny that the labouring man had, in case of need, a clear right to a share of the produce of the land. I explained to them how the poor were originally relieved, told them that the revenues of the livings, which had their foundation in charity, were divided amongst the poor. The demands for repair of the churches and the clergy themselves, I explained to them how church rates and poor rates came to be introduced, how the burden of maintaining the poor came to be thrown upon the people at large, how the nation had sunk by degrees ever since the event called the Reformation, and pointing towards the cathedral, I said, Can you believe, gentlemen, that when that magnificent pile was reared, and when all the fine monasteries, hospitals, schools, and other resorts of piety and charity existed in this town and neighbourhood, can you believe that Ely was the miserable little place that it now is, and that that England which had never heard of the name of pauper, contain the crowds of miserable creatures that it now contains, some starving at stone-cracking by the wayside, and others drawing loaded wagons on that way. A young man in the room, I having come to a pause, said, But, sir, were there no poor in Catholic times? Yes, said I, to be sure there were. The scripture says that the poor shall never cease out of the land, and there are five hundred texts of scripture, enjoining on all men to be good and kind to the poor. It is necessary to the existence of civil society that there should be poor, Men have two motives to industry and care in all the walks of life, one to acquire wealth, but the other, and stronger, to avoid poverty. If there were no poverty, there would be no industry, no enterprise. But this poverty is not to be made a punishment unjustly severe. Idleness, extravagance are offences against morality, but they are not offences of that heinous nature to justify the infliction of starvation by way of punishment. It is therefore the duty of every man that is able, it is particularly the duty of every government, and it was a duty faithfully executed by the Catholic Church, to take care that no human being should perish for want in a land of plenty, and to take care, too, that no one should be deficient of a sufficiency of food and raiment, not only to sustain life, but also to sustain health. The young man said, I thank you, sir. I am answered. I strongly advise the farmers to be well with their work people, for that, unless their flocks were as safe in their fields, as their bodies were in their beds, their lives must be lives of misery, that if their sacks and barns were not places of as safe deposit for their corn, as their drawers were for their money, the life of the farmer was the most wretched upon earth, in place of being the most pleasant, as it ought to be. Boston, Friday, ninth April, 1830. Quitting Cambridge and Dr. Chafee and Sergeant Freer on Monday, the 29th of March, I arrived at St. Ives in Huntingdonshire about one o'clock in the day. In the evening I harangued to about two hundred persons, principally farmers, in a wheelwright shop, that being the only safe place in the town, of sufficient dimensions, and sufficiently strong. It was market-day, and this is a great cattle-market. As I was not to be at Stamford in Lincolnshire till the thirty-first, I went from St. Ives to my friend Mr. Wells's near Huntingdon, and remained there till the thirty-first in the morning, employing the evening of the thirtieth in going to Chatteris, in the Isle of Ely and there addressing a good large company of farmers. On the 31st I went to Stamford, and in the evening spoke to about two hundred farmers and others, in a large room in a very fine and excellent inn, called Stanwell's Hotel, which is, with few exceptions, the nicest inn that I have ever been in. On the 1st of April I harangued here again, and had amongst my auditors some most agreeable, intelligent, and public-spirited yeomen, from the little county of Rutland, who made, respecting the seat in Parliament, the proposition, the details of the purport of which I communicated to my readers in the last register. On the 2nd of April I met my audience in the playhouse at Peterborough, 
and though it had snowed all day and was very wet and sloppy i had a good large audience and i did not let this opportunity pass without telling my hearers of the part that their good neighbour lord fitzwilliam had acted with regard to the french war with regard to burke and his pension with regard to the dungeoning law which drove me across the atlantic in eighteen seventeen and with regard to the putting into the present parliament i and for that very town that very lawyer scarlet whose state prosecutions are now become so famous never said i did i say that behind a man's back that i would not say to his face i wish i had his face before me but i am here as near to it as i can get i am before the face of his friends here therefore i will say what i think of him when i had described his conduct and given my opinion on it many applauded and not one expressed disapprobation on the third i speechified at wisbeach in the playhouse to about two hundred and twenty people i think it was and that same night went to sleep at a friend's a total stranger to me however at st edmund's in the heart of the fens i stayed there on the fourth sunday the morning of which brought a hard frost ice an inch thick and the total destruction of the apricot blossoms after passing sunday and the greater part of monday the fifth at st edmund's where my daughters and myself received the greatest kindness and attention we went on monday afternoon to crowland where we were most kindly lodged and entertained at the houses of two gentlemen to whom also we were personally perfect strangers and in the evening i addressed a very large assemblage of most respectable farmers and others in this once famous town there was another hard frost on the monday morning just as it were to finish the apricot bloom on the sixth i went to lynn and on that evening and on the evening of the seventh i spoke to about three hundred people in the playhouse and here there was more interruption than i have ever met with at any other place this town though containing as good and kind friends as i have met with in any other and though the people are generally as good contains also apparently a large proportion of dead weight the offspring most likely of the rottenness of the borough two or three or even one man may if not tossed out at once disturb and interrupt everything in a case where constant attention to fact and argument is requisite to ensure utility to the meeting there were but three here and though they were finally silenced it was not without great loss of time great noise and hubbub two i was told were dead weight men and one a sort of higgling merchant on the eighth i went to holbeach in this noble county of lincoln and gracious god what a contrast with the scene at lynn i knew not a soul in the place mr fields a bookseller and printer had invited me by letter and had in the nicest and most unostentatious manner made all the preparations holbeach lies in the midst of some of the richest land in the world a small market-town but a parish more than twenty miles across larger i believe than the county of rutland produced an audience in a very nice room with seats prepared of a hundred and seventy-eight apparently all wealthy farmers and men in that rank of life and an audience so deeply attentive to the dry matters on which i had to address it i have very seldom met with i was delighted with holbeach a neat little town a most beautiful church with a spire like that of the man of ross pointing to the skies gardens very pretty fruit trees in abundance with blossom buds ready to burst and land dark in colour and as fine in substance as flour as fine as if sifted through one of the sieves with which we get the dust out of the clover seed and when cut deep down into with a spade precisely as to substance like a piece of hard butter yet nowhere is the distress greater than here i walked on from holbeach six miles towards boston and seeing the fatness of the land and the fine grass and the never-ending sheep lying about like fat hogs stretched in the sun and seeing the abject state of the labouring people i could not help exclaiming god has given us the best country in the world our brave and wise and virtuous fathers who built all these magnificent churches gave us the best government in the world and we their cowardly and foolish and profligate sons have made this once paradise what we now behold i arrived at boston where i am now writing to-day friday ninth april about ten o'clock i must arrive at louth before i can say precisely what my future route will be there is an immense fair at lincoln next week and a friend has been here to point out the proper days to be there as however this register will not come from the press until after i shall have had an opportunity of writing something at louth time enough to be inserted in it i will here go back and speak of the country that i have travelled over since i left cambridge on the twenty ninth of march from cambridge to st ives the land is generally in open unfenced fields and some common fields generally stiff land and some of it not very good and wheat in many places looking rather thin from st ives to chatteris which last is in the isle of ely 
the land is better, particularly as you approach the latter place. From Chatteris I came back to Huntingdon, and once more saw its beautiful meadows, of which I spoke when I went thither in 1823. From Huntingdon, through Stilton to Stamford, the two last in Lincolnshire, is a country of rich arable land and grass fields, and of beautiful meadows. The enclosures are very large, the soil red, with a whitish stone below, very much like the soil at and near Ross in Herefordshire, and like that near Coventry and Warwick. Here, as all over this country, everlasting fine sheep. The houses all along here are built of the stone of the country. You seldom see brick. The churches are large, lofty, and fine, and give proof that the country was formerly much more populous than it is now, and that the people had a vast deal more of wealth in their hands and at their own disposal. There are three beautiful churches at Stamford, not less, I dare say, than three hundred years old, but two of them, I did not go to the other, are as perfect as when just finished, except as to the images, most of which have been destroyed by the ungrateful Protestant barbarians of different sorts, but some of which, out of the reach of their ruthless hands, are still in the niches. From Stamford to Peterborough is a country of the same description, with the additional beauty of woods here and there, and with meadows just like those at Huntingdon, and not surpassed by those on the Severn near Worcester, nor by those on the Avon at Tewkesbury. The cathedral at Peterborough is exquisitely beautiful, and I have great pleasure in saying that, contrary to the more magnificent pile at Ely, it is kept in good order, the bishop, Herbert Marsh, residing a good deal on the spot, and though he did write a pamphlet to justify and urge on the war, the ruinous war, and though he did get a pension for it, he is, they told me, very good to the poor people. My daughters had a great desire to see, and I had a great desire they should see, the burial place of that ill-used, that savagely treated woman, and that honour to womankind, Catherine, queen of the ferocious tyrant Henry the Eighth, To the infamy of that ruffian, and the shame of after ages, there is no monument to record her virtues and her sufferings, and the remains of this daughter of the wise Ferdinand, and of the generous Isabella, who sold her jewels to enable Columbus to discover the new world, lie under the floor of the cathedral, commemorated by a short inscription on a plate of brass. All men, Protestants or not Protestants, feel as I feel upon this subject. Search the hearts of the bishop and of his dean and chapter, and these feelings are there. But to do justice to the memory of this illustrious victim of tyranny would be to cast a reflection on that event to which they owe their rich possessions, and at the same time to suggest ideas not very favourable to the descendants of those who divided amongst them the plunder of the people arising out of that event, and which descendants are their patrons, and give them what they possess. From this cause and no other, it is, that the memory of the virtuous Catherine is unblazoned, while that of the tyrannical, the cruel, and the immoral Elizabeth is recorded with all possible veneration, and all possible varnishing over, of her disgusting amours, and endless crimes. They relate at Peterborough that the same sexton who buried Queen Catherine also buried here Mary, Queen of Scots. The remains of the latter of very questionable virtue, or rather of unquestionable vice, were removed to Westminster Abbey by her son, James I. But those of the virtuous queen were suffered to remain unhonoured. Good God! What injustice! What a want of principle! What hostility to all virtuous feeling has not been the fruit of this Protestant Reformation! What plunder, what disgrace to England, what shame, what misery has that event not produced! There is nothing that I address to my hearers with more visible effect than a statement of the manner in which the poor rates and the church rates came. This, of course, includes an account of how the poor were relieved in Catholic times. To the far greater part of people this is information wholly new. They are deeply interested in it, and the impression is very great. Always before we part, Tom Cranmer's church receives a considerable blow. There is in the cathedral a very ancient monument, made to commemorate, they say, the murder of the abbot and his monks by the Danes. Its date is the year 870. Almost all the cathedrals were, it appears, originally churches of monasteries. That of Winchester and several others certainly were. There has lately died, in the garden of the bishop's palace, a tortoise that had been there more, they say, than two hundred years, a fact very likely to be known, because at the end of thirty or forty people would begin to talk about it as something remarkable, and thus the record would be handed down from father to son. From Peterborough to Wisbeach, the road for the most part lies through the fens, and here we pass through the village of Thorny, where there was a famous abbey which, together with its valuable domain, was given by the savage tyrant Henry the Eighth 
to john lord russell made a lord by that tyrant the founder of the family of that name this man got also the abbey an estate at woburn the priory and its estate at tavistock and in the next reign he got covent garden and other parts adjoining together with other things all then public property a history a true history of this family which i hope i shall find time to write would be a most valuable thing it would be a nice little specimen of the way in which these families became possessed of a great part of their estates it would show how the poor rates and the church rates came it would set the whole nation right at once some years ago i had a set of the encyclopaedia britannica scotch which contained an account of every other great family in the kingdom but i could find in it no account of this family either under the word russell or the word bedford i got into a passion with the book because it contained no account of the mode of raising the birch tree and it was sold to a son as i was told of mr alderman haygate and if that gentleman look into the book he will find what i say to be true but if i should be in error about this perhaps he will have the goodness to let me know it i shall be obliged to any one to point me out any printed account of this family and particularly to tell me where i can get an old folio containing amongst other things bulstrode's argument and narrative in justification of the sentence and execution of lord william russell in the reign of charles the second it is impossible to look at the now miserable village of thorney and to think of its once splendid abbey it is impossible to look at the twenty thousand acres of land around covered with fat sheep or bearing six quarters of wheat or ten of oats to the acre without any manure it is impossible to think of these without feeling a desire that the whole nation should know all about the surprising merits of the possessors wisbeach lying further up the arm of the sea than lynn is like the latter a little town of commerce chiefly engaged in exporting to the south the corn that grows in this productive country it is a good solid town though not handsome and has a large market particularly for corn to crowland i went as before stated from wisbeach staying two nights at st edmund's here i was in the heart of the fens the whole country as level as the table on which i am now writing the horizon like the sea in a dead calm you see the morning sun come up just as at sea and see it go down over the rim in just the same way as at sea in a calm the land covered with beautiful grass with sheep lying about upon it as fat as hogs stretched out sleeping in a sty the kind and polite friends with whom we were lodged had a very neat garden and fine young orchard everything grows well here earth without a stone so big as a pin's head grass as thick as it can grow on the ground immense bowling green separated by ditches and not the sign of dock or thistle or other weed to be seen what a contrast between these and the heath-covered sand-hills of surrey amongst which i was born yet the labourers who spuddle about the ground in the little dips between those sand-hills are better off than those that exist in this fat of the land here the grasping system takes all away because it has the means of coming at the value of all there the poor man enjoys something because he is thought too poor to have anything he is there allowed to have what is deemed worth nothing but here where every inch is valuable not one inch is he permitted to enjoy at crowland also still in the fens was a great and rich abbey a good part of the magnificent ruins of the church of which are still standing one corner or part of it being used as the parish church by the worms which have crept out of the dead bodies of those who lived in the days of the founders and wandering man could want the larger pile exult and claim the corner with a smile they tell you that all the country at and near crowland was a mere swamp a mere bog bearing nothing bearing nothing worth naming until the modern drainings took place the thing called the reformation has lied common sense out of men's minds so likely a thing to choose a barren swamp whereon or wherein to make the site of an abbey and of a benedictine abbey too it has been always observed that the monks took care to choose for their places of abode pleasant spots surrounded by productive land the likeliest thing in the world for these monks to choose a swamp for their dwelling-place surrounded by land that produced nothing good the thing gives the lie to itself and it is impossible to reject the belief that these fens were as productive of corn and meat a thousand years ago and more so than they are at this hour there is a curious triangular bridge here on one part of which stands the statue of one of the ancient kings it is all of great age and everything shows that crowland was a place of importance in the earliest times from crowland to lynn through thorny and wisbeach is all fens well besprinkled formerly with monasteries of various descriptions and still well set with magnificent churches from lynn to holbeach you get out of the rail fence 
and into the land that I attempted to describe, when, a few pages back, I was speaking of Holbeach. I say attempted, for I defy tongue or pen to make the description adequate to the matter. To know what the thing is, you must see it. The same land continues all the way on to Boston, endless grass and endless fat sheep, not a stone, not a weed. End of chapter 31, part 1《ハッピーオーバーの日本語で書いてありますが、このリブロックスは公開されています。もし、情報を知りたい方は、ぜひ、リブロックスを見てください。このリブロックスは、ウィリム・コブッド、ハッピーオーバーの日本語で書いてあります。ボストン、11月11日、1830年。昨日、私は演説をしたのです。whose appearance was sufficient to fill me with pride. I had given notice that I should perform on Friday, overlooking the circumstance that it was Good Friday. In apologising for this inadvertence, I took occasion to observe that, even if I had persevered, the clergy of the church could have nothing to object, seeing that they were now silent while a bill was passing in Parliament, to put Jews on a level with Christians, to enable Jews, the blasphemers of the Redeemer, to sit on the bench, to sit in both houses of Parliament, to sit in council with the king, and to be kings of England, if entitled to the crown, which by possibility they might become if this bill were to pass. That to this bill the clergy had offered no opposition, and that therefore how could they hold sacred the anniversary appointed to commemorate the crucifixion of Christ by the hands of the blaspheming and bloody Jews? That at any rate, if this bill passed, if those who called Jesus Christ an impostor were thus declared to be as good as those who adored him, there was not, I hoped, a man in the kingdom who would pretend that it would be just to compel the people to pay tithes and fees and offerings to men for teaching Christianity. This was a clincher, and as such it was received. This morning I went out at six, looked at the town, walked three miles on the road to Spilsby, and back to breakfast at nine. Boston, boss is Latin for ox, though not above a fourth or fifth part of the size of its daughter in New England, which got its name, I dare say, from some persecuted native of this place, who had quitted England and all her wealth and all her glories, to preserve that freedom which was still more dear to him. Though not a town like New Boston, and though little to what it formerly was, when agricultural produce was the great staple of the kingdom, and the great subject of foreign exchange, is nevertheless a very fine town, good houses, good shops, pretty gardens about it, a fine open place, nearly equal to that of Nottingham, in the middle of it a river, and a canal passing through it, each crossed by a handsome and substantial bridge, a fine market for sheep, cattle, and pigs, and another for meat, butter, and fish, and being like Lynn a great place for the export of corn and flour, and having many fine mills, it is altogether a town of very considerable importance, and, which is not to be overlooked, inhabited by people, none of whom appear to be in misery. The great pride and glory of the Bostonians is their church, which is, I think, four hundred feet long, ninety feet wide, and has a tower, or steeple as they call it, three hundred feet high, which is both a landmark and a sea-mark. To describe the richness, the magnificence, the symmetry, the exquisite beauty of this pile is wholly out of my power. It is impossible to look at it without feeling, first, admiration and reverence and gratitude to the memory of our fathers who reared it, and next, indignation at those who affect to believe, and contempt for those who do believe, that when this pile was reared the age was dark, the people rude and ignorant, and the country destitute of wealth and thinly peopled. Look at this church, then. Look at the heaps of white rubbish that the parsons have lately stuck up under the new church act, and which, after having been built with money forced from the nation by odious taxes, they have stuffed full of locked-up pens called pews, which they let for money, as cattle and sheep and pig-pens are let at fairs and markets. Nay, after having looked at this work of the dark ages, look at that great, heaving, ugly, unmeaning mass of stone called St. Paul's, which an American friend of mine who came to London from Falmouth and had seen the cathedrals at Exton Salisbury, swore to me, that when he first saw it he was at a loss to guess whether it were a court-house or a jail. After looking at Boston Church, go and look at that great gloomy lump, created by a Protestant Parliament, and by taxes wrung by force from the whole nation, and then say which is the age really meriting the epithet dark. St. Botol, to whom this church is dedicated, while he, if saints see and hear what is passing on earth, must lament that the piety-inspiring mass has been in this noble edifice, supplanted by the monotonous hummings of an oaken hutch, 
has not the mortification to see his church treated in a manner as if the new possessors sighed for the hour of its destruction it is taken great care of and though it has cruelly suffered from protestant repairs though the images are gone and the stained glass and though the glazing is now in squares instead of lozenges though the nave is stuffed with pens called pews and though other changes have taken place detracting from the beauty of the edifice great care is taken of it as it now is and the inside is not disfigured and disgraced by a gallery that great and characteristic mark of protestant taste which as nearly as may be makes a church like a playhouse st botolph on the supposition before mentioned has the satisfaction to see that the base of his celebrated church is surrounded by an iron fence to keep from it all offensive and corroding matter which is so disgusting to the sight round the magnificent piles at norwich ely and other places that the churchyard and all appertaining to it are kept in the neatest and most respectable state that no money has been spared for these purposes that here the eye tells the heart that gratitude towards the fathers of the bostonians is not extinguished in the breasts of their sons and this the saint will know that he owes to the circumstances that the parish is a poor vicarage and that the care of his church is in the hands of the industrious people and not in those of a fat and luxurious dean and chapter wallowing in wealth derived from the people's labour horncastle twelfth april a fine soft showery morning saw us out of boston carrying with us the most pleasing reflections as to our reception and treatment there by numerous persons none of whom we had ever seen before the face of the country for about half the way the soil the grass the endless sheep the thickly scattered and magnificent churches continue as on the other side of boston but after that we got out of the low and level land at sibsey a pretty village five miles from boston we saw for the first time since we left peterborough land rising above the level of the horizon and not having seen such a thing for so long it had struck my daughters who overtook me on the road i having walked on from boston that the sight had an effect like that produced by the first sight of land after a voyage across the atlantic we now soon got into a country of hedges and dry land and gravel and clay and stones the land not bad however pretty much like that of sussex lying between the forest part and the south downs a good proportion of woodland also and just before we got to horncastle we passed the park of that mr dimmock who is called the champion of england and to whom it is said hereabouts that we pay out of the taxes eight thousand pounds a year this never can be to be sure but if we pay him only a hundred a year i will lay down my glove against that of the champion that we do not pay him even that for five years longer it is curious that the moment you get out of the rich land the churches become smaller mean and with scarcely anything in the way of tower or steeple this town is seated in the middle of a large valley not however remarkable for anything of peculiar value or beauty a purely agricultural town well built and not mean in any part of it it is a great rendezvous for horses and cattle and sheep dealers and for those who sell these and accordingly it suffers severely from the loss of the small paper money horncastle thirteenth april morning i made a speech last evening to from a hundred and thirty to a hundred and fifty almost all farmers and most men of apparent wealth to a certain extent i have seldom been better pleased with my audience it is not the clapping and huzzaing that i value so much as the silent attention the earnest look at me from all eyes at once and then when the point is concluded the look and nod at each other as if the parties were saying think of that and of these i had a great deal at horncastle they say that there are a hundred parish churches within six miles of this town i dare say that there was one farmer from almost every one of those parishes this is sowing the seeds of truth in a very sure manner it is not scattering broadcast it is really drilling the country there is one deficiency and that with me a great one throughout this country of corn and grass and oxen and sheep that i have come over during the last three weeks namely the want of singing birds we are now just in that season when they sing most here in all this country i have seen and heard only about four skylarks and not one other singing bird of any description and of the small birds that do not sing i have seen only one yellow hammer and it was perched on the rail of a pound between boston and sibsey oh the thousands of linnets all singing together on one tree in the sandhills of surrey oh the carolling in the coppices and the dingles of hampshire and sussex and kent at this moment five o'clock in the morning the groves at barn elm are echoing with the warblings of thousands upon thousands of birds the thrush begins a little before it is light next the blackbird next the larks begin to rise all the rest begin the moment the sun gives the signal and from the hedges the bushes from the middle and the topmost twigs of the trees comes the singing of endless variety from the long dead grass comes the sound of the sweet and soft voice of the white-throat or nettle-tom 
while the loud and merry song of the lark, the songster himself out of sight, seems to descend from the skies. Milton, in his description of paradise, has not omitted the song of earliest birds. However, everything taken together, here in Lincolnshire, are more good things than man could have had the conscience to ask of God. And now, if I had time and room to describe the state of men's affairs in the country through which I have passed, I should show that the people at Westminster would have known how to turn paradise itself into hell. I must, however, defer this until my next, when I shall have been at Hull in Lincoln, and have had a view of the whole of this rich and fine country. In the meanwhile, however, I cannot help congratulating that sensible fellow, Wilmot Horton, and his co-operator, Burdett. That emigration is going on at a swimming rate. Thousands are going, and that, too, without mortgaging the poor rates. But sensible fellows! It is not the aged, the halt, the ailing. It is not the paupers that are going, but men with two hundred pounds to two thousand pounds in their pocket. This very year, from two to five millions of pounds sterling, will actually be carried from England to the United States. The Scotch who have money to pay their passages go to New York. Those who have none get carried to Canada, that they may thence get into the United States. I will inquire one of these days what right Burdett has to live in England more than those whom he proposes to send away. Spittal, near Lincoln, 19th April, 1830. Here we are at the end of a pretty decent trip since we left Boston. The next place on our way to Hull was Horncastle, where I preached politics in the playhouse to a most respectable body of farmers, who had come in the wet to meet me. Mr. John Penniston, who had invited me to stop there, behaved in a very obliging manner and made all things very pleasant. The country from Boston continued, as I said before, flat for about half the way to Horncastle, and we then began to see the high land. From Horncastle I set off two hours before the carriage, and going through a very pretty village called Ashby, got to another at the foot of a hill which they say forms part of the Wolds, that is, a ridge of hills. This second village is called Scamblesby. The vale in which it lies is very fine land. A hazel mould, rich and light too. I saw a man here ploughing for barley, after turnips, with one horse. The horse did not seem to work hard, and the man was singing. I need not say that he was young, and I dare say he had the good sense to keep his legs under another man's table, and to stretch his body on another man's bed. This is a very fine corn country, chalk at bottom, stony near the surface, in some places, here and there a chalk pit in the hills, the shape of the ground somewhat like that of the broadest valleys in Wiltshire, but the fields not without fences as they are there. Fields from fifteen to forty acres, the hills not downs as in Wiltshire, but cultivated all over, the houses white and thatch as they are in all chalk countries. The valley at Scamblesby has a little rivulet running down it, just as in all the chalk countries. The land continues nearly the same to Louth, which lies in a deep dell, with beautiful pastures on the surrounding hills, like those that I once admired at Shaftesbury in Dorsetshire, and like that near St. Hostel in Cornwall, which I described in 1808. At Louth the Wise Corporation had refused to let us have the playhouse, but my friends had prepared a very good place, and I had an opportunity of addressing crowded audiences two nights running. At no place have I been better pleased than at Louth. Mr. Patterson, solicitor, a young gentleman whom I had the honour to know slightly before, and to know whom, whether I estimate by character or by talent, would be an honour to any man, was particularly attentive to us. Mr. Knoll, ironmonger, who had had the battle to fight for me for twenty years, expressed his exultation at my triumph, in a manner that showed that he justly participated it with me. I breakfasted at Mr. Knoll's with a gentleman eighty-eight or eighty-nine years of age, whose joy at shaking me by the hand was excessive. Ah, said he, where are now those savages who had hull threatened to kill me for raising my voice against this system? This is a very fine town, and has a beautiful church, nearly equal to that at Boston. We left Louth on the morning of Thursday the 15th, and got to Barton on the Humber by about noon, over a very fine country, large fields, fine pastures, flocks of those great sheep, of from two hundred to a thousand in a flock. And here at Barton we arrived at the northern point of this noble county, having never seen one single acre of waste land, and not one acre that would be called bad land in the south of England. The Wolds, or Highlands, lie away to our right, from Horncastle to near Barton, and on the other side of the Wolds lie the marshes of Lincolnshire, which extend along the coast from Boston to the mouth of the Humber, on the bank of which we were at Barton, Hull being on the opposite side of the river, which is here about five miles wide, and which we had to cross in a steamboat. But let me not forget Great Grimsby, at which we changed horses, and breakfasted, in our way from Louth to Barton. What the devil, the reader will say, should you want to recollect that place for? Why do you want not to forget that sink of corruption? 
what could you find there to be snatched from everlasting oblivion except for the purpose of being execrated i did however find something there worthy of being made known not only to every man in england but to every man in the world and not to mention it here would be to be guilty of the greatest injustice to my surprise i found a good many people assembled at the inn door evidently expecting my arrival while breakfast was preparing i wished to speak to the bookseller of the place if there were one and to give him a list of my books and writings that he might place it in his shop when he came i was surprised to find that he had it already and that he occasionally sold my books upon my asking him how he got it he said that it was brought down from london and given to him by a mr plaskett who he said had all my writings and who he said he was sure would be very glad to see me but that he lived above a mile from the town a messenger however had gone off to carry the news and mr plaskett arrived before we had done breakfast bringing with him a son and a daughter and from the lips of this gentleman a man of as kind and benevolent appearance and manners as i ever beheld in my life i had the following facts namely that one of his sons sailed for new york some years ago that the ship was cast away on the shores of long island that the captain crew and passengers all perished that the wrecked vessel was taken possession of by people on the coast that his son had a watch in his trunk or chest a purse with fourteen shillings in it and divers articles of wearing apparel that the americans who searched the wreck sent all these articles safely to england to him and said he i keep the purse and the money at home and here is the watch in my pocket it would have been worth the expense of coming from london to grimsby if for nothing but to learn this fact which i record not only in justice to the free people of america and particularly in justice to my late neighbours in long island but in justice to the character of mankind i publish it as something to counterbalance the conduct of the atrocious monsters who plunder the wrecks on the coast of cornwall and as i am told on the coast here in the east of the island away go then all the accusations upon the character of the yankees people may call them sharp cunning overreaching and when they have exhausted the vocabulary of their abuse and the answer is found in this one fact stated by mr joshua plaskett of great grimsby in lincolnshire old england the person who sent the things to mr plaskett was named jones it did not occur to me to ask his christian name nor to inquire what was the particular place where he lived in long island i request mr plaskett to contrive to let me know these particulars as i should like to communicate them to friends that i have on the north side of that island however it would excite no surprise there that one of their countrymen had acted this part for every man of them having the same opportunity would do the same their forefathers carried to new england the nature and character of the people of old england before national debts paper money septennial bills standing armies dead weights and jubilees had beggared and corrupted the people at hull i lectured i laugh at the word to about seven hundred persons on the same evening that i arrived from louth which was on thursday the fifteenth we had what they call the summer theatre which was crowded in every part except on the stage and the next evening the stage was crowded too the third evening was merely accidental no previous notice having been given of it on the saturday i went in the middle of the day to beverley saw there the beautiful minster and some of the fine horses which they show there at this season of the year dined with about fifty farmers made a speech to them and about a hundred more perhaps and got back to hull time enough to go to the theatre there the country round hull appears to exceed even that of lincolnshire the three mornings that i was at hull i walked out in three different directions and found the country everywhere fine to the east lies the holderness country i used to wonder that yorkshire to which i from some false impression in my youth had always attached the idea of sterility should send us of the south those beautiful cattle with short horns and straight and deep bodies you have only to see the country to cease to wonder at this it lies on the north side of the mouth of the humber is as flat and fat as the land between holbeach and boston without as they tell me the necessity of such numerous ditches the appellation yorkshire bite the acute sayings ascribed to yorkshiremen and their quick manner i remember in the army when speaking of what country a man was one used to say in defence of the party york but honest another saying was that it was a bear common that a yorkshireman would go over without taking a bite every one knows the story of the gentleman who upon finding that a boot clean in the south was a yorkshireman and expressing his surprise that he was not become master of the inn received for answer ah sir but master is york too and that of the yorkshire boy who seeing a gentleman eating some eggs asked the cook to give him a little salt and upon being asked what he could want with salt he said perhaps that gentleman may give me an egg presently it is surprising what effect sayings like these produce upon the mind from one end to the other of the kingdom yorkshiremen are looked upon as being keener than other people more eager in pursuit of their own interests more sharp and more selfish for my part i was cured with regard to the people long before i saw yorkshire 
In the army, where we see men of all counties, I always found Yorkshiremen distinguished for their frank manners and generous disposition. In the United States, my kind and generous friends of Pennsylvania were the children and descendants of Yorkshire parents, and in truth I long ago made up my mind that this hardness and sharpness ascribed to Yorkshiremen arose from the sort of envy excited by that quickness, that activity, that buoyancy of spirits, which bears them up through adverse circumstances, and their consequent success in all the situations of life. They, like the people of Lancashire, are just the very reverse of being cunning and selfish. Be they farmers, or be they what they may, you get at the bottom of their hearts in a minute. Everything they think soon gets to the tongue, and out it comes, head and tails, as fast as they can pour it. Fine materials for Oliver to work on. If he had been sent to the west instead of the north, he would have found people there on whom he would have exercised his powers in vain. You are not to have every valuable quality in the same man and the same people. You are not to have prudent caution united with quickness and volubility. But though, as to the character of the people, I, having known so many hundreds of Yorkshiremen, was perfectly enlightened, and had quite got the better of all prejudices many years ago, I still, in spite of the matchless horses and matchless cattle, had a general impression that Yorkshire was a sterile county, compared with the counties in the south and the west. And this notion was confirmed in some measure by my seeing the moory and rocky parts in the west riding last winter. It was necessary for me to come and see the country on the banks of the Humber. I have seen the Vale of Huniton in Devonshire, that of Taunton and Glastonbury in Somersetshire. I have seen the Vales of Gloucester and Worcester, and the banks of the Severn and the Avon. I have seen the Vale of Berkshire, that of Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. I have seen the beautiful Vales of Wiltshire, and the banks in the Medway from Tunbridge to Maidstone, called the Garden of Eden. I was born at one end of Arthur Young's finest ten miles in England. I have ridden my horse across the Thames at its two sources, and I have been along every inch of its banks from its sources to Gravesend, whence I have sailed out of it into the Channel, and having seen and had ability to judge of the goodness of the land in all these places, I declare that I have never seen any to be compared with the land on the banks of the Humber, from the Holderness country included, and with the exception of the land from Wisbeach to Holbeach, and Holbeach to Boston. Really, the single parish of Holbeach, or a patch of the same size in the Holderness country, seems to be equal in value to the whole of the county of Surrey, if we leave out the little plot of Hop Garden at Farnham. Nor is the town of Hull itself to be overlooked. It is a little city of London, street, shops, everything like it, clean as the best parts of London, and the people as bustling and attentive. The town of Hull is surrounded with commodious docks for shipping. These docks are separated in three or four places by drawbridges, so that as you walk round the town, you walk by the side of the docks and the ships. The town on the outside of the docks is pretty considerable, and the walks from it into the country beautiful. I went about a good deal, and I nowhere saw marks of beggary or filth, even in the outskirts, none of those nasty, shabby, thief-looking sheds that you see in the approaches to London, none of those offscourings of pernicious and insolent luxury. I hate commercial towns in general. There is generally something so loathsome in the look, and so stern and unfeeling in the manners of seafaring people, that I have always from my very youth disliked seaports. But really the sight of this nice town, the manners of its people, the civil and kind and cordial reception that I met with, and the clean streets, and especially the pretty gardens in every direction, as you walk into the country, has made Hull, though a seaport, a place that I shall always look back to with delight. Beverley, which was formerly a very considerable city, with three or four gates, one of which is yet standing, had a great college, built in the year 700 by the Archbishop of York. It had three famous hospitals and two friaries. There is one church, a very fine one, and the minster still left, of which a bookseller in the town was so good as to give me copper-plate representations. It is still a very pretty town, the market large, the land all round the country good, and it is particularly famous for horses, those for speed being shown off here on the market days at this time of the year. The farmers and gentlemen assemble in a very wide street, on the outside of the western gate of the town, and at a certain time of the day the grooms come from their different stables to show off their beautiful horses, blood horses, coach horses, hunters and cart horses, sometimes they tell me forty or fifty in number. The day that I was there, being late in the season, there were only seven or eight or ten at the most. When I was asked at the inn to go and see the horses, I had no curiosity, thinking it was such a parcel of horses as we see at a market in the south, but I found it a sight worth going to see, for besides the beauty of the horses there were the adroitness, the agility, and the boldness of the grooms, each running alongside of his horse, with the latter trotting at the rate of ten or twelve miles an hour, and then swinging him round and showing him off to the best advantage. In short, I was exceedingly gratified by the trip to Beverley. 
The day was fair and mild. We went by one road and came back by another, and I have very seldom passed a pleasanter day in my life. I found very much to my surprise that at Hull I was very nearly as far north as at Leeds, and at Beverley a little further north. Of all things in the world I wanted to speak to Mr. Foster of the Leeds Patriot, but was not aware of the relative situation till it was too late to write to him. Boats go up the Humber and the Ouse to within a few miles of Leeds. The Holderness country is that piece of land which lies between Hull and the sea. It appears to be a perfect flat, and is said to be, and I dare say is, one of the very finest spots in the whole kingdom. I had a very kind invitation to go into it, but I could not stay longer on that side of the Humber, without neglecting some duty or other. In quitting Hull I left behind me but one thing, the sight of which had not pleased me, namely a fine gilded equestrian statue of the Dutch deliverer, who gave to England the national debt that fruitful mother of mischief and misery. Until this statue be replaced by that of Andrew Marble, that real honour of this town, England will never be what it ought to be. We came back to Barton by the steamboat on Sunday in the afternoon of the 18th, and in the evening reached this place, which is an inn, with three or four houses near it, at the distance of ten miles from Lincoln, to which we are going on Wednesday the 21st. Between this place and Barton we passed through a delightfully pretty town called Brigg. The land in this, which is called the high part of Lincolnshire, has generally stone, a solid bed of stone, of great depth, at different distances from the surface. In some parts this stone is of a yellowish colour, and in the form of very thick slate, and in these parts the soil is not so good, but generally speaking the land is excellent, easily tilled, no surface water, the fields very large, not many trees, but what there are, particularly the ash, very fine, and of free growth, and innumerable flocks of those big long wool sheep, from one hundred to a thousand in a flock, each having from eight to ten pounds of wool upon its body. One of the finest sights in the world is one of these thirty or forty acre fields, with four or five or six hundred ewes, each with her one or two lambs skipping about upon grass, the most beautiful that can be conceived, and on lands as level as a bowling green. I do not recollect having seen a molehill or an anthill since I came into the country, and not one acre of waste land, though I have gone the whole length of the country one way, and am now got nearly half way back another way. Having seen this country, and having had a glimpse at the Holderness country, which lies on the banks of the sea, and to the east and north-east of Hull, can I cease to wonder that those devils, the Danes, found their way hither so often? There were the fat sheep then, just as they are now, depend upon it. And these numbers of noble churches, and these magnificent minsters, were reared because the wealth of the country remained in the country, and was not carried away to the south, to keep swarms of devouring tax-eaters, to cram the moors of wasteful idlers, and to be transferred to the grasp of luxurious and blaspheming Jews. You always perceive that the churches are large and fine and lofty, in proportion to the richness of the soil and the extent of the parish. In many places where there are now but a very few houses, and those comparatively miserable, there are churches that look like cathedrals. It is quite curious to observe the difference in the style of the churches of Suffolk and Norfolk, and those of Lincolnshire and of the other bank of the Humber. In the former two counties the churches are good, large, and with a good, plain, and pretty lofty tower. And in a few instances, particularly at Ipswich and Long Melford, you find magnificence in these buildings. But in Lincolnshire the magnificence of the churches is surprising. These churches are the indubitable proof of great and solid wealth, and formerly of great population. From everything that I have heard, the Netherlands is a country very much resembling Lincolnshire, and they say that the church at Antwerp is like that at Boston. But my opinion is that Lincolnshire alone contains more of these fine buildings than the whole of the continent of Europe. Still, however, there is the almost total want of the singing birds. There had been a shower a little while before we arrived at this place. It was about six o'clock in the evening, and there is a thick wood, together with the orchards and gardens, very near to the inn. We heard a little twittering from one thrush, but at that very moment, if we had been as near to just such a wood in Surrey, or Hampshire, or Sussex, or Kent, we should have heard ten thousand birds singing all together, and the thrushes continuing their song till twenty minutes after sunset. When I was at Ipswich, the gardens and plantations round that beautiful town began in the morning to ring with the voices of the different birds. The nightingale is, I believe, never heard anywhere on the eastern side of Lincolnshire, though it is sometimes heard in the same latitude in the dells of Yorkshire. How ridiculous it is to suppose that these frail birds, with their slender wings and proportionately heavy bodies, cross the sea and come back again! I have not yet heard more than half a dozen skylarks, and I have only last year heard ten at a time make the air ring over one of my fields at Barn Elm. This is a great drawback from the pleasure of viewing this fine country. It is time for me now, withdrawing myself from these objects visible to the eye, 
to speak of the state of the people, and of the manner in which their affairs are affected by the workings of the system. With regard to the labourers, they are everywhere miserable. The wages for those who are employed on the land are, through all the counties that I have come, twelve shillings a week for married men, and less for single ones, but a large part of them are not even at this season employed on the land. The farmers, for want of means of profitable employment, suffer the men to fall upon the parish, and they are employed in digging and breaking stone for the roads, so that the roads are nice and smooth for the sheep and cattle to walk on in their way to the all-devouring jaws of the Jews and other tax-eaters in London and its vicinity. None of the best meat except by mere accident is consumed here. Today, the 20th of April, we have seen hundreds upon hundreds of sheep, as fat as hogs, go by this inn door, their toes like those of the footmarks at the entrance of the lion's den, all pointing towards the wen, and the landlord gave us for dinner a little skinny hard leg of an old ewe mutton. Where the man got it I cannot imagine. Thus it is. Every good thing is literally driven or carried away out of the country. In walking out yesterday I saw three poor fellows digging stone for the roads, who told me that they never had anything but bread to eat and water to wash it down. One of them was a widower with three children, and his pay was eighteen pence a day, that is to say about three pounds of bread a day each, for six days in the week, nothing for Sunday, and nothing for lodging, washing, clothing, candlelight, or fuel. Just such was the state of things in France at the eve of the Revolution. Precisely such, and precisely the same, were the causes. Whether the effect will be the same, I do not take upon myself positively to determine. Just on the other side of the hedge, while I was talking to these men, I saw about two hundred fat sheep in a rich pasture. I did not tell them what I might have told them, but I explained to them why the farmers were unable to give them a sufficiency of wages. They listened with great attention, and said that they did believe that the farmers were in great distress themselves. With regard to the farmers, it is said here that the far greater part, if sold up, would be found to be insolvent. The tradesmen in country towns are, and must be, in but little better state. They all tell you they do not sell half so many goods as they used to sell, and of course the manufacturers must suffer in the like degree. There is a diminution and deterioration, every one says, in the stocks upon the farms. Sheep washing is a sort of business in this country, and I heard at Boston that the sheep washers say that there is a gradual falling off in point of the numbers of sheep washed. The farmers are all gradually sinking in point of property. The very rich ones do not feel that ruin is absolutely approaching, but they are all alarmed, and as to the poorer ones, they are fast falling into the rank of paupers. When I was at Ely, a gentleman who appeared to be a great farmer told me, in presence of fifty farmers at the White Hart Inn, that he had seen that morning three men cracking stones on the road as paupers of the parish at Wilbarton, and that all these men had been overseers of the poor of that same parish within the last seven years. Wheat keeps up in price to about an average of seven shillings a bushel, which is owing to our two successive bad harvests, but fat beef and pork are at a very low price, and mutton not much better. The beef was selling at Lynn for five shillings a stone of fourteen pounds, and the pork at four and sixpence. The wool, one of the great articles of produce in these countries, selling for less than half of its former price. And here let me stop to observe that I was well informed before I left London that merchants were exporting our long wool to France, where it paid thirty per cent duty. Well, say the landowners, but we have to thank Huskisson for this at any rate, and that is true enough, for the law was most rigid against the export of wool. But what will the manufacturers say? Thus the collective goes on, smashing one class and then another, and resolved to adhere to the taxes, it knocks away, one after another, the props of the system itself. By every measure that it adopts for the sake of obtaining security, or of affording relief to the people, it does some act of crying injustice. To save itself from the natural effects of its own measures, it knocked down the country bankers, in direct violation of the law in 1822. It is now about to lay its heavy hand on the big brewers and the publicans, in order to pacify the call for a reduction of taxes, and with the hope of preventing such reduction in reality. It is making a trifling attempt to save the West Indians from total ruin, and the West India colonies from revolt, but by that same attempt it reflects injury on the British distillers, and on the growers of barley. Thus it cannot do justice without doing injustice, it cannot do good without doing evil, and thus it must continue to do until it take off in reality more than one half of the taxes. One of the great signs of the poverty of people in the middle rank of life is the falling off of the audiences at the playhouses. There is a playhouse in almost every country town, where the players used to act occasionally, and in large towns almost always. In some places they have of late abandoned acting altogether. In others they have acted very frequently, 
to not more than ten or twelve persons. At Norwich the playhouse had been shut up for a long time. I heard of one manager who has become a porter to a warehouse and his company dispersed. In most places the insides of the building seem to be tumbling to pieces, and the curtains and scenes that they let down seem to be abandoned to the damp and the cobwebs. My appearance on the board seemed to give new life to the drama. I was until the birth of my third son a constant haunter of the playhouse, in which I took great delight. But when he came into the world I said, Now, Nancy, it is time for us to leave off going to the play. It is really melancholy to look at things now, and to think of things then. I feel great sorrow on account of these poor players, for though they are made the tools of the government and the corporations and the parsons, it is not their fault, and they have uniformly, whenever I have come in contact with them, been very civil to me. I am not sorry that they are left out of the list of vagrants in the new act, but in this case, as in so many others, the men have to be grateful to the women, for who believes that this merciful omission would have taken place, if so many of the peers had not contracted matrimonial alliances with players, if so many playeresses had not become peeresses? We may thank God for disposing the hearts of our lawmakers to be guilty of the same sins and foibles as ourselves. For when a lord has been sentenced to the pillory, the use of that ancient mode of punishing offences was abolished. When a lord, Castlereagh, who was also minister of state, had cut his own throat, the degrading punishment of burial and crossroads was abolished. And now, when so many peers and great men have taken to wife play actresses, which the lord termed vagrants, that term, as applied to the children of Melpomene and Thalia, is abolished. Lord we the gods that our rulers cannot after all divest themselves of flesh and blood, for the Lord have mercy upon us if their great souls were once to soar above that tenement. Lord Stanhope cautioned his brother Piers a little while ago against the angry feeling which was rising up in the poor against the rich. His lordship is a wise and humane man, and this is evident from all his conduct. Nor is this angry feeling confined to the counties in the south, where the rage of the people, from the very nature of the local circumstances, is more formidable. Woods and coppices and dingles and by-lanes, and sticks and stones ever at hand, being resources unknown in counties like this. When I was at St. Ives in Huntingdonshire, an open country, I sat with the farmers and smoked a pipe by way of preparation for evening service, which I performed on a carpenter's bench in a wheelwright shop. My friends, the players, never having gained any regular settlement in that grand mart for four-legged fat meat, coming from the fens and bound to the wen. While we were sitting, a handbill was handed round the table, advertising farming stock for sale, and amongst the implements of husbandry, an excellent fire-engine, several steel traps, and spring guns. And that is the life, is it, of an English farmer? I walked on about six miles of the road from Holbeach to Boston. I have before observed upon the inexhaustible riches of this land. At the end of about five miles and three quarters, I came to a public-house, and thought I would get some breakfast, but the poor woman, with a tribe of children about her, had not a morsel of either meat or bread. At a house called an inn a little further on, the landlord had no meat except a little bit of chine of bacon, and though there were a good many houses near the spot, the landlord told me that the people were become so poor that the butchers had left off killing meat in the neighbourhood. Just the state of things that existed in France on the eve of the revolution. On that very spot I looked round me and counted more than two thousand fat sheep in the pastures. How long! How long, good God, is this state of things to last? How long will these people starve in the midst of plenty? How long will fire-engines, steel traps, and spring guns be, in such a state of things, a protection to property? When I was at Beverley, a gentleman told me, it was Mr. Dawson of that place, that some time before a farmer had been sold up by his landlord, and that in a few weeks afterwards the farmhouse was on fire, and that when the servants of the landlord arrived to put it out, they found the handle of the pump taken away and that the homestead was totally destroyed. This was told me in the presence of several gentlemen, who all spoke of it as a fact of perfect notoriety. Another respect in which our situation so exactly resembles that of France on the eve of the revolution is the fleeing from the country in every direction. When I was in Norfolk there were four hundred persons, generally young men, labourers, carpenters, wheelwrights, millwrights, smiths, and bricklayers, most of them with some money, and some farmers and others with good round sums. These people were going to Quebec in timber ships, and from Quebec by land into the United States. They had been told that they would not be suffered to land in the United States from on board of ship. The roguish villains had deceived them, but no matter. They will get into the United States, and going through Canada will do them good, for it will teach them to detest everything belonging to it. From Boston, two great barge-loads had just gone off by canal to Liverpool, most of them farmers, 
all carrying some money and some as much as two thousand pounds each from the north and west riding of yorkshire numerous wagons have gone carrying people to the canals leading to liverpool and a gentleman whom i saw at peterborough told me that he saw some of them and that the men all appeared to be respectable farmers at hull the scene would delight the eyes of the wise burdett for here the emigration is going on in the old roman plan ten large ships have gone this spring laden with these fugitives from the fangs of taxation some bound direct to the ports of the united states others like those at yarmouth for quebec those that have most money go direct to the united states the single men who are taken for a mere trifle in the canada ships go that way having nothing but their carcasses to carry over the rocks and swamps and through the myriads of placemen and pensioners in that miserable region there are about fifteen more ships going from this one port this spring the ships are fitted up with berths as transports for the carrying of troops i went on board one morning and saw the people putting their things on board and stowing them away seeing a nice young woman with a little baby in her arms i told her that she was going to a country where she would be sure that her children would never want victuals where she might make her own malt soap and candles without being half put to death for it and where the blaspheming jews would not have a mortgage on the life's labour of her children there is at hull one farmer going who is seventy years of age but who takes out five sons and fifteen hundred pounds brave and sensible old man and good and affectionate father he is performing a truly parental and sacred duty and he will die with the blessing of his sons on his head for having rescued them from this scene of slavery misery cruelty and crime come then wilmot horton with your sensible associates burdett and pullet thompson come into lincolnshire norfolk and yorkshire come and bring parson malthus along with you regale your sight with this delightful stream of emigration congratulate the greatest captain of the age and your brethren of the collective congratulate the noblest assembly of free men on these the happy effects of their measures oh no wilmot oh no generous and sensible burdett it is not the aged the infirm the halt the blind and the idiots that go it is the youth the strength the wealth and the spirit that will no longer brook hunger and thirst in order that the moors of tax-eaters and jews may be crammed you want the irish to go and so they will at our expense and all the bad of them to be kept at our expense on the rocks and swamps of nova scotia and canada you have no money to send them away with the tax-eaters want it all and thanks to the improvements of the age the steamboats will continue to bring them in shoals in pursuit of the oughts of the food that their taskmasters have taken away from them after evening lecture at horncastle a very decent farmer came to me and asked me about america telling me that he was resolved to go for that if he stayed much longer he should not have a shilling to go with i promised to send him a letter from louth to a friend at new york who might be useful to him there and give him good advice i forgot it at louth but i will do it before i go to bed from the thames and from the several ports down the channel about two thousand have gone this spring all the flower of the labourers of the east of sussex and west of kent will be culled out and sent off in a short time from glasgow the sensible scotch are pouring out a main those that are poor and cannot pay their passages or can rake together only a trifle are going to a rascally heap of sand and rock and swamp called prince edward's island in the horrible gulf of st lawrence but when the american vessels come over with indian corn and flour and pork and beef and poultry and eggs and butter and cabbages and green peas and asparagus for the soldier officers and other tax-eaters that we support upon that lump of worthlessness for the lump itself bears nothing but potatoes when these vessels come which they are continually doing winter and summer towards the fall with apples and pears and melons and cucumbers and in short everlastingly coming and taking away the amount of taxes raised in england when these vessels return the sensible scotch will go back in them for a dollar a head till at last not a man of them will be left but the bedridden those villainous colonies are held for no earthly purpose but that of furnishing a pretence of giving money to the relations and dependents of the aristocracy and they are the nicest channels in the world through which to send english taxes to enrich and strengthen the united states withdraw the english taxes and except in a small part in canada the whole of those horrible regions would be left to the bears and the savages in the course of a year this emigration is a famous blow given to the barramungas the way to new york is now as well known and as easy and as little expensive as from old york to london first the sussex parishes sent their paupers they invited over others that were not paupers they invited over people of some property then persons of greater property now substantial farmers are going men of considerable fortune will follow it is the letters written across the atlantic that do the business men of fortune will soon discover that to secure to their families their fortunes 
and to take these out of the grasp of the inexorable tax-gatherer, they must get away. Every one that goes will take twenty after him, and thus it will go on. There can be no interruption but war, and war the thing dares not have. As to France or the Netherlands, or any part of that hell called Germany, Englishmen can never settle there. The United States form another England without its unbearable taxes, its insolent game laws, its intolerable dead weight, and its treadmills. End of chapter 31「from the Innitspittal we came to this famous ancient Roman station, and after its grand scene of Saxon and Gothic splendour, on the twenty-first. It was the third or fourth day of the Spring Fair, which is one of the greatest in the kingdom, and which lasts for a whole week. Horses begin the fair, then come sheep, and to-day the horned cattle. It is supposed that there were about fifty thousand sheep, and I think the whole of the space in the various roads and streets covered by the cattle must have amounted to ten acres of ground or more. Some say that they were as numerous as the sheep. The number of horses I did not hear, but they say that there were fifteen hundred fewer in number than last year. The sheep sold five shillings a head on an average lower than last year, and the cattle in the same proportion. High-priced horses sold well, but the horses which are called tradesmen's horses were very low. This is the natural march of the thing, those who live on the taxes have money to throw away, but those who pay them are ruined, and have, of course, no money to lay out on horses. The country from Spittle to Lincoln continued to be much about the same as from Barton to Spittle. Large fields, rather light loam, at top, stone under, about half corn land, and the rest grass. Not so many sheep as in the richer lands, but a great many still. As you get on towards Lincoln, the ground gradually rises, and you go on the road made by the Romans. When you come to the city you find the ancient castle and the magnificent cathedral on the brow of a sort of ridge, which ends here, for you look all of a sudden down into a deep valley, where the greater part of the remaining city lies. It once had fifty-two churches, it has now only eight, and only about nine thousand inhabitants. The cathedral is, I believe, the finest building in the whole world. All the others that I have seen, and I have seen all in England, except Chester, York, Carlisle, and Durham, are little things compared with this. To the task of describing a thousandth part of its striking beauties, I am inadequate. It surpasses greatly all that I had anticipated. And oh, how loudly it gives the lie to those brazen Scotch historians, who would have us believe that England was formerly a poor country. The whole revenue raised from Lincolnshire, even by this present system of taxation, would not rear such another pile in two hundred years. Some of the city gates are down, but there is one standing, the arch of which is said to be two thousand years old, and a most curious thing it is. The sight of the cathedral fills the mind alternately with wonder, admiration, melancholy, and rage, wonder at its grandeur and magnificence, admiration of the zeal and disinterestedness of those who here devoted to the honour of God those immense means which they might have applied to their own enjoyments, melancholy at its present neglected state and indignation against those who now enjoy the revenues belonging to it, and who creep about it merely as a pretext for devouring a part of the fruit of the people's labour. There are no men in England who ought to wish for reform so anxiously as the working clergy of the Church of England. We are all oppressed, but they are oppressed and insulted more than any men that ever lived in the world. The clergy in America, I mean in free America, not in our beggarly colonies, where clerical insolence and partiality prevail still more than here, I mean in the United States, where every man gives what he pleases and no more, the clergy of the Episcopal Church are a hundred times better off than the working clergy are here. They are also much more respected, because their order has not to bear the blame of enormous exactions, which exactions here are swallowed up by the aristocracy and their dependents, 
but which swallowings are imputed to every one bearing the name of parson. Throughout the whole country I have maintained the necessity and the justice of resuming the church property, but I have never failed to say that I know of no more meritorious and ill-used men than the working clergy of the established church. Leicester, 26th April, 1830. At the famous ancient city of Lincoln I had crowded audiences, principally consisting of farmers on the 21st and 22nd, exceedingly well-behaved audiences, and great impression produced. One of the evenings, in pointing out to them the wisdom of explaining to their labourers the cause of their distress, in order to ward off the effects of the resentment which the labourers now feel everywhere against the farmers, I related to them what my labourers at Barn Elm had been doing since I left home, and I repeated to them the complaints that my labourers made, stating to them from memory the following parts of that spirited petition. That your petitioners have recently observed that many great sums of the money, part of which we pay, have been voted to be given to persons who render no services to the country, some of which sums we will mention here. That the sum of £94,900 has been voted for disbanded foreign officers, their widows and children. That your petitioners know that ever since the peace this charge has been annually made, that it has been on an average £110,000 a year, and that of course this band of foreigners have actually taken away out of England, since the peace, one million and seven hundred thousand pounds, partly taken from the fruit of our labour, and if our dinners were actually taken from our table and carried over to Hanover, the process could not be to our eyes more visible than it now is, and we are astonished that those who fear that we, who make the land bring forth crops, and who make the clothing and the houses, shall swallow up the rental, appear to think nothing at all of the swallowings of these Hanoverian men, women, and children, who may continue thus to swallow for half a century to come. That the advocates of the project for sending us out of our country, to the rocks and snows of Nova Scotia, and the swamps and wilds of Canada, have insisted on the necessity of checking marriages amongst us, in order to cause a decrease in our numbers. That, however, while this is insisted on in your honourable house, we perceive a part of our own earnings voted away to encourage marriage amongst those who do not work, and who live at our expense, and that to your petitioners it does seem most wonderful, that there should be persons to fear that we, the labourers, shall on account of our numbers swallow up the rental, while they actually vote away our food and raiment, to increase the numbers of those who never have produced, and who never will produce, anything useful to man. That your petitioners know that more than one half of the whole of their wages is taken from them by the taxes, that these taxes go chiefly into the hands of idlers, that your petitioners are the bees, and that the tax-receivers are the drones, and they know further that while there is a project for sending the bees out of the country, no one proposes to send away the drones, but that your petitioners hope to see the day when the checking of the increase of the drones, and not of the bees, will be the object of an English Parliament. That, in consequence of taxes, your petitioners pay sixpence for a pot of worse beer than they could make for one penny, that they pay ten shillings for a pair of shoes that they could have for five shillings, that they pay seven pence for a pound of soap or candles, that they could have for three pence, that they pay seven pence for a pound of sugar, that they could have for threepence, that they pay six shillings for a pound of tea, that they could have for two shillings, that they pay double for their bread and meat of what they would have to pay if there were no idlers to be kept out of the taxes, that therefore it is the taxes that make their wages insufficient for their support, and that compel them to apply for aid to the poor rates, that knowing these things they feel indignant at hearing themselves described as paupers, while so many thousands of idlers, for whose support they pay taxes, are called noble lords and ladies, honourable gentlemen, masters and misses, that they feel indignant at hearing themselves described as a nuisance to be got rid of, while the idlers who live upon their earnings are upheld, caressed and cherished, as if they were the sole support of the country. Having repeated to them these passages, I proceeded. My workmen were induced thus to petition, in consequence of the information which I, their master, had communicated to them. And, gentlemen, why should not your labourers petition in the same strain? Why should you suffer them to remain in a state of ignorance relative to the cause of their misery? The eye sweeps over in this county more riches in one moment than I contain in the whole county in which I was born, and in which the petitioners live. Between Holbeach and Boston, even at a public house, neither bread nor meat was to be found. And while the landlord was telling me that the people were become so poor that the butchers killed no meat in the neighbourhood, I counted more than two thousand fat sheep lying about in the pastures in that richest spot in the whole world. Starvation in the midst of plenty, the land covered with food and the working people without victuals, everything taken away by the tax-eaters of various descriptions, and yet you take no measures for redress, 
and your miserable labourer seem to be doomed to expire with hunger, without an effort to obtain relief. What? Cannot you point out to them the real cause of their sufferings? Cannot you take a piece of paper and write out a petition for them? Cannot your labourers petition as well as mine? Are God's blessings bestowed on you without any spirit to preserve them? Is the fatness of the land, is the earth teeming with food for the body and raiment for the back, to be an apology for the want of that courage for which your fathers were so famous? Is the abundance which God has put into your hands to be the excuse for your resigning yourselves to starvation? My God! Is there no spirit left in England except in the miserable sand-hills of Surrey? These words were not uttered without effect, I can assure the reader. The assemblage was of that stamp in which thought goes before expression, but the effect of this example of my men in Surrey will, I am sure, be greater than anything that has been done in the petitioning way for a long time past. We left Lincoln on the 23rd about noon, and got to Newark in Nottinghamshire in the evening, where I gave a lecture at the theatre to about three hundred persons. Newark is a very fine town, and the castle inn where we stopped, extraordinarily good and pleasantly situated. Here I was met by a parcel of the printed petitions of the labourers at Barn Elm. I shall continue to sow these as I proceed on my way. It should have been stated at the head of the printed petition that it was presented to the House of Lords by His Grace the Duke of Richmond, and by Mr. Palmer to the House of Commons. The country from Lincoln to Newark, sixteen miles, is by no means so fine as that which we have been in for so many weeks. The land is clayey in many parts, a pleasant country, a variety of hill and valley, but not that richness which we had so long had under our eye. Fields smaller, fewer sheep, and those not so large, and so manifestly loaded with flesh. The roads always good. Newark is a town very much like Nottingham, having a very fine and spacious market-place. The buildings everywhere good, but it is in the villages that you find the depth of misery. Having appointed positively to be at Leicester in the evening of Saturday the 24th, we could not stop either at Grantham or at Melton Mowbray, not even long enough to view their fine, old, magnificent churches. In going from Newark to Grantham, we got again into Lincolnshire, in which last county Grantham is. From Newark nearly to Melton Mowbray, the country is about the same as between Lincoln and Newark, by no means bad land, but not so rich as that of Lincolnshire, in the middle and eastern parts. Not approaching to the Holderness country in point of riches, a large part arable land, well tilled, but not such large homesteads, such numerous great stacks of wheat, and such endless flocks of lazy sheep. Before we got to Melton Mowbray, the beautiful pastures of this little verdant county of Leicester began to appear. Meadows and green fields, with here and there a cornfield, all of smaller dimensions than those of Lincolnshire, but all very beautiful, with gentle hills and woods too. Not beautiful woods, like those of Hampshire and of the wilds of Surrey, Sussex, and Kent, but very pretty, all the country around being so rich. At Mowbray we began to get amongst the Leicestershire sheep, those fat creatures which we see the butcher's boys battering about so unmercifully in the streets and the outskirts of the Wen. The land is warmer here than in Lincolnshire, the grass more forward, and the wheat between Mowbray and Leicester six inches high, and generally looking exceedingly well. In Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire I found the wheat in general rather thin and frequently sickly, nothing like so promising as in Suffolk and Norfolk. We got to Leicester on the 24th, at about half after five o'clock, and the time appointed for the lecture was six. Leicester is a very fine town, spacious streets, fine inns, fine shops, and containing, they say, thirty or forty thousand people. It is well stocked with jails, of which a new one, in addition to the rest, has just been built, covering three acres of ground. And, as if proud of it, the grand portal has little turrets in the castle style, with embrasures in miniature on the caps of the turrets. Nothing speaks the want of reflection in the people so much, as the self-gratulation which they appear to feel in these edifices in their several towns. Instead of expressing shame at these indubitable proofs of the horrible increase of misery and of crime, they really boast of these improvements, as they call them. Our forefathers built abbeys and priories and churches, and they made such use of them that jails were nearly unnecessary. We, their sons, have knocked down the abbeys and priories, suffered half the parsonage houses and churches to pretty nearly tumble down, and make such uses of the remainder that jails and treadmills and dungeons have now become the most striking edifices in every county in the kingdom. Yesterday morning, Sunday the 25th, I walked out to the village of Knighton, two miles on the Bosworth Road, where I breakfasted and then walked back. This morning I walked out to Halston, nearly three miles on the Lutterworth Road, and got my breakfast there. You have nothing to do but to walk through these villages to see the cause of the increase of the jails. Standing on the hill at Knighton, you see the three ancient and lofty and beautiful spires rising up at Leicester. 
you see the river winding down through a broad bed of the most beautiful meadows that man ever set his eyes on. You see the bright verdure covering all the land, even to the tops of the hills, with here and there a little wood, as if made by God to give variety to the beauty of the scene, for the river brings the coal in abundance for fuel, and the earth gives the brick and the tile in abundance. But go down into the villages, invited by the spires, rising up amongst the trees in the dells, at scarcely ever more than a mile or two apart. Invited by these spires, go down into these villages, view the large and once the most beautiful churches, see the parson's house, large and in the midst of pleasure gardens, and then look at the miserable sheds in which the labourers reside. Look at these hovels made of mud and of straw, bits of glass, or of old off-cast windows, without frames or hinges frequently, but merely stuck in the mud wall. Enter them and look at the bits of chairs or stools, the wretched boards tacked together to serve for a table, the floor of pebble, broken brick, or of the bare ground. Look at the thing called a bed, and survey the rags on the backs of the wretched inhabitants, and then wonder if you can that the jails and dungeons and treadmills increase, and that a standing army and barracks are become the favourite establishments of England. At the village of Aylston I got into the purlieu, as they call it, in Hampshire, of a person well known in the Wen, namely the Reverend Beresford, rector of that fat affair, St. Andrew's Hoban. In walking through the village and surveying its deplorable dwellings, so much worse than the cowsheds of the cottages on the skirts of the forest in Hampshire, my attention was attracted by the surprising contrast between them and the house of their religious teacher. I met a labouring man. Country people know everything. If you ever made a faux pas of any sort of description, if you have anything about you of which you do not want all the world to know, never retire to a village, keep in some great town, but the when, for your life, for there the next-door neighbour will not know even your name, and the vicinage will judge of you solely by the quantity of money that you have to spend. This labourer seemed not to be in a very great hurry. He was digging in his garden, and I, looking over a low hedge, pitched him up for a gossip, commencing by asking him whether that was the parson's house. Having answered in the affirmative, and I having asked the parson's name, he proceeded thus. His name is Beresford, but though he lives there, he has not this living now. He has got the living of St. Andrew's Hoban, and they say it is worth a great many thousands a year. He could not, they say, keep this living and have that too, because they were so far apart, and so this living was given to Mr. Brown, who is the rector of Hobie, about seven miles off. Well, said I, but how comes Beresford to live here now, if the living be given to another man? Why, sir, said he, this Beresford married a daughter of Brown, and so, you know, smiling and looking very archly, Brown comes and takes the payment for the tithes, and pays a curate that lives in that house there in the field, and Beresford lives at that fine house still, just as he used to do. I asked him what the living was worth, and he answered twelve hundred pounds a year. It is a rectory, I find, and of course the parson has great tithes, as well as small. The people of this village know a great deal more about Beresford than the people of St. Andrew's Hoban know about him. In short, the country people know all about the whole thing. They will be long before they act, but they will make no noise as a signal for action. They will be moved by nothing but actual want of food. This, the thing, seems to be aware of, and hence all the innumerable schemes for keeping them quiet. Hence the endless jails and all the terrors of hardened law. Hence the schemes for coaxing them by letting them have bits of land. Hence the everlasting bills and discussions of committees about the state of the poor and the state of the poor laws, all of which will fail, and at last, unless reduction of taxation speedily take place. The schemers will find what the consequences are of reducing millions to the verge of starvation. The labourers here, who are in need of parochial relief, are formed into what are called roundsmen, that is to say, they are sent round from one farmer to another, each maintaining a certain number for a certain length of time, and thus they go round from one to the other. If the farmers did not pay three shillings in taxes out of every six shillings that they give in the shape of wages, they could afford to give the men four and sixpence in wages, which would be better to the men than the six. But as long as this burden of taxes shall continue, so long the misery will last, and it will go on increasing with accelerated pace. The march of circumstances is precisely what it was in France, just previous to the French Revolution. If the aristocracy were wise, they would put a stop to that march. The middle class are fast sinking down to the state of the lower class. A community of feeling between these classes, and that feeling an angry one, is what the aristocracy has to dread. As far as the higher clergy are concerned, this community of feeling is already complete. A short time will extend the feeling to every other branch, and then the hideous consequences make their appearance. Reform. A radical reform of the Parliament. This reform in time 
this reform which would reconcile the middle class to the aristocracy and give renovation to that which has now become a mass of decay and disgust this reform given with a good grace and not taken by force is the only refuge for the aristocracy of this kingdom just as it was in france all the tricks of financiers have been tried in vain and by and by some trick more pompous and foolish than the rest sir henry parnell's trick perhaps or something equally foolish would blow the whole concern into the air worcester eighteenth may eighteen thirty in tracing myself from leicester to this place i begin at lutterworth in leicestershire one of the prettiest country towns that i ever saw that is to say prettiest situated at this place they have in the church they say the identical pulpit from which wycliffe preached this was not his birthplace but he was it seems priest of this parish i set off from lutterworth early on the twenty ninth of april stopped to breakfast at birmingham got to wolverhampton by two o'clock a distance altogether of about fifty miles and lectured at six in the evening i repeated or rather continued the lecturing on the thirtieth and on the third of may on the sixth of may went to dudley and lectured there on the tenth of may at birmingham on the twelfth and thirteenth at shrewsbury and on the fourteenth came here thus have i come through countries of corn and meat and iron and coal and from the banks of the humber to those of the seven i find all the people who do not share in the taxes in a state of distress greater or less mortgages all frightened out of their wits fathers trembling for the fate of their children and working people in the most miserable state and as they ought to be in the worst of temper these will i am afraid be the state doctors at last the farmers are cowed down the poorer they get the more cowardly they are every one of them sees the cause of his suffering and sees general ruin at hand but every one hopes that by some trick some act of meanness some contrivance he shall escape so that there is no hope of any change for the better but from the working people the farmers will sink to a very low state and thus the thing barring accidents may go on until neither farmer nor tradesman will see a joint of meat on his table once in a quarter of a year it appears likely to be precisely as it was in france it is now just what france was at the close of the reign of louis the fifteenth it has been the fashion to ascribe the french revolution to the writings of voltaire rousseau diderot and others these writings had nothing at all to do with the matter no nothing at all the revolution was produced by taxes which at last became unbearable by debts of the state but in fact by the despair of the people produced by the weight of the taxes it is curious to observe how ready the supporters of tyranny and taxation are to ascribe rebellions and revolutions to disaffected leaders and particularly to writers and as these supporters of tyranny and taxation have had the press at their command have had generally the absolute command of it they have caused this belief to go down from generation to generation it will not do for them to ascribe revolutions and rebellions to the true cause because then the rebellions and revolutions would be justified and it is the object to cause them to be condemned infinite delusion has prevailed in this country in consequence of the efforts of which i am now speaking voltaire was just as much a cause of the french revolution as i have been the cause of imposing these sixty millions of taxes the french revolution was produced by the grindings of taxation and this i will take an opportunity very soon of proving to the conviction of every man in the kingdom who chooses to read in the iron country of which wolverhampton seems to be a sort of central point and where thousands and perhaps two or three hundred thousand people are assembled together the truck or tommy system generally prevails and this is a very remarkable feature in the state of this country i have made inquiries with regard to the origin or etymology of this word tommy and could find no one to furnish me with the information it is certainly like so many other good things to be ascribed to the army for when i was a recruit at chatham barracks in the year seventeen eighty three we had brown bread served out to us twice in the week and for what reason god knows we used to call it tommy and the sergeants when they called us out to get our bread used to tell us to come and get our tommy even the officers used to call it tommy any one that could get white bread called it bread but the brown stuff that we got in lieu of part of our pay was called tommy and so we used to call it when we got abroad when the soldiers came to have bread served out to them in the several towns in england the name of tommy went down by tradition and doubtless it was taken up and adapted to the truck system in staffordshire and elsewhere now there is nothing wrong nothing essentially wrong in this system of barter barter is in practice in some of the happiest communities in the world in the new settled parts of the united states of america to which money has scarcely found its way to which articles of wearing apparel are brought from a great distance where the great and almost sole occupations are the rearing of food the building of houses and the making of clothes 
barter is the rule and money payment the exception and this is attended with no injury and with very little inconvenience the bargains are made and the accounts kept in money but the payments are made in produce or in goods the price of these being previously settled on the storekeeper which we call shopkeeper receives the produce in exchange for his goods and exchanges that produce for more goods and thus the concerns of the community go on every one living in abundance and the sound of misery never heard but when this tommy system this system of barter when this makes its appearance where money has for ages been the medium of exchange and of payments for labour when this system makes its appearance in such a state of society there is something wrong things are out of joint and it becomes us to inquire into the real cause of its being resorted to and it does not become us to join in an outcry against the employers who resort to it until we be perfectly satisfied that those employers are guilty of oppression the manner of carrying on the tommy system is this suppose there to be a master who employs a hundred men that hundred men let us suppose to earn a pound a week each this is not the case in the ironworks but no matter we can illustrate our meaning by one sum as well as by another these men lay out weekly the whole of the hundred pounds in victuals, drink clothing bedding fuel and house rent now the master finding the profits of his trade fall off very much and being at the same time in want of money to pay the hundred pounds weekly and perceiving that these hundred pounds are carried away at once and given to shopkeepers of various descriptions to butchers bakers drapers hatters shoemakers and the rest and knowing that on an average these shopkeepers must all have a profit of thirty per cent or more he determines to keep this thirty per cent to himself and this is thirty pounds a week gained as a shopkeeper which amounts to one thousand five hundred and sixty pounds a year he therefore sets up a tommy shop a long place containing every commodity that the workman can want liquor and house-room excepted here the workman takes out his pounds worth and his house-rent he pays in truck if he do not rent of his master and if he will have liquor beer or gin or anything else he must get it by trucking with the goods that he has got at the tommy shop now there is nothing essentially unjust in this there is a little inconvenience as far as the house-rent goes but not much the tommy is easily turned into money and if the single saving man does experience some trouble in the sale of his goods that is compensated for in the more important case of the married man whose wife and children generally experience the benefit of this payment in kind it is to be sure a sorrowful reflection that such a check upon the drinking propensities of the father should be necessary but the necessity exists and however sorrowful the fact the fact i am assured is that thousands upon thousands of mothers have to bless this system though it arises from a loss of trade and the poverty of the masters i have often had to observe on the cruel effects of the suppression of markets and fairs and on the consequent power of extortion possessed by the country shopkeepers and what a thing it is to reflect on that these shopkeepers have the whole of the labouring men of england constantly in their debt have on an average a mortgage on their wages to the amount of five or six weeks and make them pay any price that they choose to extort so that in fact there is a tommy system in every village the difference being that the shopkeeper is the tommy man instead of the farmer the only question is in this case of the manufacturing tommy work whether the master charges a higher price than the shopkeepers would charge and while i have not heard that the masters do this i think it improbable that they should they must desire to avoid the charge of such extortion and they have little temptation to it because they buy at best hand and in large quantities because they are sure of their customers and know to a certainty the quantity that they want and because the distribution of the goods is a matter of such perfect regularity and attended with so little expense compared with the expenses of the shopkeeper any farmer who has a parcel of married men working for him might supply them with meat for fourpence a pound when the butcher must charge them sevenpence or lose by his trade and to me it has always appeared astonishing that farmers where they happen to have the power completely in their hands do not compel their married labourers to have a sufficiency of bread and meat for their wives and children what would be more easy than to reckon what would be necessary for house rent fuel and clothing to pay that in money once a month or something of that sort and to pay the rest in meat flour and malt i may never occupy a farm again but if i were to do it to any extent the east and west indies nor big brewer nor distiller should ever have one farthing out of the produce of my farm except he got it through the throats of those who made the wearing apparel if i had a village at my command not a tea-kettle should sing in that village there should be no extortioner under the name of country shopkeeper and no straight-backed bloated fellow with red eyes unshaven face and slipshod till noon called a publican and generally worthy of the name of sinner well-covered backs and well-lined bellies would be my delight and as to talking about controlling and compelling 
What a controlling and compelling are there now! It is everlasting control and compulsion. My bargain should be so much in money, and so much in bread, meat, and malt. And what is the bargain I want to know with yearly servants? Why, so much in money, and the rest in bread, meat, beer, lodging, and fuel. And does any one affect to say that this is wrong? Does any one say that it is wrong to exercise control and compulsion over these servants? Such control and compulsion is not only the master's right, but they are included in his bounden duties. It is his duty to make them rise early, keep good hours, be industrious and careful, be cleanly in their persons and habits, be civil in their language. These are amongst the uses of the means which God has put into his hands. And are these means to be neglected towards married servants any more than towards single ones? Even in the well-cultivated and thickly settled parts of the United States of America, it is the general custom, and a very good custom it is, to pay the wages of labour partly in money and partly in kind. And this practice is extended to carpenters, bricklayers, and other workmen about buildings, and even to tailors, shoemakers, and weavers, who go, a most excellent custom, to farmhouses to work. The bargain is, so much money and found, that is to say, found in food and drink, and sometimes in lodging. The money then used to be for a common labourer in Long Island, at common work, not haying or harvesting, three York shillings a day, and found, that is to say, three times seven pence halfpenny of our money, and three times seven pence halfpenny a day, which is eleven shillings and threepence a week, and found. This was the wages of the commonest labourer at the commonest work, and wages of a good labourer now in Worcestershire is eight shillings a week, and not found. Accordingly, they are miserably poor and degraded." Therefore, there is in this mode of payment nothing essentially degrading. But the Tommy system of Staffordshire and elsewhere, though not unjust in itself, indirectly inflicts great injustice on the whole race of shopkeepers, who are necessary for the distribution of commodities in great towns, and whose property is taken away from them by this species of monopoly, which the employers of great numbers of men have been compelled to adopt for their own safety. It is not the fault of the masters, who can have no pleasure in making profit in this way. It is the fault of the taxes, which by lowering the price of their goods, have compelled them to resort to this means of diminishing their expenses, or to quit their business altogether, which a great part of them cannot do without being left without a penny. And if a law could be passed and enforced, which it cannot, to put an end to the Tommy system, the consequence would be that instead of a fourth part of the furnaces being let out of blast in this neighbourhood, one half would be let out of blast, and additional thousands of poor creatures would be left solely dependent on the parochial relief." A view of the situation of things at Shrewsbury will lead us in a minute to the real cause of the Tommy system. Shrewsbury is one of the most interesting spots that man ever beheld. It is the capital of the county of Salop, and Salop appears to have been the original name of the town itself. It is curiously enclosed by the River Severn, which is here large and fine, and which, in the form of horseshoe, completely surrounds it, leaving, of the whole of the two miles round, only one little place whereon to pass in and out on land. There are two bridges, one on the east and the other on the west, the former called the English and the other the Welsh bridge. The environs of this town, especially on the Welsh side, are the most beautiful that can be conceived. The town lies in the midst of a fine agricultural country, of which it is the great and almost only mart. Hither come the farmers to sell their produce, and hence they take in exchange their groceries, their clothing, and all the materials for their implements and the domestic conveniences. It was fair day when I arrived at Shrewsbury, Everything was on the decline. Cheese, which four years ago sold at sixty shillings to six score pounds, would not bring forty. I took particular pains to ascertain the fact with regard to the cheese, which is a great article here. I was assured that shopkeepers in general did not now sell half the quantity of goods in a month that they did in that space of time four or five years ago. The ironmongers were not selling a fourth part of what they used to sell five years ago. Now it is impossible to believe that a somewhat similar falling off in the sale of iron, must not have taken place all over the kingdom. And need we then wonder that the iron in Staffordshire has fallen within these five years, from thirteen pounds to five pounds a ton, or perhaps a great deal more? And need we wonder that the ironmasters, who have the same rent and taxes to pay that they had to pay before, have resorted to the Tommy system, in order to assist in saving themselves from ruin? Here is the real cause of the Tommy system, and if Mr. Littleton really wishes to put an end to it, let him prevail upon the Parliament to take off taxes to the amount of forty millions a year. Another article had experienced a still greater falling off at Shrewsbury. I mean the article of corn sacks, of which there has been a falling off of five-sixths. 
The sacks are made by weavers in the north, and need we wonder, then, at the low wages of those industrious people whom I used to see weaving sacks in the miserable cellars at Preston. Here is the true cause of the Tommy system, and of all the other evils which disturb and afflict the country. It is a great country, an immense mass of industry and resources of all sorts, breaking up, a prodigious mass of enterprise and capital diminishing and dispersing, the enormous taxes cooperating with the Corn Bill, which those taxes have engendered, are driving skill and wealth out of the country in all directions, are causing ironmasters to make France, and particularly Belgium, blaze with furnaces, in the lieu of those which have been extinguished here, and that have established furnaces and cotton mills in abundance. These same taxes and this same Corn Bill are sending the long wool from Lincolnshire to France, there to be made into those blankets which for ages were to be obtained nowhere but in England. This is the true state of the country, and here are the true causes of that state, and all that the corrupt writers and speakers say about overpopulation and poor laws, and about all the rest of their shuffling excuses, is a heap of nonsense and of lies. I cannot quit Shrewsbury without expressing the great satisfaction that I derived from my visit to that place. It is the only town into which I have gone in all England without knowing beforehand something of some person in it. I could find out no person that took the register, and could discover but one person who took the advice to young men. The number of my auditors was expected to be so small that I doubled the price of admission in order to pay the expense of the room. To my great surprise I had a room full of gentlemen, at the request of some of whom I repeated the dose the next night, and if my audience were as well pleased with me as I was with them, their pleasure must have been great indeed. I saw not one single person in the place that I had ever seen before, yet I never had more cordial shakes by the hand, in proportion to their numbers, not more at Manchester, Oldham, Rochdale, Halifax, Leeds, or Nottingham, or even Hull. I was particularly pleased with the conduct of the young gentlemen at Shrewsbury, and especially when I asked them whether they were prepared to act upon the insolent doctrine of Huskisson, and quietly submit to this state of things during the present generation. End of chapter 32